Section 30 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3. The Beleaguered Forest Continued and the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3 by John Buchan. Chapter 66 the winter of 1916 in Eastern and Southeastern Europe, August 25th, 1916 to January 29th, 1917, Part 2. 2. When Falkenhayn forced the line of the Aluda, and Bucharest and Ploesti fell, the eyes of Romania turned naturally to the line of the Sarep, which for forty years had been the foundation of her strategy of defense. She had originally devised the position as a bar to a Russian invasion, a defense of Wallachia, should Moldavia be overrun. The situation was now reversed. Wallachia had gone. The enemy was coming from the west, and the river was the last bulwark of Moldavia. The fortifications which she had raised there were out of date, and in any case their front was in the wrong direction but the natural strength of the Sereth line remained the same. Its flanks rested securely on the Carpathians in the north and the marshy Danube delta in the south. The right wing of the defenders must hold the mountain glens, which descend from the Oitos and Gymes passes. The center, the open valley east of Foscani, while the left wing had a strong position behind the swamps of the lower river between Novolasso and Galatz. Such a position involved the evacuation of the whole of the Dobruja, and it required that the Moldavian passes from the Kaimis northward should stand intact, for the northern extension of the Sereth line was the Trotus Valley, running from the Kaimis to the Ogna. If that were forced, the position would be turned and Moldavia would be at the mercy of the invader. By the end of the first week of December, Falkenhayn and Mackensen, now operating together on a front of less than a hundred miles, between the Bazu Pass and the Danube, were moving eastward against the line of the Bazu River and the lower Jeta Mitza. Footnote. Mackensen was now in command of a group, Kosh taking over the Danube army. End of footnote. Their extreme right wing in the Dobruja, the Bulgarian Third Army had for its object the clearing of that district, the ultimate crossing of the Danube below Galatz, and the invasion of Bessarabia. On their left, the Austrian First Army was to attempt the forcing of the passes north of the Ortots. The Romanian campaign had now a very direct bearing upon the whole Russian position in the Bukovina and Galicia. If the Moldavian passes were forced, Lachitsky would be outflanked and compelled to retire from the Bukovina, and the gains of the summer south of the Dniester would be lost. This fact, combined with the extreme fatigue of the Romanian forces, meant that the campaign must now be in Russia's hands. Her reinforcements had at last arrived, reinforcements which, if they had come earlier, might have prevented the loss of Wallachia. Gorko, who was acting as chief of staff during Alexei of Silnes, did his best, but he had much leeway to make up, and the Romanian railways were utterly disorganized. Lachitsky's left wing, a reserve corps under Denikin, had, since the beginning of November, taken over the defense of the Moldavian passes. Sakharov was in command of the Danube, and after the fall of Bucharest was entrusted with the defense of the Sarath line, since the bulk of the Romanians were withdrawn behind the front, to be reorganized under Averyescu and Presson, now his chief of staff. The Romanian sector had become the fourth division of the long Russian front. The enemy movement was a wheel to the northeast, the left wing under Falkenhayn, advancing slowly along the railway from Ploeshti to Rimnik Sarat, where Kosh moved faster in the region towards the river, and the Bulgarians in the Dobruja swung to north against Sakharov. The weary Romanian detachment 
which had been fighting in the Predeal district, made its escape, not without heavy losses, from the Prohova Valley, and fought a stout rearguard action east of Ploesti on the Krikovo River. But only delaying actions were possible. By 14th December, Falkenhayn was in the town of Rizu, and Kosh was across the Janimitsa. On the 17th, the former had passed the river Bazu on a wide front, and the latter was just south of Felipeshti. That same day, in the Dobruja, Sakharov had fallen back 30 miles to a line, running through the town of Babadog. The immediate enemy objectives north of the Danube were the towns of Rimnik, Sarat, and Braila, the only two Wallachian centers still uncaptured. Mackenzie resolved to avoid a direct attack on Braila and to carry it by a turning movement in the Dobruja. He concentrated his main strength on Rimnik, Sarat, and after four days' battle, beginning on 22nd December, entered the town on 27th December, taking many prisoners. On Christmas Day, Kosh carried Philip Eshley, and the victory at Rimnitzerat compelled the defense in that region to fall back to Paracora. The next move was with the Bulgarians in the Dobruja. By 23rd December, Sakharov's left had reached the Danube Delta and had crossed by the pontoon bridges at Tulsia and Asakia to the Bessarabian shore. Beyond that there could be no movement, but the vast floating marshes of the delta, which are neither land nor water, defied the enemy. That same day, Sakharov's remaining troops were concentrated in the extreme northwest corner of the district in front of the town of Mackin. Mackin lies at the point where the right branch of the river, which breaks off north of Hershuva, turns sharply to the west to join the left branch. It is only six miles from Braila, and formed its natural defense from the east. But such a position, with no good avenues of retreat, could not be safely held by Sakharov's remnant. On January 4, 1917, Mackin was evacuated, and the Dobruja was now wholly in the enemy's hands. The remaining retreat had here been most skillfully managed, but though it traversed a desperate country in the depths of winter, a country with scarcely a road and with a broad river to pass at the end, it lost no more than 6,000 men. The Bulgarian guns now opened against Braila, and since that place formed no part of the Sarath position, it was evacuated. On 5th January, Kosh from the west and the Bulgarians from across the Danube joined hands in its streets. That same day, the first German troops reached the Sarath, east of the mouth of the Vesu. The invaders were now in front of the final defenses. Falkenhayn, by the north, had still to come into line. Pivoting on Kosh's new position, he swung northeastward towards Foscani. The strength of the Sarath line was known, and it was on the left wing of the foothills, under Kraft von Delman Singen that the success of the greater operations must depend. Before the Trotus Valley is reached, a number of lesser streams flow eastward to the Sarath, and the Trotus itself receives on its right bank various small affluents. Each of these glens formed a defensive outpost with the main Trotus line. Here Falkenhayn's extreme left was operating in conjunction with the right of the Austrian First Army. The defense had not only to face the enemy, advancing from the southwest, but also flanking attacks from the west and north through the high passes. For a fortnight, the first fortnight of 1917, a swaying battle was waged among the foothills. On 8th January, Falkenhayn entered Volksani, and from Neneshti for 30 miles northward, occupied the banks of the Sarat. But the limit had been reached and the advance was stayed. We may take 15th January as the date at which the Romania retreat definitely ended. Wallachia had gone, but Moldavia was intact, and a line had been found on which the defense could abide. It was not till the end of the month that Mackenzie desisted from his efforts. 
On 19th January, he attempted to force the center opposite Fudaini, but after a bloody battle, failed to do more than clear the west bank of the river. Such a frost had set in as the oldest peasant of Romania could not remember. The temperature stood below zero for weeks on end, and the Bulgarians in the Provuja attempted to turn the weather to their advantage. On the morning of 23rd January, in a thick fog, they pushed through the frozen marshes of the Danube Delta and managed to cross the channel of the river north of Tulsia. It was a barren exploit, for the Romanians fell upon and annihilated the detachment. The frost, which was the last flank of the defense in peril, was the salvation of the right flank in the mountains. Mackenzie could not force the center and was compelled to depend upon his wings. The craft von Delmensingen and the Austrian First Army found that the Carpathian winter immobilized them more effectively than any entrenchments of their opponents. A winter peace fell upon the hills. The invader wreaked his vengeance upon hapless Wallachia. Disappointed in his hopes of great stores of grain and oil, he contented himself with introducing the methods of administration with which he had experimented in Belgium and Poland. He requisitioned everything and left the people to starve. He compelled the whole civilian population between 18 and 42 to work for him. He drove the embassies of neutral nations from Bucharest, that there might be no witnesses of his doings. He levied great sums as indemnities. He dispatched to Germany many members of the chief families as hostages, and used them as hostages have always been treated by a barbarous enemy. The Romanian government at Jassy could only look on in impotent wrath, and in its heart in new counts to the long reckoning. Meanwhile, the Romanian parliament had met at Jassy on 22nd December, and King Ferdinand, in his speech from the throne, had endeavored to encourage his people. Our army has sustained the struggle according to the glorious traditions of our ancestors, and in a way which justifies us in regarding the future with perfect confidence. So far the war has imposed upon us great hardships and profound sacrifices. We shall bear them with courage, but we maintain a complete trust in the final victory of our allies, and in spite of difficulties and sufferings, we are determined to struggle by their side with energy unto the end. Before the common peril, we must all show an added patriotism and unity of heart and mind. On the 24th, the proof was given of the national unity by the formation of a coalition government, which included Ms. Yotaki Janescu and some members of his party. The old conservatives had disappeared from practical politics. Karp, still living in dread of Russia, frankly announced that, since Romania's victory must be Russia's victory, he desired Romania to be beaten. Marja Lohmann refused Bredianu's offer to join the national ministry and remained in Bucharest, where he hobnobbed with his country's enemies. Meantime, the government at Jassy most wisely set about the reform of certain domestic abuses, the existence of which had crippled Romania in war. A scheme of universal and direct suffrage was drawn up to replace the old electoral college system under which the peasants and working classes had been virtually defranchised. Even more urgent was the question of land reform, for the Romanian system of land tenure was still medieval. Absentee landlords and speculative middlemen had divorced the peasant from the soil of his country. A scheme was prepared to give a large grant of crown lands and to purchase vast areas compulsorily from the chief landowners with the result that the percentage of the country under peasant proprietorship would rise from 53 to 85. Such reforms were an immediate necessity if the rank and file were to be sustained under their crushing burdens, and they were a vital import to the whole alliance. They extended the principles of democracy within the ranks of those who were democracy's champions. When in the beginning of 1917, 
the Austro-German threat against the Seventh Line was made manifest. Russia, according to the rules of sound strategy, attempted a diversion on another part of the front. Risky pushed westward from Riga on 5th January over the frozen marshes and carried the village of Kalsten, west of the Great Tyrone Marsh, taking some 800 prisoners and 16 guns. He was immediately counterattacked, but managed to hold the ground won. On the ninth, a second Russian attack was made about 50 miles north of Devinsk, and the island in the Davina east of Kaladin was captured. The battle in the Riga sector continued for some days, and altogether 32 guns were taken. On the 24th, a violent German counterattack recovered some of the ground lost, taking about 1,000 prisoners. A second followed on the 30th in the sector between Colson and Lake Babbitt, and again there was a slight withdrawal. During the same month, there was some fighting in the corner of the Bukovina between Dornobatra and Kimpoling, but the divided command on that wing made success impossible, but Lechitsky reported to Brusilov the remaining armies to their king and Sakharov direct to Aliexev. All these actions were subsidiary to the Romanian campaign and meant no more than that Russia, when she believed that a bit of the enemy front had been weakened by the withdrawal of divisions to Mackenzie, took the opportunity of testing its strength. In that day's weather, no large movement could be contemplated. A frozen marsh might give her a chance of a local attack, but the front as a whole was bound in the rigors of a Russian winter. Even had the weather been favorable, it is doubtful whether Russia could have done more than devise here and there a small diversion. She was busy rearranging her forces for the conjoined Allied offensive of the new year and had accumulated a reserve of some sixty fresh divisions. She had already sustained over four million casualties, and at the moment was maintaining about ten million men under arms. Aliak and Gorko was straining every nerve to complete the armament and training of the new troops. There was also another reason. For some months it had been growing fatally clear that the government of the so-called governing classes were not the equal of the nation and the army. There were elements there of scandalous corruption. There were sections whose sympathies were avowedly with German bureaucracy rather than with Russian freedom. There were many who feared democracy as a foul skin dreads cold weather. There were sinister influences at work whose power lay in the erotic and neurotic mysticism of the East. All these dark things fearing daylight and the will of the liberated people, had affinities with Germany, and could not face with comfort the defeat of the great absolutist power. It was to such elements that Germany appealed in her attempts at a separate peace. The first was in the summer of 1915, when the reactionary ministers, Sukum Linov, Schlegel-Levtov, and Maklakov, fell from power. That attempt was frustrated by the influence of the army and the Duma, which grew as the skies darkened during the Great Retreat. But the sun of prosperity in 1916 brought the parasites to life again. Monsieur Boris Sturma became prime minister in succession to Monsieur Gorodikam, and in August, Monsieur Sazarov, the foreign minister and in many ways Russia's ablest civilian statesman, was dismissed and his portfolio taken over by the premier. Once again, Germany made a bid, and with some hope of success. The terms suggested as the basis for discussion embraced the opening of the Bosphorus and the Hellespont, the offer to Russia of Armenia and Persia, eastern Galicia, the Bukovina, and part of Moldavia, an independent Poland with a Russian Grand Duke as king, and certain special rights for Germans in Lithuania and in the Baltic provinces. The proposals were reasonable and attractive, but Germany very seriously meant business. But there was never for one moment a chance of a separate peace. Had the Russian government accepted any such overtures, it would have been a revolution next morning, 
a revolution both bloodless and final, when the army would have engineered it. But the purblind eyes of the bureaucrats were not open to this certainty. There was a serious risk that they might commit themselves to some folly, and, in dread of popular reprisals, attempt to stir up an abortive revolt, which they could use as an excuse for stern reactionary measures. Monsieur Protopopov was added to the ministry with the portfolio of the interior, and this kindled the suspicions of patriotic Russia. He had been vice president of the Duma in October and a member of the progressive bloc, but for some unknown reason he had changed his side, apparently on his return from his visit to Britain in the spring, and had become an ally of the reactionaries. On Tuesday, 14th November, the Duma met. It was a stormy sitting, and the ministry was torn to shreds by the progressive critics. In especial, Mr. Emilyukov, the leader of the cadets, attacked the premier in one of the most outspoken speeches ever made on Russian soil. He accused him of corruption and anti-patriotism, and he did not hesitate to name the dark forces behind him. Patriotic members of every group supported the cadet leader, and Monsieur Sturmer was left with the alternatives of dissolving the Duma or resigning. The emperor refused to permit the first course, and accordingly the premier went out of office, though not out of power, for he was immediately given a high court appointment. His fall was brought about not only by Monsieur Milyakov's speech, but by his mishandling of the food question and the Romanian situation, and by the fact that the army chiefs were to a man his opponents. He was succeeded by Monsieur Trepov, who is Minister of Communications, had done good work in the construction of the new railways. Monsieur Trepov was a strong conservative and far removed in sympathy from the bloc, but he was a nationalist and an honest man, and he earnestly desired to come to a working agreement with the Duma, for he realized on such an alliance Russia's military efficiency in the near future would largely depend. He was a statesman of the Stolopin type, who believed that somehow or other the work of government must be carried on. His aim was a ministry of experts and businessmen, a mobilization of the best national talent, but he was handicapped from the start, for he was compelled to retain the deeply suspect Monsieur Protopopov at the interior. When the Duma met again on 2nd December, after ten days adjournment, the situation was little easier. The new premier was able to announce for the first time, in public, the agreement of 1915 between Russia, France, Britain, and Italy, which definitely established Russia's right to Constantinople and the Straits. He made an eloquent appeal to all parties to close up their ranks, and promised various domestic reforms, but he was heard impatiently. For so long as Monsieur Protopopov, remained in the cabinet, there could be no cooperation, even with the conservative elements in the Duma. The demand of all the nationalist parties was now the same, the ministries who had the confidence of the nation. It was men and not measures that were sought, a cabinet of single-minded statesmen who in civil life could reproduce something of the clean and steadfast purpose of the soldiers. It was an aim endorsed not only by the Duma, but by the Council of the Empire and by the Congress of the Nobility. With the new year, it became plain to the world that Russia's political life was approaching a crisis. All her commands, both civil and military, seemed to be in the melting pot. General Shuvayev, who had been Minister of War since March 1916 and had the complete confidence of the Duma, was removed in January and his place was given to a comparatively obscure soldier, General Biaelov, who had the favor of the court. At the same time, an epidemic of ill health fell upon other ministers, and three, the ministers of finance, commerce, and foreign affairs, were granted sick leave. Monsieur Trepov, having held the office of premier for just six weeks, retired and gave place to Prince N.D. Golitsyn an undisguised reactionary, and Count Ignatieff, 
the only liberal member of the ministry, was removed from the Department of Education. There were signs that the sinister influence of Monsieur Protopopov, the Minister of the Interior, was growing. The Emperor, in a rescript to Prince Golitsyn, outlined the duties of the government, a procedure which had not been adopted since 1905, and which seemed to foreshadow a still further weakening of constitutional government and a relapse into autocracy. The food question, too, was growing serious. It had been scandalously mismanaged, and in a great grain-producing country like Russia, food was scarcer among the people than with the grain-importing belligerents who had all the difficulties of overseas transport. A dangerous spirit was rising in all classes of society, for it seemed clear that such a result could not have come about without corruption and bungling in high quarters. Finally, the armies at the front had much to complain of in the way of faulty transport and inadequate supplies. The emperor, in his rescript, touched upon these matters. At the present moment, he wrote, when the tide of the Great War has turned, are the thoughts of all Russians without distinction of nationality or class are directed towards the valiant and glorious defenders of our country, who, with keen expectation, are awaiting the decisive encounter with the enemy. In complete unison with our faithful allies, not entertaining any thought of a conclusion of peace until final victory has been secured, I firmly believe that the Russian people, supporting the burden of war with self-denial, will accomplish their duty to the end, not stopping at any sacrifice. The national resources of our country are unending, and there is no danger of their becoming exhausted, as is apparently the case with our enemies. This, said the ordinary Russian, was very well in its way, but the armies were not well supported. The poor were not fed, and the blame for this did not lie upon the Russian people, who had no real say in the government. The events of January caused a dark shadow of doubt to creep over the face of the state. The people saw strange forces at work which they could not interpret, but which they profoundly mistrusted. The government, patched and tinkered at by the autocracy, was inadequate to the temper of the nation. Russia was notoriously a slow and patient country, and shrewd observers on the spot about this time, while admitting that revolt some day was inevitable, considered that it would be postponed till peace. But those familiar with the incalculable ways of revolutions refrained from prophesying. They knew that during a period of apparent calm, some chance event, a speech, a manifesto, a street riot, a sudden death, may bring the bolt from the lowering sky. End of chapter 66, part 2Section 31 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress, Continued, and The Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lori Waymeyer. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 67, The French Advance at Verdun, October 21 through December 18, 1916. It is a feature of great campaigns that certain places arrogate to themselves an importance which is not their due under the strict laws of strategy. They may have acquired this significance for military reasons, but they are apt to retain it when those reasons have gone. A spell hangs over them which sways unconsciously the minds of men. Once they may have been fortresses or sally ports or ganglia of communications, but the fortress may be battered to earth, the sally port blocked, and the routes of traffic diverted, and they will still possess an illogical but compelling power. The tides of battle may flow in far from other channels, but neither side can cut itself loose from the old battleground. Ypres 
was such a case, and Verdun was another. To Germany, the latter was in very truth a damnosa hereditas. Her success had been so triumphantly advertised that for very shame's sake she was fain to keep up the show of consummating it. When the Somme offensive was unleashed, she still continued her efforts to break the foi de terre fleury Souville line of defense. She tried desperately on 11th July and again on 1st August. On 21st July, the imperial crown prince told his troops, The French count on our relinquishing our pressure on Verdun now that they have begun their attack on the Somme. We will show them that they are deceived. But the showing did not come. August saw Fleury firmly in French hands, and with the abortive attempt of 3rd September to advance from the Bois de Chapitre, the enemy's strength seemed to be exhausted. By that date, the grim Picardy struggle had drawn to it every spare battery and battalion on his western front. Germany would fain have let the Meuse uplands fall into stagnation of the Vosges and the Aisne, but she was not permitted to cry out of the contest she had set. For France had taken up the gauge in deadly earnest. For her, too, Verdun had become a test of prowess, a palladium not to be valued by common standards. It was not enough to have stood fast. The time had come to advance. No triumphs on the Somme could wholly divert her eyes from that awful battlefield where she had won a glory not excelled by the victories of Austerlitz and Marengo. Verdun was the predestined soil on which, above all other spots, the enemy must reap the bitter harvest he had sown. In such a resolve there was something antique and splendid, some touch of that far-reaching imagination and poetry with which France had so often astonished the world. It was a strange land on which to set one's affections. The map might show the names of woods and villages and ravines, but these features were no longer there. From Fort Souville, looking north, the eye saw nothing but desert pitted and hummocked as by the eruption of gigantic earthworms. No tree or masonry broke the desolation. The very gullies and glens, the quarries and the crests had been beaten out of their old shapes. There were hundreds of thousands of men in the landscape, burrowing below that fretted soil, but there was no sign of them. Only the naked ridges of Douaumont, Foix de Terre, and Vaux were left of what had once been a pleasantly diversified country countryside, but in every square yard of that landscape lay France's dead. The fighting at Verdun from October 24 to December 18, 1916, may be regarded as a distinct and complete episode in the campaign. Beyond weakening the enemy's manpower and morale, it had no direct bearing upon the main strategy. The terrain was self-contained and the offensive, conducted as it was in wintry weather, did not spread to other areas. But as an episode, it may well be regarded by the historian as one of the greatest in the war. It was a thing Thing, perfect alike in conception and execution, like some noble lyric interpolated in a great drama. At Verdun, all that had been learned during the two years of war, and in especial, the lessons of the Somme were put into practice. The use of standing and creeping barrages, the new trench weapons, the art of consolidating ground, the nettoyage of captured trenches, the relation of missile to cold steel. In these and a thousand other problems, the Allied view was brilliantly vindicated. The test was a hard one, for the enemy was prepared, he was equal in numbers to the actual attacking force, and the advance was a frontal one made over a country as bald and as exposed as the granite top of a mountain. A new figure enters into the list of France's soldiers. Pétain had held the fort in the dark days of the spring of 1916, and Nivelle had borne the burden of the long summer battles. The latter still commanded the second army from the Argonne to Lorraine, but the coming attack was entrusted to a group of divisions under Charles Mangin. A man of fifty, Mangin was one of the great brotherhood of colonial generals, which included Geoffrey, Galliani, Liotte, Gouraud, and Passaga. Born of a distinguished Lorraine family, which for generations had been eminent in the law and the army, he had served since his 24th year in Tonkin and in every part of northern Africa, and had been one of Marchand's companions in the great march from the Congo to the Nile. He had made himself the first authority on colonial campaigning and had written a famous book on the fighting stuff which France possessed in her dark-skinned subjects. He was at home at the outbreak of the Great War and was given command of the 8th Brigade in the 5th Army. Army, that army which took the shock of the first German onset at Charleroi. At the Marne, he led the 5th Division and the 3rd Corps. He was heavily engaged at the First Battle of the N. He was in the Artois fighting in the summer of 1915, and early in 1916 was in the Frise area south of the Somme. At the end of March 1916, he came with his division to Verdun and led his men to the recapture of La Cayette Wood and on 22nd May to the glorious and short-lived 
reconquest of Douaumont. In June, he received a corps, the new Third Colonial Corps, and was given charge of the crucial sector on the right bank of the Meuse. In appearance, he was a typical soldier of France with his dark, stiff thatch of hair, his skin tanned by African suns, his iron jaw, his piercing black eyes that held both humor and fire. There was thought in his face as well as ardor and resolution, and he had that first requisite of great captains, imagination, and an insight into the hearts of his troops. No man could speak more appositely that word which nerves the soldier to desperate ventures. Since the land from Audramont to Damlou was without cover and was commanded by the enemy on the high ground at Douaumont and Fort Vaux, it was clear that a series of local actions would not avail. Any position won by these would be at once rendered untenable, and only a grand assault pushed forward to the main objectives would serve the French purpose. But since this would mean a frontal attack over difficult country, it demanded for its success the most meticulous preparation. Mangin proposed to make the attempt with three divisions in line, three divisions which had already held the sector and knew every inch of it. These were the 38th Division, under Guillaume de Salin, composed of Zouab's colonial infantry and those Moroccan and Algerian troops which had first won their spurs at Dixmud, and the 133rd and 74th Divisions of Pasaga and Laudemel, composed of chasseurs and infantry of the line from every district of France. One division was taken out of the line at the end of August, and the other two at the end of September, and withdrawn to a back area for training and rest. That training was carried out on a piece of ground modeled to reproduce the actual terrain, and an especial and exact counterpart of Fort Duamont was constructed so that every man of the attacking force should know the work assigned to him. Moreover, the training included practice in the new tactics of assault learned on the Somme, which had not yet been tried in the Verdun area. As regards materiel, there was a great increase in batteries and stores of shells and much road-making and laying of light railways to ensure the rapid passage of munitions. Two divisions were left in the sector of assault and for twenty Twenty days in the incessant rain of October, these had a heavy time preparing trenches, dugouts, headquarter posts, dressing stations, and cover for the guns. In October, the enemy held the front between Avocor and Les Epages, with fifteen divisions, of which seven were in the first line. Between Audramont and Damlou Battery, he had twenty-one battalions in front line, seven in support, and ten in reserve. After the battle, the Germans, following their familiar practice, announced that they had long resolved to evacuate the positions they had lost, and were in the act of doing so when the French attacked. Captured documents told a different tale. One commander enlarged on the immense importance of Douaumont and the necessity of safeguarding the German hold on it. An army, Order of Lacau, dated 18th September, enjoined the strengthening of the front and the preparation of reserve positions. As late as 23rd October, we find the German commanders perfectly alive to imminence of a French attack and making plans to meet it while urging their men to hold their ground at all costs. Mangin's intentions were well known to his opponents, and his attack had nothing of the nature of a surprise. They had no inclination to cede anything, least of all the vital Duamont, and they believed that they were strong enough to beat him off, for on the ground they had over 200 batteries and equal numbers of men. On Saturday, 21st October, the French guns opened, directed by kite balloons and airplanes in the one brief spell of clear weather which October showed. Mangin had 289 field and mountain pieces and 314 heavy guns. Methodically, from hour to hour, the enemy lines were pounded to atoms. The Verdun area, like the Somme, was losing its old nomenclature and becoming a tangle of uncouth trench names. The enemy had been busy since midsummer and had a vast number of new trenches. On the skirts of the woods of Chenoise and Chapitre, the neck of the ridge which links the Souville and the Douaumont uplands and in and around the quarries of Audramont. Every little ravine which cuts the slopes had become a nest of dugouts. On all these new works the French artillery played night and day, till the quarries and gullies were choked with rubble. On Sunday, the 22nd, a heavy shell landed in Douaumont Fort, and there was the glare of a great fire. That same day, a feint of the infantry obliged the enemy to reveal his new batteries, and many of them were marked down and shelled. That night, a captured German pigeon message showed that things were in a bad way in the enemy's front line. Instant relief was begged for, and a hundred deserters came over, including an officer, who was rash enough to prophesy, You will never retake Douaumont, he said, any more than we shall take Verdun. On the 23rd, the three divisions of assault moved up to take their places in the assembly trenches, relieving the muddy and weary troops who, for three weeks, had been preparing 
clearing the ground. The frontage was roughly seven kilometers, and the French position extended from the wood of Audramont, just south of the quarry skirting the wood of Navet, covering Fleury village to the south edge of the Chemin Wood, north of Lufay Fort. It had been decided to conduct the operation in two stages. The first objective was a line formed by the Audramont quarries, the ridge north of the Ravine de la Dame, the trench north of Thiamont Farm, and Fausse Côte Battery, the northeast side of Chapitre Wood, the Viola Trench in the Fumin Wood, and the Steinmetz Trench, before Damlo Battery. After consolidating on this line, the troops would advance to their final objective, the ridge north of the Coulivre, Ravine, Duamont Village, and Fort, the north and east sides of the Fausse Côte Ravine, the Pond of Vaux, the Siegen Trench west of the Fumin Ravine, and Damlo Battery. On the French left was the division of Guillot de Salins, directed upon Audramont, Thiamont, and Duamont. In the center, Passaga's division, moving upon the wood of La Cayette, and on the right, L'Artemel's division, with before it the Fumin Chapitre and Chenois woods, and the battery of Damlou. Between the divisions, there was a noble emulation. On your left, Passaga told his men, you have the famous Africans. You are disputing for the honor of retaking Fort Duamont. Let them know that they can count on us to support them, to open the door for them, and to share their glory. By the morning of Tuesday, day 24th october while the guns still thundered the clear weather had gone and a thick autumn fog hung over the uplands the valley of the meuse was hidden and even the next ridge a quarter of a mile away the hour fixed for the assault was late to enable the light to improve and at ten minutes to twelve when the troops went over to the parapets the haze was lifting and the french airplanes were droning in the sky through the muddy fringes of the old woods and along the back of the foie de terre went the three divisions methodically calmly and with perfect certitude it was like the ground round cavalry pickets, where every yard is churned and trodden, but here it was as if the trampling had been done by cohorts of mammoths and mastodons. Success came at once. At Mangin's headquarters, Geoffrey, Nivelle, and Pétain had arrived to watch the fortunes of the day, and presently, through the raw October weather, came telephone messages of a surprising and economical triumph. It was clear that the plan of the two stages must be foregone, for the three divisions were making one mouthful of the whole objective. Hordes of gray-clad prisoners came running back through the mist till to the troops in reserve it seemed that the men surrendering must far outnumber the attackers at half past two in the afternoon the wind rose and dispersed the haze and from the observation post near souville the french infantry were seen moving up the slopes of duamont at three came the news from the aircraft that they were in the fort before the dark fell every objective had been gained and over four thousand five hundred prisoners including a hundred and thirty officers were on their way to the french rear let us examine the progress of the day. On the extreme left, the 11th Regiment attacked the Haudramont quarries, which had been turned into a gigantic fort. The place was encircled and mastered after a fierce struggle with grenades in the main quarry, and an enemy counterattack beaten off. On their right, the left wing of Guyot de Salin moved through the relics of the wood of Naoué on the Ravine de la Dame as their first objective, and the Coulouvre Ravine as their second. These two gullies lay on the southern side of the depression into which the Duamont Bras road dipped after after leaving the tableland the fourth regiment of zouaves and the colonial tirailleurs had won their second objective by two o'clock and patrols had pushed as far as the heli ravine north of the bras road in the deeper dugout some of the enemy remained ignorant of what was happening above ground that night a french sergeant wandering among the shell holes was taken prisoner by a party of germans and pushed into a subterranean chamber where dinner was being served he asked where he was and was told the ravine de la dame in return, he told them that Thiamont and Duamont had fallen, and had the satisfaction of taking back to his line 200 prisoners and six machine guns. Guillot de Salin's right had a like success. A Moroccan battalion carried Thiamont fort and farm, and a Zouave battalion coming after them flung themselves on Duamont village. There now remained only Duamont fort, a grim hump on the crest seen dimly through the fog. Its conquest had been reserved for two battalions of the Moroccans, one under Commandant Modat launched the assault and carried the first objective. Then they halted to organize, and through them passed Commandant Kroll's men, whose duty it was to turn the defense of the fort on the right and left. Behind them came the spearhead, the battalion under Commandant Nikolai, which was destined for the actual storm. They were all picked men, and for weeks had been practiced upon this very problem, till each man knew every yard of the objective, like his own name. For a moment, but only for a moment, they lost direction in the mist. 
Then the broom opened and disclosed their goal, and after a second's halt, while each man gazed with reverence at a place so famous and so long in mind, they swept upon it through the German barrage, one of their own airplanes flying low above them. They scrambled over the fosse, carried the outer works, and bombed the remaining garrison out of the chambers. It was only three hours since they had left their parapets. The center division under Pasaga had the longest road to travel. Advancing from Fleury, it had to cross the Basile Ravine, where ran the railway from Verdun to Vaux, and beyond that the wood of La Cayette, honeycombed with trenches. It had a difficult starting place, for at that point the enemy front formed a small salient, and accordingly the rate of advance of the different units had to be nicely calculated. General Ancelac, commanding the left brigade, fell early in the day, and was replaced by Colonel Houtin, who had won fame in the Cameroons' fighting. In fifty-eight minutes the division had attained its two objectives, and held a line from just east of Duamont Fort to the slopes north of the Fausse Cote Ravine and west of Vaux Pond. There, as the mist lightened, they watched with wild excitement the colonials on their left carry Duamont. The fiercest fighting fell to the right division under Lardamel. The shoulder of hill crowned by Vaux Fort was a difficult problem in itself, and it had been defended by the enemy with a perfect spider's web of trenches. The terrain was bounded on the left by the Souville Vaux Road descending the Fontaine's Ravine, and on the right by the Damlou Battery on the steep overhanging the Wavre. The intervening space was occupied with the debris of three woods and a number of little ravines. The Germans had constructed a strong front line from just north of Souville to the Lagayette Ridge above Damlou, including the trenches named Moltke, Clauschwitz, Moudre, Steinmetz, and Verde. Behind was an intermediate line with as points in it the work called Petit Depot and the battery of Damlou. The second line, a kilometer or more behind the front line, ran from the place where the Fontaine's Ravine begins to open into the Vaux Valley and included the trenches of Hanau, Siegen, Dessal, and Damlou Village. Lardamel's men were troops of the line and chasseurs, in large part contingents brought from Dauphiné and Savoy. Their first rush took them into most of the first objective, but Clauschwitz Trench held on till three o'clock. The intermediate line followed, but it was eight o'clock before it was all captured, the Petit Depot being the last point to fall. Early in the day, Damlou Battery had been brilliantly carried by the 30th Regiment, but the second line was not touched, and all through the night there was fierce fighting, where the Savoyards of the 230th Regiment were engaged in the Wood of Fumin and the east side of the Fontaine's Ravine. In such a war as this night brought no peace to either side, and through the mud and the darkness the battle continued. The combat had now centered itself on the Vaux Ridge. On the morning of Wednesday, the 25th, the last survivors of the garrison of Duamont surrendered, and next day there were heavy German counterattacks against the fort, which were broken up by the French fire. There, the line remained firm, while on the Vaux Ridge it was creeping inexorably round the ruins which in June the gallantry of Reynal could not save from German hands. The great struggle was for the German second line, the trenches Gotha, Siegen, and Dessal, and Damlou village. For if these fell, the fort of Vaux must go. On the 26th they were bitterly contested, and that day a French patrol got close to the south and east angles of the fort itself. Another reconnaissance descended the northern slope of the Fumin wood and found touch with Pasaga's right at Vaux Pond. The weather had become foul again, and it was clear that a continued attack on the fort by Lardamel would be too high. A trial. Accordingly, the troops were slightly retired, and the guns opened in a new and furious bombardment of the bald hilltop. On the 28th, General Andlauer's 9th Division relieved Lardamel, and Arlabas relieved Pasaga. On the morning of Thursday, 2nd November, the French observers reported that part of the fort, where the explosions had been most frequent, was in process of evacuation by the enemy. When night fell, a company of the 118th Regiment went forward to Reconnoit, the ground beyond the fort, while a company of the 298th, Reynal's old regiment, were told off to enter the ruins. They had some difficulty in finding a way in, so wholesale had been the destructive work of the French guns. But when they effected an entrance, they found that the garrison had not stayed upon the order of their going. Large quantities of military supplies, not to speak of a recent army ordering and joining the strengthening of the defense gave the lie to the German tale that the evacuation had been decided on long before, and that the French had been forcing an open door. Vaux Fort had been claimed by the enemy as far back as 9th March, and had finally fallen on 7th June. Its recapture forced the Germans in this section off heights into the marshy plain, and combined with the 
retaking of Douaumont gave the French the vantage in observation. Next day, Friday, 3rd November, Andlauer's division pushed beyond Vaux Fort to the edge of the plateau overhanging Vaux Glen. On the Saturday, they cleared the Germans off the northern slopes, crossing at one point the Vaux d'Amelot Road, but the enemy still held the Ardemont Ridge in strength. Later in the day, Arlebos's division pressed in from the Fumin Wood on the west side of the hamlet, and Andlauer's men on the eastern side carried their line well up the Ardemont slopes. Vaux village was now in French hands. At the same time, on the right, the village of Damlo was won back. In ten days, Mangin had wiped out the German gains during eight months of battle. The French line now stood as it had stood on February 26, 1916, the sixth day of the Crown Prince's offensive. At a cost of under 6,000 casualties, he had taken more than the number of German prisoners, many guns, and vast quantities of supplies, and had put out of action the equivalent of two enemy divisions. Before the first phase was concluded, Nivelle had made his plan for a second and bolder effort. The Great October attack had not been pushed to the limits of the French strength. The troops had been deliberately halted in accordance with Nivelle's cautious plan when they might have gone farther. The French command took an artistic pride in their actions, rounding off neatly their set objectives, but not straggling beyond them. Moreover, they desired to fight economically, and operations prolonged at random are costly. But the situation after the fall of Douaumont and Vaux had certain drawbacks. The enemy had lost his principal observation posts, but he had others nearly as good, such as Hill 342 on the Côte du Poivre and Hill 378 between Louvemont and the farm of Chambrette. The Louvemont Plateau, too, with its hollow and deep-cut ravines, gave him good gun positions, and so long as he held it, the access to Dromont was meager and difficult. To complete the October victories, it was necessary to push the Germans back from the high ground between Louvemont and Bézonvaux. The enemy line after the fall of Douaumont lay from the Meuse, just south of Vacherville, and covering that village along the south side of the crest of the Côte du Poivre, through the wood of Audramont on the north side of the Glen, where ran the Bras Douaumont Road, just north of Douaumont Fort and Village, and along the south slopes of the wood of Audramont above Vaux to the flats of the Wavre. It was a strong line, and the Germans, alarmed by the events of October, had greatly strengthened it. The front bristled with redoubts. Many new trenches had been dug, and advantage had been taken of the ravines to form strong points to take any advance in flank. The task of the attackers was harder than in October. Then, once the first line crust had been broken, the affair was to a large extent over, and the troops promenaded to victory. Now there was a series of crusts, each one of which must be pierced by stern fighting. The Germans had on the ten kilometers of front five divisions. They held their first line with fifteen battalions between eight thousand and nine thousand bayonets. They had the same number in immediate reserve, and the rest in quarters within easy call. Four other divisions were at hand in support. Mangin had four divisions of attack, those of Passaga and Guillot de Salin, which had come back out of the line for rest at the end of October. The 37th of Garnier du Plessis, which had been one of those to bear the brunt of the spring battles of Verdun, and the 126th of Muteau, which was new to the terrain. As before, the earlier operations all were trained upon a model of the ground they were destined to win. Nothing was left to chance. Every detail was scrutinized, and every contingency foreseen. The troops, already a cours d'élite, were strung to the highest pitch of enthusiasm by memories of past successes and the consciousness that France waited with hushed breath on the issue of the new adventure. Their commanders knew how to speak the decisive word. From the heights of the Ardemont, said Passaga, the enemy still sees a corner of that famous place where he thought to decide the fate of our country and of civilization. To you has been given the honor of winning that that height. You will push your bayonets well beyond it. You will add to the glory of your flag by the luster of another unforgettable day. Muteau told his troops, still unentered in the Verdun contest, you will justify the honor that has been done you. The enemy still clings to the Côte de Poivre whence he insults Verdun with his greedy eyes. You will hurl him off it. A l'heure dite, haute les coeurs, et en avant pour notre chère France. The beginning of December saw ill weather, high winds, rains, and flurries of snow. The artillery preparation due to start on the 2nd had to be postponed for a week, but on the 11th the air was clear, though the skies were still gray and threatening. Winter warfare can only be conducted in the pauses of storms, and a commander must snatch any interval of calm. 
At dawn on that day, the French airplanes were humming over the plateau and the guns opened. It was a moment most critical and dramatic in the history of the war. Germany was launching her peace proposals, and next day the imperial chancellor told the world that his country had given proof of her indestructible power by gaining victories over adversaries superior in numbers, and that her unshakable lines still resisted the incessant attacks of her foes. Some answer was needed, and France was preparing one more eloquent than any diplomatic note. A change, too, had come about in the French high command. Nivelle, the commander of the Second Army, had been nominated commander-in-chief in the West, and this was his last fight before he took up his new duties. Into it, he had put every atom of his vigorous energies. He told the cabinet in Paris of his plans and forecast with amazing accuracy the extent of his successes. Prepare, he said, to receive good news. Before the evening of December 15th, I will send you a telegram giving details of this and that success. No operation of war was ever more dramatically staged, and it is a proof of the complete confidence of Nivelle and his troops that he should have thus ventured to tempt fate and boldly prophecy. The grand bombardment began on the 11th, but ceased during the afternoon owing to bad weather. During the 12th, 13th, and 14th it continued, a far more difficult operation than that of October. The short winter days, the fog, and the rain made aerial observation uncertain, and on the air depends the virtue of the guns. The target, too, was less easy than in October for the enemy's front was cunningly grooved and recessed in the maze of ravines and little glens. The French were suffering also from what had been the greatest obstacle to the British in the winter's fighting on the Somme, the necessity of bringing up ammunition across an old battlefield. All the ground between Souville and Douaumont had been fought over, and though miles of new roads and light railways had been constructed, the transport of heavy shells was an arduous labor. Nevertheless, from the 11th onward, the strong points on the German front were scientifically blotted out, the Ardemont Wood and the ruined villages of Vacheroville, Louvement, and Besenvaux now turned into underground fortresses. The French barrage cut off all communication, and for three days the German defense, cowering in dugouts under a ceaseless tornado, went hungry. Deserters dribbled across the line, broken men who fled from the wrath to come. Friday the 15th dawned gray and chilly with snow showers and a lowering sky, but without the baffling fog. The French divisions of attack crossed their parapets at 10 in the morning. On the left Mouteau's division had for its main objective the hill called 342 on the Côte du Poivre. Next to it, Guillot de Salins struck at Louvement. On his right, Garnier du Plessis had the area between Chambrette Farm and Besonvaux, while Passega, on his right flank, aimed at the fortress Labyrinth which was once the wood of Ardemont. The task of the divisions varied much in difficulty. The whole movement was a swing forward of the right wing pivoting on the Côte du Poivre, so that while Muteau on the left had less than a mile, though a difficult mile to cover, the troops on the right had a two-mile advance before them. Muteau had an instant success. His men, infantry of the line, were for the most part reservists, with thirty years behind them. On the extreme left, Voilmont's brigade attacked Vacheroville at the crest of the Côte du Poivre. At seven minutes past ten, they had won the crest, and five minutes after the 112th Regiment was in the village. Twenty minutes later, the crowning position of Hill 342 was carried, and the intricate German defenses elaborated during eight weeks had passed into other hands together with 1,200 prisoners. That fierce half-hour was one of the most brilliant strokes of the campaign. Nothing stopped the fury of the assault. Not uncut wire or machine guns in pockets or unforeseen strongholds. That thunderous charge swept aside all hindrances like stubble. Vacheroville had made a strong place, but its strength was futile against the swift encircling tactics of the French and their tempestuous surge inwards. On Muteau's right, the brigade under Steinmetz, which took Hill 342, evoked the admiration of Guillaume de Salins' proud colonial who were stern judges of an assault. Tell your commander with our compliments, so ran the message, that for linesmen, that was pretty well done. East of Muteau, the Moroccan brigade of the colonials attacked from the wood of Audramont against Louvement village, which lay in the slight dip of the plateau where ran the highway from Vacheroville to Orne. There, Nicolai's battalion, the victors of Douaumont, had a desperate struggle in the first-line trenches, called Prague and Pomerania, and there fell Nicolai himself, shot through the forehead by a sniper who picked out the tall figure of the commandant. His death maddened his followers, and Louvement encircled on all three sides speedily fell. The right of the division was no less successful. In the ravine of Heli, the Zouaves repeated their October exploit in the ravine de la Dame. In three quarters of an hour, 
they were on the crest of Hill 378, after Duamont, the highest point of the neighborhood, and at twenty minutes past one, the farm of Les Chambrettes was in their hands. On their right, the division of Garnier du Plessis had a long and stubborn task. Its first difficulty was with the work called the Camp of Attila, at the head of the Heli Ravine, which was stubbornly defended by a grenadier battalion from Posen, whose officers themselves served the machine guns and whose colonel fought most gallantly to the end. One part of the division was able to push on almost to the edge of the wood of Carrière, where they were in touch with the Zouaves in Les Chambrettes. But the rest, after brilliantly carrying the enemy's first line, were held up in the second by the trenches called Weimar and Chemnitz, which lined the crest on the west side of the Hassoul Ravine, which descends to bison vauglen This position also checked the advance of Passaga, who in the morning had brilliantly carried the trenches and ravines in the wood of Ardemont. When the December dark fell, the French line was as follows. From Vacheroville to Louvement, the whole Côte de Poivre was in their hands, except a pocket on the crest which was reduced during the night. East of Louvement, they held the higher ground as far as Les Chambrettes farm, from which, owing to the enemy bombardment, they had slightly withdrawn. Thence, the front curved sharply back, running through the woods of La Vauche and Ardumont, and reaching the edge of the uplands just south of the little fort of Bisonvaux. Next day, 16th December, it was the task of Duplessis' division to make good the Weimar and Chemnitz trenches. Till this happened, Passaga on the right was held, and the Zouaves of Dessalin at Le Chambrette were awkwardly enfiladed. Indeed, the latter formed a sharp salient, and all night long had to struggle against attacks from the wood of Carrière. Little could be done in the darkness, for the moon was in its last quarter, and the blasts of snow made the obscurity profound. At the first light the advance began. Two battalions of Passaga's right brigade forced their way into Bisonville village, while a battalion on his left took in flank the De Pont Trench, which was a continuation of the more famous Weimar. Large numbers of prisoners were taken, but the French had no time to look after them, and their multitude of captives was almost their undoing. For some six hundred wandering back without an escort, and seeing that the attacking force at this point was a mere handful, recovered their arms, and skulking in trenches and in shell holes, opened fire from the back. The chasseurs were between two foes, and disaster might have followed but for the fact that the Zouaves on the left were busy executing a similar flanking movement, and had carried the ridge in the rear of the Weimar Trench. They saw what was happening farther east, and dispatched a company to the aid of the hard-pressed chasseurs. The Weimar defense was now hopelessly turned, and Duplessis's men swept over the debatable ground, through the wood of Carrière, and carried the line to the scarp of the plateau. The French front now lay where it had been on 24th February, the fourth day of the great battle. The German counterattacks came fast, and their main object was the little salient at Le Chambrette. All the afternoon of the 16th, they kept up a continuous bombardment on Dessalin's right, which for two days went through the extreme of human misery. To win ground is easy compared with the task of holding it, holding it through the long winter nights in mud and snow and bitter cold, with no dugouts, no hot food, no shelter, no rest from an over powering fatigue. For six days, a Zouave battalion under Lieutenant Colonel Richard held the Le Chambrette sector. On the 17th, the Germans counterattacked and managed to recover the ruins of the farm, the last point from which observation was possible towards Duamont and the Chauffeur Wood. The Zouaves refused to be relieved till they had won it back. On Monday, the 18th, at three o'clock in the afternoon, win it back they did, and such an attack has rarely been witnessed by mortal eyes. Every man was a muddy ghost, weary to death death and chilled to the bone. Long ago, in Marlborough's wars, the cry of En avant les gants glacés had attended the charge of the Maison du Roi. Now it was En avant la pièce gelée that the leader shouted. The frozen feet did not fail him. Men crawled on their knees. Men used rifles as crutches. But, limping and stumbling, they swarmed over Les Chambrettes and made it theirs. The action fought between 15th and 18th December was, considering its short duration, perhaps the most remarkable Allied success since the campaign opened in the West. The prisoners taken numbered 11,387, including 284 officers, 115 guns were captured or destroyed, 44 trench mortars, 107 machine guns, and much other material were taken. Four villages, five forts, many redoubts, and innumerable trenches were occupied, and the better 
part of six enemy divisions was destroyed. The French losses for the first day were in the neighborhood of 1,500. In the later days, the total mounted higher, thereby supporting Nivelle's point, for he had argued that it was only when the line grew stationary that losses came, and that an attack kept up continuously must be economical. A view which, as we shall see, was to play an important part in the next stage of French strategy. Moreover, it was no sudden gift from fortune, but a result foreseen and planned, a triumph of generalship and calculation, as well as of fighting prowess. The event came at an auspicious moment. It was for Nivelle a spectacular farewell to his old army, and an eloquent message to his countrymen on his assumption of the highest command. Above all, it was France's reply to Germany's maneuvering for a false peace. To her hypocritical overtures, Mangin told his men, you have answered with the cannon mouth and the bayonet point. You have been the true ambassadors of the Republic. You have done well by your country. End of chapter 67. Section 32 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress Continued, and The Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jenny, A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 68. The Position at Sea and in the Air, August 19th to November 28th, 1916, Part 1. The second half of the year 1916 brought no great sea battle to break the monotony of the vigil of the British Navy. The events which led to the Battle of Jutland were not repeated. Movements there were both in the North Sea and the Baltic, but none was followed by an engagement of capital ships. The autumn was indeed a period of high significance in naval warfare, but the struggle was waged below the surface. The face of the northern waters saw no encounter which deserved the name of a serious battle. For a moment in August there was hope of better things. On Saturday, the 19th, the German high sea fleet came out, preceded by a large number of scouting craft and accompanied by zeppelins. They found the British forces in strength and deemed it wiser to alter course and return to port. In searching for the enemy, we lost two light cruisers by submarine attack, the Nottingham, Captain C.B. Miller, and the Falmouth, Captain John D. Edwards. But happily, the loss of life was small. Footnotes. The Nottingham had a displacement of 5,400 tons and 25 knots. She had been in the battles of the Dogger Bank and Jutland. The Falmouth, which was also at the Battle of Jutland, had 5,250 tons and 25 knots. End footnote. One German submarine was destroyed, and another rammed and damaged. That same day, the British submarine E-23 attacked a German battleship of the Nassau class and hit her with two torpedoes. The enemy vessel was last seen in a precarious condition, being escorted back to harbor by destroyers. There was no further incident till the close of October, when destroyers of the German flotilla, which had its base at Zeebrugge, placed a bold exploit to their credit. The safety of the mighty Channel Ferry, which had carried millions of our troops safely backward and forward between France and England, had become almost an article of faith with the British people. In spite of drifting mines and submarine activity, our lines of communication had remained untouched, and Sir Reginald Bacon, the admiral commanding the Dover patrols, was able to report in his dispatch of 27th July 1916 that not a single life had been lost in the vast transport operations of two years. The night of Thursday, 26th October, was moonless and stormy, and, under cover of the weather, ten German destroyers slipped out of Zeebrugge and made their way down channel. Air reconnaissance had given them the exact location of our minefields and our main cross-channel route. Creeping along inshore in the dark, they managed to elude the vigilance of the British patrols. They fell in with an empty transport, the Queen, 
which they promptly torpedoed. The vessel kept afloat for six hours, and all her crew were saved. Six of our drifters were also sunk, and then British destroyers came on the scene. One of them, the Flirt, was surprised at close quarters by the enemy and sunk, while another, the Nubian, was torpedoed while attacking the invaders and went to ground, her toe having parted in the heavy weather. Footnotes. The Flirt belonged to C-class and had 380 tons and 30 knots. The Nubian was of the F group and had 985 tons and 33 knots. Both had been engaged in the operations off the Belgian coast under Rear Admiral Hood in the autumn of 1914. The enemy made off without apparently suffering any losses from our gun or torpedo fire, but there was evidence that two of his destroyers afterwards struck mines and perished. Such were the bare facts of an incident which, for the moment, agitated public opinion and increased the uneasiness as to our naval position, which the growth of submarine activity had already engendered. In itself, it was a small affair, a bold enterprise which had every chance in its favor, for the confusion and darkness made its success almost certain. The wonder was not that it had happened, but that it had not happened before. Major Morat and others had long been pointing out the importance of the Channel Ferry for Britain, and it would have been little short of miraculous if nothing had ever occurred to threaten that line of communication. The German adventure was to be expected so long as the nest of pirates at Seebrugge was not smoked out or hermetically sealed up, and such true preventive measures were both difficult and dangerous so long as the main German fleet was not out of action. Three more incidents of what may be called open fighting fell to be recorded before the close of the year. On the night of 1st November, the Old Ampt, a Dutch steamer, was captured by German destroyers near the old Hinder lightship. A prize crew was put on board, and the vessel was making for Zeebrugge. Early next morning, she was overtaken by British destroyers, and the prize crew made prisoners. Five German destroyers, which came up as escort, were engaged and put to flight. On 7th November, a British submarine under Commander Noel Lawrence fell in with a German squadron off the coast of Jutland and hit two battleships of the Kaiser class. Three days later, German torpedo craft of the latest and largest type, under cover of fog, attempted a raid on the entrance to the Gulf of Finland. They were engaged by Russian destroyers and driven off in confusion, losing from six to nine vessels. The main German successes during these months were won against liners and hospital ships. With regard to the latter, Germany followed her familiar method. She attacked vessels which bore conspicuously the mark of their non-belligerent mission, attacked them often in broad daylight, and then, to justify herself, invented the legend that they were laden with ammunition and war material. Footnote. The military purpose was, of course, to compel Britain to draw upon her scanty supply of destroyers to act as escorts to such vessels. End footnote. On 21st November, there was a flagrant instance in the torpedoing of the Britannic in the Z Channel off the southeast point of Attica. The Britannic, which in gross tonnage was the largest British ship afloat, was carrying over 1,000 wounded soldiers from Salonica, most of whom were saved, the total death roll being only about 50. The outrage took place in the clear morning light when the character of the great vessel was apparent to the most purblind submarine commander. On 6 November, the P&O liner Arabia, a sister ship to the India and the Persia, which had been previously destroyed, was torpedoed without warning in the Mediterranean, all the passengers and the majority of the crew being saved. Since the war began, the most striking fact in naval warfare has been the development of the range of action of the submarine. At first, it was believed in Britain that an enemy submarine could do little more than reach the British coast, and the torpedoing of the Pathfinder on 5th September, and of the three Cressys off the Hook of Holland on September 2nd, 1914,
came as an unpleasant surprise to popular opinion. In December of that year, Turpitz himself announced that the larger underwater boats could remain out for as much as 14 days at a time. Two months later, the U-boats were in the Irish Channel, and in May 1915 they were in the Mediterranean. There, to be sure, they were assisted by depots en route, and the full extent of the submarine's range was not understood till, in July 1916, the Deutschland reached the American coast. This exploit so heartened Germany that she announced a long-range blockade of Britain and promised in October to begin operations. The Allied governments protested to neutral states against the extension to submarines of the ordinary rule of international law, which permits a warship to enjoy for 24 hours the hospitality of foreign territorial waters. They urged that any belligerent submarine entering a neutral port should be detained there on the ground that such vessels, being submersible, could not be properly identified at sea and must escape the normal control and observation of other types of warships. On Saturday, 7th October, the German U-53, Captain Rose, footnote, this was perhaps the most advertised of all German submarines and though eagerly pursued, was never destroyed by the Allies. It was, however, crippled for good by an American subchaser about two months before the end of the war. End footnote. The German U-53 arrived at Newport, Rhode Island. She did not take in supplies, but she received certain information and presently departed. During the next two days, she sank by torpedo or gunfire eight vessels in the vicinity of the Nantucket lightship, including one Dutch and one Norwegian steamer. There was no life lost, owing to the prompt appearance of American destroyers. The performance created something like a panic in American shipping circles, and for a day or two, outgoing ships were detained. But it was soon obvious that talk of a blockade of the American coast would awaken a very ugly temper in the United States and could not be defended by the wildest stretch of the rules of international law. Submarines, which took at least a month coming and going from German waters, could not institute any effective blockade without illegal assistance on the American side, and the government of Washington was determined that the temptation should not arise. Accordingly, the performance of U-53 remained unique. The Deutschland arrived on its second voyage on 1st November, and the occasional transit of other submarines continued. But the Nantucket doings were not repeated, and the talk of long-range blockade was suddenly dropped. Footnote. The ocean cruiser type of submarine had a crew of 70 and a displacement approaching 3,000 tons, but they were slow to submerge and difficult to handle, and on the whole played a very small part in the war. End footnote. But in the eastern Atlantic and the Mediterranean, and in all the waters adjacent to the British and German coasts, the autumn saw a determined revival of Germany's submarine campaign. The comparative immunity which had endured throughout the summer was violently broken, and the tale of allied and neutral losses quickly mounted to a dangerous figure. Germany was operating now with the large boats laid down in the spring of 1915, boats with a radius of 12,000 miles, carrying deck guns with a range of 6,000 yards, with strong upper works capable of resisting hits by six-pounders, and with a surface speed of 25 knots and a submerged speed of 12. In the last six months of 1916, she completed not less than 80 new craft. Her promise to President Wilson of May 1916 was utterly disregarded. Vessels were torpedoed without warning and without provision being made for the safety of the passengers. The marina, for example, which was destroyed off the Irish coast at the end of October with considerable loss of life, had many Americans on board, but Berlin gambled on the preoccupation of the American people with the presidential election. Swedish, Danish, and Dutch vessels suffered heavily, and the Norwegian Merchant Navy was a special target owing to Norway's refusal to permit German submarines inside her territorial waters. The U-boats became insolent in their daring, 
and in the beginning of December, one of them shelled the town of Funshaw, Madeira, in broad daylight and sank several ships in her harbor. The barbarity of the enemy grew with his successes. The Westminster was torpedoed without warning on 14th December and sunk in five minutes. As the crew tried to escape, the submarine shelled them at 30,000 yards range, sinking one of the boats and killing the master and chief engineer. By the end of the year, Germany claimed that the Allied tonnage was disappearing from the sea at a rate of 10,000 tons a day. And though the figure was considerably overstated, yet beyond doubt a maritime situation had arisen, the gravest which had yet faced the Allies since the beginning of the war. The reason of Germany's success was not far to seek. So long as the U-boats confined themselves to the narrow seas, we could, by nets and other devices, take heavy toll of them and nullify their efforts. But all our normal defensive measures were idle when they extended their range and operated in the open waters of the Atlantic. A new problem had arisen to be met by new methods. Germany was attempting to meet the British blockade by counter-blockade to cripple the seaborne trade which brought food to the people of Britain and munitions of war to all the Allies. Our available merchant tonnage was shrinking daily, and with labor already taxed to its utmost, it looked as if it might be difficult to replace the wastage. An extravagant rise in prices, a genuine scarcity of food, even the crippling of some vital section of the Allied munitionment were possibilities that now loomed not too remotely on the horizon. To cope with the German campaign, there seemed at the moment to be three possible plans, two practicable but inadequate, one summary and final, but hard to achieve. Of a fourth, to make the sea no place for submarines, the possibility was not yet envisaged. The first was to arm all merchantmen. This would not prevent torpedoing, but it would make destruction by bombs or deck guns more difficult. And since no submarine could carry a large stock of torpedoes, the power of mischief of the underwater boat would be thereby limited. Such arming of merchantmen had the drawback that it would absorb a large number of guns for which there was other and urgent use, or, in the alternative, would compel munition factories to switch off from their normal work to ensure their production. It would also induce the Germans to revive wholesale their practice of sinking without warning. The second plan was to revive an old fashion and make all merchantmen sail in convoy. This method was unpopular among ship owners because of its inconvenience and delay, and it had the further objection that it would give the enemy submarines an easy target, assuming that they eluded the vigilance of the escorting warships. Moreover, the type of fast, lighter craft required for escort could only be provided by a large amount of new construction, or by withdrawing that type from its duties with the main battle squadrons. Both of the plans were confessed to be palliatives rather than cures, and both made further demands upon the already severely taxed reserve of British labor. The one final policy against submarines was to carry our minefields up to the edge of the German harbors and to pen the enemy within his own bases. But clearly this aggressive campaign was most hazardous so long as the main German fleet remained in being. It would be impossible, while the enemy's high sea fleet was still intact, to utilize a large part of our fleet in mining operations in his home waters without running the risk of a division of strength and a sudden disaster. The true remedy for the submarine menace was a naval victory which would destroy the better part of the capital ships. This did not mean that Sir John Jellicoe was forthwith to run his head against the defenses of Wilhelmshaven and risk everything in an attempt to bring the enemy to action. But it did mean that the last word, as always, lay with the main fleets, and that to rest on our laurels because the German high sea fleet was more or less immobilized was to repose upon a false security. The truth was that our command of the sea was far from absolute. We had not neutralized the enemy's fleet so long as it remained above water, and the development of submarine warfare had impaired the safety of our ocean-borne trade. We possessed a conditional superiority, but we could not make it actual and reap the fruits of it until we had won a decisive sea battle. 
This truth was obscured during the autumn of 1916 by some unfortunate publications of Mr. Winston Churchill, who, having returned from the front and being without official responsibility, was free to indulge in comments on the situation. Quote, the primary and dominant fact, he wrote, is that from its base in Scottish waters the British fleet delivers a continuous attack upon the vital necessities of the enemy, whereas the enemy from his home bases produces no corresponding effect upon us. End quote. He urged the country to rest satisfied with this quote unquote silent attack and criticized the Battle of Jutland as an quote, audacious but unnecessary effort unquote, to bring the enemy to action. No necessity of war, he argued, obliged us to accept the risk of fighting at a distance from our bases and in enemy waters. Apart from the fact that Mr. Churchill's view was in conflict with principles that had always governed our sea policy, his conclusion was wholly unwarranted by the facts. The German fleet, by the mere fact that it existed intact, did, quote, exercise a continuous attack upon our vital necessities, end quote. It crippled our efforts to overcome the very real submarine menace. A successful general action, so far from being a luxury and a trimming, was the chief demand of the moment, for only by the shattering of sheer could the U-boats be corralled, blinded, and effectively checkmated. The anxiety of the nation was presently reflected in certain important changes made in the high naval commands. For some time it had been urged that the post of first sea lord was the most vital in the navy, and that the man who held it should be one who had large experience of actual service under modern conditions. For 28 months, Sir John Jellicoe had been continuously at sea. He had been aforetime a successful admiralty official and understood headquarters procedure, but above all, he had learned at first hand the problems of the hour. It is desirable during any campaign that the man with first-hand knowledge of realities should be given the directing power at home. The main duty was to cope with the enemy submarine and to solve that conundrum needed the fullest experience of the enemy's methods. The policy had been followed when Sir William Robertson was brought back from France as chief of the Imperial General Staff, and the same course was now taken with the commander-in-chief at sea. On 4th December, Sir John Jellicoe was gazetted first sea lord in place of Sir Henry Jackson, while Sir David Beatty assumed command of the Grand Fleet. The new appointments were welcomed by the nation and did something to appease the critics. The crying needs of the moment were that our naval policy should not be considered as a thing by itself, but as a part of the whole strategic plan of the Allies, and that the administration at headquarters should be in the closest touch with the requirements of the fighting line. Sir John Jellicoe was not only a great sea captain, but a trained administrator and a man of statesmanlike wit and foresight and he brought to his new office an unequaled experience of active service. Moreover, the mere change of duties was in itself desirable, for an unrelieved vigil of twenty-eight months must tell upon the strongest constitution and the stoutest nerve. In all human enterprises, some readjustment of personnel is periodically necessary, if only to ensure that variation of tasks which is the best rest and refreshment to men of action. The new commander-in-chief was the man to whom fate had granted the widest experience of actual fighting. In two and a half years, Sir John Jellicoe had been no more than two and a half hours within range of the enemy. Sir David Beatty had had better fortune, for he had been at the Battle of the Bight of Heligoland. At the Battle of January 24th, 1915, and had been in action through the whole of the Battle of Jutland, at the age of 46, he succeeded to the highest fighting command in the British Navy, and those who believed that there was no final settlement of our sea difficulties except in a decisive victory over the main enemy fleet rejoiced that in Sir David Beatty, the spirit of the offensive was incarnate. The summer and autumn of 1916 saw no such spectacular revival of German aeronautics as marked the close of 1915. 
The Fokker, for some months a defense so formidable that the Allied air offensive came almost to a standstill, had found its level, and though Germany struggled hard to create new types, she did not again steal a march upon the Allied construction. Moreover, the opening of the Somme offensive saw an immense advantage in the tactical use of airplanes by the Allies, an advance marked by such boldness and ingenuity that the question of aerial supremacy seemed to be clearly decided. The French and British airmen had beyond doubt won the initiative. This was recognized by the enemy and captured letters were full of complaints of the inadequacy of the German reply. The Battle of the Somme in its later stages showed, indeed, something of the old seesaw, and there came moments when the German airmen recovered their nerve and made a stout defense. The popular phrase, the mastery of the air, was in those days apt to be misused. There were weeks when the Allies' total of loss seemed to be higher than that of their adversaries, and the pessimists complained that our mastery had gone. Mastery in the absolute sense never existed, the Allied squadrons still ventured much when they crossed the enemy lines, and they paid a price, sometimes a heavy price, for their successes. But they maintained continuously the offensive. Daily, they did their work of destruction and reconnaissance far inside the enemy territory, while the few German machines that crossed our lines came at night and at a great elevation. Hourly throughout the battles, they gave to the work of the infantry a tactical support to which the enemy could show no parallel. If the Allied losses had been consistently higher than the Germans, the superiority would still have been ours, for we achieved our purpose. We hampered the enemy's reserves, destroyed his depots, reconnoitred every acre of his hinterland, and shattered his peace of mind. For such results, no price could have been too high, for our air work was the foundation of every infantry advance. As a matter of sober fact, the price was not high. It was less than Germany paid for her inadequate defense. During the later Verdun battles and the great offensive on the Somme, the four main aerial activities were maintained. Our airplanes did long-distance reconnoitering work. They spotted for the guns. They bombed important enemy centers, and they fought and destroyed enemy machines. The daily communiques recorded the destruction of enemy dumps and depots and railway junctions and a long series of brilliant conflicts in the air, where often a German squadron was broken up and put to flight by a single Allied plane. To a watcher of these battles, the signs of our superiority were manifest. Constantly at night, a great glare behind the lines marked where some German ammunition store had gone up in flames. The orderly file of Allied kite balloons glittered daily in the sun, but the German, quote-unquote, sausages were few, and often a wisp of fire in the heavens showed that another had fallen victim to an Allied airman. A German plane was as rare a sight a mile within our lines as a swallow in November, but the eternal crack of anti-aircraft guns from the German side told of the persistency of the Allied inroads. The most interesting development brought about by the Somme action was that of quote-unquote contact patrols. The machines used were of the slowest type, and it was their business to accompany an infantry advance and report progress. In the intricate trench fighting of the modern battle, nothing was harder than to locate the position at any one moment of the advancing battalions. Flares might not be observed in the smoke and dust, Dispatch runners might fail to get through the barrage. The supply of pigeons might give out, or the birds might be killed en route. And the general behind might be unable in consequence to give orders to the guns. With the system of quote-unquote creeping barrages, it was vital that the command should be fully informed from time to time of the exact situation of the infantry attack. The airmen, flying low over the trenches, could detect the whereabouts of his own troops and report accordingly. Again and again, during the Somme, when the mist of battle and ill weather had swallowed up the advance, airplanes brought half-hourly accurate and most vital intelligence. A check could in this way be made known, and the guns turned on to break up an obstacle, while an advance swifter than the timetable could be saved from the risk of its own barrage. Curiously enough, 
except for rifle and machine gun fire from the German trenches, these flights were not so desperately risky. They were made usually at a height of something under 500 feet, and the German anti-aircraft guns, made to fire straight into the air, and usually mounted on the crests of the ridges, could not be trained on the marauders. These airplanes did not content themselves with reconnaissance. They attacked the enemy in the trenches with bombs and machine gun fire, and on many occasions completely demoralized them. There was one instance of a whole battalion surrendering to an airplane. Bouchevena was taken largely by French fire from the air, and the last trench at Coup de Corps fell to a British airman. End of chapter 68, part 1. Read by Jenny, 2023. Section 33 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress Continued, and The Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jenny. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 68, The Position at Sea and in the Air. August 19th to November 28th, 1916, Part 2. The air, as we have seen, was the realm for individual prowess, and slowly from the multitude of combatants, figures began to emerge of an epic greatness, men who steadily added to their tale of destruction, till in the world's eyes their work took the appearance of a grim rivalry. The Germans and the French made no secret of their heroes, but rather encouraged the advertisement of their names, but the Royal Flying Corps, true to its traditions, contented itself with a bare recital of the deed, till an occasional V.C. lifted the veil of anonymity. Germany possessed the great twin brothers Bolke and Immelmann, who rose to fame during the Verdun struggle. Immelmann was the chief exponent of the Fokker, and had 18 victims to his credit when, on 18th June, he was shot down by 2nd Lieutenant McCubbin, who was still in his novitiate in the Royal Flying Corps. On 28th October, Bolke, who the day before had destroyed his 40th Allied plane, perished in a collision. It is pleasant to record that these heroes of the air had the respect of their foes as well as the admiration of their friends, and the Allied airmen sent memorial wreaths to their funerals. The chief French champions were Guinemer and Nungesser, who survived the winter in spite of adventures where every risk on earth was taken. In September, for example, Guinemer's machine was struck by a shell at an altitude of 10,000 feet. He made vain efforts to hold it up, but it dropped 5,000 feet and was then caught by an air current and driven over the French lines. It crashed to earth and became an utter wreck, but the airman, though stunned, was unhurt. All records, however, were excelled by the British airman, Captain Albert Ball, formerly of the Sherwood Foresters. When not yet twenty, he had taken part in over a hundred aerial combats and had accounted for over thirty German machines. His life was fated to be as short as it was heroic, for he perished in the spring offensive of 1917 after having destroyed for certain forty-one enemy planes, with ten more practically certain, and many others where the likelihood was strong. No greater marvel of skill and intrepidity has been exhibited by any service, in any army, in any campaign, in the history of the world. Footnote. Captain Ball received the Victoria Cross posthumously. He had already won the DSO and the Military Cross. End footnote. During the better part of the Somme battle, the Allied machines were at least equal to the German in pace and handiness. The little Newport scouts in a special, dealt death to the kite balloons, and the Martinside and de Havilland fighting planes were more than a match for the Fokker. In October, however, the enemy produced two new types, the Spad and the Halberstadt, both based on French models and possessing engines of 240 HP. With them, his airmen could work at a height of 20,000 feet and swoop down upon British machines moving at a lower altitude. Hence there came a time, at the close of the Somme operations, when the seesaw once again slightly inclined in the Germans' favor. 
The moment passed, and long before the 1917 offensive began, the arrival of new and improved British types had redressed the balance. The aerial warfare of 1916, as summarized by the French staff, showed that 900 enemy airplanes had been destroyed by the Allies, the French accounting for 450 and the British for 250. 81 kite balloons had been burned, 54 by the French and 27 by the British. 750 bombardments had taken place, of which the French were responsible for 250 and the British for 180. Apart from tactical bombardments immediately behind the fighting line, the record of the year was least conspicuous in the matter of bomb dropping. Experience had shown that the German public were peculiarly sensible to this mode of attack, but the preoccupation of the Allies with great battles limited the number of machines which could be spared for that purpose. Nevertheless, some of the raids undertaken were singularly bold and effective, as a few examples will show. On 12th October, a Franco-British squadron of 40 machines attacked the Mauser rifle factory at Oberndorf on the Neckar, dropped nearly a thousand pounds weight of projectiles, and fought their way home through a hornet's nest of enemy craft. On 22nd September, two French airmen, Captain de Beauchamp and Lieutenant Dacour, in a Sopwith biplane, visited and bombed the Krupp works at Essen, a tour de force rather than a work of military importance, for Essen did not suffer much from the limited number of bombs which could be carried on a 500-mile journey. On 17th November, Captain de Beauchamp, in the same machine, flew over Friedrichshafen to Munich, which he bombed and then crossed the Alps and descended in Italy. But the most sensational achievement was that of 2nd Lieutenant Marchal on a special type of Newport monoplane, who on the night of 20th June flew over Berlin dropping leaflets. He was making for Russia, but unfortunately he had trouble with his machine and came down at Chom in Poland, where he was taken prisoner. He was then only 63 miles from the Russian trenches and had traveled 811 miles. The controversy raised by unofficial writers as to the administration of the British Air Service, which had sprung up originally when the first Zeppelin raids gave the civilian people of Britain food for thought, raged intermittently through 1916. It was a topic where the critic was at an advantage, for the ordinary man had no expert knowledge to test his criticism, and it was frequently impossible for the authorities to make reply, since that would have involved the publication of details valuable to the enemy. Any considerable increase in flying casualties brought the question to the fore, and the natural anxiety of the British citizen to make certain of the efficiency of a service on which he depended for his safety was buttressed by the grievances of private aircraft makers against the Royal Aircraft Factory at Farnborough. The private maker was indeed in a difficult case. His market must be with the government, to the government he looked for recompense for the toil and money he had spent in new production, and jealousy was inevitable of a state business which seemed to take the bread out of the mouth of a deserving industry. In August, a committee was appointed to consider the state of affairs at Farnborough, when various faults were discovered and a scheme of reorganization proposed. Another committee sat throughout the summer, investigating the charges brought by press and parliamentary critics against the administration and command of the Royal Flying Corps. The inquiry was a personal triumph for the Director General of Military Aeronautics, Sir David Henderson, who had no difficulty in disposing of the foolish charges, based on hearsay evidence or no evidence at all, which had been showered on his organization. At the same time, many unsatisfactory points were revealed, and the committee recommended that the Royal Aircraft Factory should be regarded rather as an experimental center than as a manufacturing establishment and urged that the efficiency of the service required that the fighting command should be separated from the responsibility for supplying equipment. The latter task should belong to a special department which should meet the demands both of the Army and the Navy. This last recommendation exposed one of the main difficulties of the question. The Navy and the Army were in perpetual competition, and the Air Board formed under the presidency of Lord Curzon in May 1916 could not control the quarrel. 
When Lord Curzon in December went to the war cabinet, he was succeeded at the air board by Lord Sydenham, who presently resigned. Mr. Lloyd George, some weeks later, attempted to solve the problem by reconstituting the air board with Lord Cowdray in charge and appointing Commander Payne to be the air member of the Board of Admiralty as Sir David Henderson was air member of the Army Council. The production of machines for both the naval and military services was handed over to the Ministry of Munitions. The change was an improvement, but few people believed that it was a final solution of the problem. The administration of a new and swiftly developing service is more intricate at home than in the field. The demands of two separate organizations had to be faced, the Navy and the Army, organizations that differed largely in their requirements. The private makers had to be kept in touch with the needs of the fighting services. They had to be controlled and advised, and at the same time their initiative in research and experiment must not be crippled. Finally, the executive command of the service must not be confused with the duty of supplying material, for the two tasks were poles apart. The air service had, from small beginnings, grown rapidly to great dimensions, and the need for differentiation of functions had risen. That is never an easy matter to settle, and it was not made easier by the pressure of instant war needs. Beginning in August 1915, the British people saw a series of Zeppelin visitations, which grew bolder as the winter advanced. On the last day of March 1916, for the first time, a Zeppelin came down within sight of eyes watching from British soil. Our descendants will look back on the era of those raids as one of the most curious in the history of the country. The face of the land was changed. Lighting restrictions plunged great cities into gloom, and London became as dim as in the days of Queen Anne, and vastly more dangerous for the pedestrian, owing to a speed of traffic undreamed of in the 18th century. Never had the metropolis looked more beautiful than on moonless nights, when small sparks of orange light gave mystery to the great thoroughfares, and the white fingers of searchlights groped in the heavens. But never had it been a more uncomfortable habitation. The busy life of the capital had to adapt itself to the conditions of a remote and backward country town. It cannot be said that the raids had any real effect upon the good spirits and confidence of our people. Indeed, at first they were taken too lightly and regarded by the ordinary citizen rather as curious variety shows than as incidents of ruthless war. The first Zeppelin visits found us unprepared and our only security lay in the unhandiness of the weapon employed. As the months passed, we perfected our scheme of defense and realized more clearly the limitations of the menace. Zeppelin attacks were largely blind. The great airships rarely knew where they were and were compelled to drop their bombs on speculation, and the German reports of damage done had seldom much relation to the facts. Our anti-aircraft defenses were largely increased, but we realized from the start that the true anti-Zeppelin weapon was the airplane, as Mr. Churchill had long before prophesied. To use it, our pilots must practice the difficult task of making ascents and descents in the darkness. Once they had attained proficiency in night work, there was every reason to hope that the Zeppelins would no longer reach our shores unscathed. The early autumn of 1916 made these hopes a certainty. Early in May, in a spell of bad weather, five German airships visited the northeast coast of England and the east coast of Scotland. Little damage was done, and one of them, L-20, was wrecked on its return voyage. At the end of July, the weather grew warm and still, and the raids became frequent. On the night of 28th July, three airships visited the Yorkshire and Lincolnshire coast, but they lost their way in the summer fog and dropped their bombs in the sea and on empty fields. On the night of the 31st, they came back again, this time seven in number, and their area of attack stretched from the Thames estuary to the Humber. Their aim seemed to be to drop incendiary bombs along the growing crops, but little damage was done and no lives were lost. On 3rd August, eight appeared on the East Coast after attacking British trawlers out at sea. Again, they lost their way, and after killing some livestock, were driven home by our guns. A week later, a bolder attack was made. A flotilla, 
variously estimated at from seven to ten in number, appeared on the east coast of England and Scotland. A number of towns were attacked, half a dozen people were killed and some fifty injured, but no material damage was done. Then came a lull during the August moonlight, and it was not till the night of 24th August that the raiders came again. There were six of them, and five were driven away by our gunfire from the seacoast town which they attacked. One succeeded in getting as far as London and dropped bombs in a working-class suburb, killing and wounding a number of poor people, mostly women and children. It was the last raid under the old regime. Henceforth, the Zeppelin was to meet a weapon more powerful than itself. Saturday, 2nd September, was a heavy day, with an overcast sky which cleared up at twilight. The situation on the Somme was becoming desperate, and Germany resolved to send against Britain the largest airship flotilla she had yet dispatched. There were ten Zeppelins, several of the newest and largest type, and three Schutelands military airships, and their objective was London and the great manufacturing cities of the Midlands. The Zeppelins completely lost their way. They wandered over East Anglia, dropping irrelevant bombs, and received a warm reception from the British guns. The military airships made for London. Ample warning of their coming had been given, and the city was in deep darkness save for the groping searchlights. The streets were full of people whose curiosity mastered their prudence, and they were rewarded by one of the most marvelous spectacles which the war had yet provided. Two of the marauders were driven off by our gunfire, but one attempted to reach the city from the east. After midnight, the sky was clear and star-strewn. The sound of the guns was heard, and patches of bright light appeared in the heavens where our shells were bursting. Shortly after two o'clock, in the morning of the third, about 10,000 feet up in the air, an airship was seen moving southwestward. She dived and then climbed, as if to escape the shells, and for a moment seemed to be stationary. There came a burst of smoke, which formed a screen around her and hid her from view, and then far above appeared little points of light. Suddenly, the searchlights were shut off and the guns stopped. The next second, the airship was visible like a glowing cigar, burning rapidly to a red and angry flame. She began to fall in a blazing wisp, lighting up the whole sky so that country folk 50 miles off saw the portent. The spectators broke into wild cheering, for from some cause or other the raider had met his doom. The cause was soon known. Several airmen had gone up to meet the enemy, and one of them, Lieutenant William Leaf Robinson, formerly of the Worcester Regiment, a young man of 21, had come to grips with her. When he found her, he was 2,000 feet below her, but he climbed rapidly and soon won the upper position. He closed, and though the machine gun on the top of the airship opened fire on him, he got in his blow in time. No such duel had ever been fought before, 10,000 feet up in the sky, in the view of hundreds of thousands of spectators over an area of a thousand square miles. The airship fell blazing in a field at Cuffley near Enfield, a few miles north of London, and the bodies of the crew of 16 were charred beyond recognition. Lieutenant Robinson received the Victoria Cross, for he was the first man to grapple successfully with an enemy airship by night and to point the way to the true line of British defense. It was no easy victory. Such a combat against the far stronger armament of the airship and exposed to constant danger from our own bursting shells involved risks little short of a forlorn hope in the battlefield. On the night of 23rd September, the raiders came again. Twelve zeppelins crossed the eastern shoreline making for London. Almost at once they were scattered by gunfire and only two pursued their journey to the capital, where they succeeded in dropping bombs in a suburb of small houses. Of the others, one attacked a Midland town. The total British casualties were 30 killed and 110 injured, but they paid dearly for their enterprise. One, L-33, was so seriously damaged by our anti-aircraft guns that she fled out to sea and then, realizing that this meant certain death, returned to land and came down in an Essex field. Her men, 22 in number, set her on fire and then marched along the road to Colchester till they found a special constable to whom they surrendered. The destruction was imperfectly done, 
and the remains gave the British authorities the complete details of the newest type of Zeppelin. A second, L-32, was attacked by two of our airmen. The end was described by a special constable on duty. Quote, In the searchlight beams, she looked like an incandescent bar of white-hot steel. Then she staggered and swung to and fro in the air for just a perceptible moment in time. That, no doubt, was the instant when the damage was done and the huge craft became unmanageable. Then, without drifting at all from her approximate place in the sky, without any other preliminary, she fell like a stone, at first horizontally, that is, in her sailing trim, then in a position which rapidly became perpendicular, she went down a mass of flames. End quote. Germany had begun to fare badly in the air, but popular clamor and the vast sums sunk in Zeppelin manufacture prevented her from giving up the attempt. On the night of Monday, 25th September, seven Zeppelins crossed the east coast, aiming at the industrial districts of the Midlands and the north. The wide area of the attack and the thick ground mist enabled them to return without loss after bombing various working-class districts. The Germans claimed to have done damage to the great munition area and even to have, quote, bombarded the British naval port of Portsmouth. As a matter of fact, no place of any military importance and no munition factory suffered harm. The losses were among humble people living in the flimsy houses of industrial suburbs. A more formidable attempt was made on 1st October. It was a clear dark night when ten Zeppelins made landfall on their way to London. But they found that the capital was ringed by defenses in the air and on the ground, which made approach impossible. The attack became a complete fiasco. About midnight, one Zeppelin, L-31, approached the northeast environs and was engaged by a British airplane. The watching thousands saw the now familiar sight, a glow and then a falling wisp of flame. The airship crashed to earth in a field near Potter's Bar. The crew perished to a man, including the officer in charge, Lieutenant Commander Maffey, the best known of all the Zeppelin pilots. He it was who had commanded the raiding airships in September and October 1915. He had always ridiculed the value of airplanes as an anti-Zeppelin weapon, but by the irony of fate, he was to fall to a single machine guided by a young officer of 26. During the wild weather of late October and early November, there was a breathing space. The next attempt, warned by past experiences, steered clear of London and aimed at the northeast coast, which, it was assumed, would be less strongly defended. It came on the night of 27th November in cold, windless weather. One airship, after dropping a few bombs in Durham and Yorkshire, was engaged by a plane off the Durham coast. Once again came the glow and then the wisp of flame. The airship split in two before reaching the sea. The debris sank, and when day broke, only a scum on the water marked its resting place. Another wandered across the Midlands on its work of destruction, and in the morning steered for home, closely pursued by our airplanes and bombarded by our guns. It left the land going very fast, at a height of 8,000 feet, but nine miles out to sea it was attacked by four machines of the Royal Naval Air Service, as well as by the guns of an armed trawler. The issue was not long in doubt, and presently the Zeppelin fell blazing to the water. The year 1916 was disastrous to the Zeppelin legend. The loss of 12 of these great machines, each costing from a quarter to half a million pounds to build, was admitted by the enemy, and beyond doubt there were other losses unreported. The Zeppelin fleet was now sadly reduced in effectives, and it had lost still more in repute. A way had been found to meet the menace, and it was improbable that any future adaptation of the Zeppelin could break down the new defense. But the peril from the air was not over, as some too rashly concluded. Throughout the year, there had been a number of attacks by German airplanes, which rarely extended beyond the towns in the southeastern corner of England. Such attacks were not formidable, the raiders being, as a rule, in a desperate hurry to be gone. But it occurred to many, 
watching the advent of the new SPAD and Halberstadt machines on the Western Front, that in that quarter lay a threat to England more formidable than the airship. An airplane with a 240 HP engine, which could fly at a great speed at a height of close on 20,000 feet, could travel in broad daylight and passed unchallenged to its goal. If we had not the type of machine to climb fast and operate at the same altitude, such a raider would be safe from attack alike by plane and gunfire. On the 28th of November, a German machine, flying very high, dropped nine bombs on London. The raider was brought down in France on its way home, and among its furniture was a large-scale map of London. The incident was trifling in itself, but in many minds it raised unpleasing reflections. Our planes had beaten the invading Zeppelin. We might still have to face the invading airplane. End of chapter 68, part 2, read by Jenny, 2023. Section 34 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress, Continued, and the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 69 political transformations october 13th through december 7th 1916 part one the closing months of 1916 were remarkable for a series of political upheavals and transformations among all the belligerents such as attend inevitably the advanced stages of a great struggle the first optimism is succeeded by discouragement which is followed in turn by a fatalistic resolution but the stauncher this resolution grows, and the more certain the assurance of ultimate victory, the less tolerant will a nation be of supineness and blundering in its governors. If a man is called upon to make extreme sacrifices, he will not readily permit any class of his fellows to escape more easily, and if his doings are tried by a hard test, he will apply a rigorous touchstone to the performance of his betters. Again, if a ministry at such a stage is apt to be sternly judged, its task has also very special intrinsic difficulties. The nearer the decisive moment approaches, the more urgent becomes the duty of provision, and the more difficult its fulfillment. All the ancient landmarks and guideposts have gone. The old world which endured into the first year of war has now vanished. And if the statesmen are still the same, as those who administered that lost world, they are handicapped by irrelevant memories. Lastly, war weariness will have overtaken many who started on the road with a brisk step and a purposeful eye, and a nation rising slowly towards a supreme effort will be impatient of leaders who seem to falter and fumble. In Germany, the ferment stopped short of its natural effect. No minister fell from power but the government was driven into strange courses. Happily for itself, it had to deal with a docile people, a credulous people who accepted incredible things, an obedient people who swallowed with scarcely a grimace unpalatable medicines. Yet even in Germany, public opinion could not be wholly neglected, and the policy of the German government was directed not less to explaining away the crisis which faced them than to taking steps to meet it. The Battle of the Somme, as we have seen, had profoundly affected German popular opinion. No official obscuritism could conceal its ravages. Indeed, the very silence of the newspapers and the minimizing tone which they adopted in their infrequent comments increased the mystery and awe which cloaked that front. The plain man knew only that the place was thick with his kinsfolk's graves and all who possessed any influence struggled to have their friends sent eastward rather than to that ill-omened angle of France. Instructed military opinion was aware that for the first time the German machine had been utterly outmatched, and that France and Britain had prepared their own weapon, growing daily in strength, which, unless a miracle happened, 
must sooner or later break down the German defense. In Ludendorff's ominous words, if the war lasted, our defeat seemed inevitable. The storms of the autumn had given a brief respite, but the blow had not been parried, but only deferred. A horror of the place fell on the German people, from the simplest peasant to the most exalted commanders. More and more they saw advancing from Picardy the shadows of catastrophe. The darkness of that battle in the west, where all of high and holy dies away. In such a time of depression, Falkenhayn's Rumanian success came as a blessed stimulant to the national spirit. A hungry people was promised a bounty of Romanian corn and oil. The swift campaign seemed to show German arms as resistless as ever. The fate of Romania was a warning to any neutral that might dare to draw the sword against the Teutonic League. But on this matter the high command could have no delusions. They had driven back the armies of a little nation, which was desperately short of munitions, and had made a serious strategical blunder but the success had small bearing on the real problem. The extension of their lines to the Sereth shortened their eastern front as compared with its position in September, but it did no more. It still gave them some extra hundreds of miles of line to hold as compared with August. The promise of Romanian supplies had been falsified. The oil fields were in ruins and most of the grain had been destroyed or removed. The balance was a mere drop in the bucket of Teutonic needs, and would only lead to bitter quarrels as to its allocation. Moreover, the Romanian retreat had not perplexed or divided the Allies' plans. Russia had made scarcely a change in her main dispositions, and not a man or a gun had been moved from the West. Germany, in the eyes of those best fitted to judge, had only added to her barren occupations of territory and increase the commitments of her waning strength. Hence, while the joy bells rang in Berlin and the emperor repeated his familiar speech about his irresistible sword, the true rulers of Germany were busy with devices which proved that, in their opinion, the outlook was growing desperate. The peace proposals and their sequel, unrestricted submarine warfare, must be left to later chapters. Here we are concerned with the two burning problems which demanded an immediate answer, the shortage of men and the shortage of supplies. With regard to the first, during the early autumn, German policy seems to have wavered. At one time, men were combed out from industries for the field. At another, they were sent back to industrial life from the fighting line. But with November, a great step was decided upon. A war bureau was established to which were handed over eight separate branches the Works Department, the Field Ordnance Department, the Munitions Department, the War Raw Materials Department, the Factory Department, the Substitution Service Office, the Food Supply Department, and the Export and Import Department. At its head was placed one of the ablest of Germany's organizing brains, the Württemberg soldier, General von Groner, who had previously been at the head of the Military Railway Service. This step was taken largely at the instigation of Hindenburg, who, in two letters to the Imperial Chancellor, reviewed candidly the economic situation and demanded the organized exploitation of every class of industrial and rural labor, of the former that the Allied efforts might be met and surpassed, of the latter that the former might have sufficient supplies to make their work effective. Accordingly, the Auxiliary Service Bill was passed by the Reichstag on 2nd December, legalizing the levée en masse. Contrary to expectation, women were not included. Every male German between the ages of 17 and 61 who had not been summoned to the armed forces was liable for auxiliary service, which was defined as consisting, apart from service in government offices or official institutions, in service in war industry, in agriculture, in the nursing of the sick, and in every kind of organization of an economic character connected with the war, as well as in undertakings which are directly or indirectly of importance for the purpose of the conduct of the war or the provision of the requirements of the people. 
the recruitment was to be locally managed and compulsion was not to be applied until the call for volunteers had failed the purpose was twofold to substitute as far as possible in the non-combatant branches men liable to auxiliary service for men liable to military service and to make certain that the work of the civilian manhood of germany was used in the spheres most vital for the conduct of the war in her quest of manpower germany cast her net beyond her native territories from the beginning of october onward the inhabitants of the occupied belgian provinces were rigorously conscripted for war work on her behalf partly these were workmen already thrown out of employment by the closing down of belgian factories but largely they were men engaged in private undertakings who were peremptorily ordered to labor for their new masters slave raids for they were nothing better were conducted on a gigantic scale and some hundreds of thousands of belgians were carried over the german frontiers when the laborers learned on what tasks they were to be employed there was frequent resistance and this was crushed with consistent brutality Belgium had already been stripped of her industrial plant, her foodstuffs, and her rolling stock for Germany's benefit, and she had now to surrender the poor remnant of her manpower. Her foreign minister appealed to neutral countries and to the Vatican, and the scandal was so great that President Wilson was moved to protest. But for the moment, the Allies were helpless. They were obliged by considerations of common humanity to continue their work of feeding the Belgian people by means of a neutral commission, even though Germany was using it to her own advantage by exporting foodstuffs from Belgium and suspending public relief works that she might have an excuse for her deportations. The reckoning must wait yet a while, but the man-hunting of the autumn added to it another heavy item. The British government, in the words of its foreign secretary, could give Belgium only one answer that they will use their utmost power to bring the war to a speedy and successful conclusion and thus to liberate belgium once and for all from the dangers which continually menace her so long as the enemy remains in occupation of her territory this is a cardinal aim and object of all the allies and the people of the british empire have already been inspired by this latest proof of german brutality with renewed determination to make every sacrifice for the attainment of that end germany looked also to the occupied territories in the east for a new recruitment she had already made use of starvation to try and attract workmen from russian poland westward to her own factories now she took a bold step for with the object of enlisting polish regiments for her army she announced on fifth november that in conjunction with austria she proposed to establish an independent Poland with an hereditary monarchy and a constitution. The thing had been long in the air, and the establishment of a Polish university at Warsaw had been one of the steps to it. But the official announcement had been delayed so long as Berlin believed there was hope of making a separate peace with Russia. Now that hope had gone, and Germany burned the boats that might have made a passage to Petrograd. The new Polish kingdom was to be but a small affair, for Posen and Galicia, which contained half the Polish race, were not included. It was to be a satellite of the central powers, and some one of their numerous princelings would be set on this caricature of a throne of John Sobieski. The very wording of the proclamation betrayed its purpose. There was to be a Polish army with an organization, training, and command to be regulated by mutual agreement and the german press commenting on the point made it clear that such an army was to be a mere reserve for germany to draw upon germany's security wrote the semi-official north german gazette demands that for all future times the russian army shall not be able to use a militarily consolidated poland as an invasion gate of silesia and west prussia with this motive so brazenly conspicuous it required some audacity to claim that germany and austria now stood out nobly before the world as the true protectors of small nations hindenburg wanted recruits and had demanded seven hundred thousand by hook or by crook from russian poland the new poland was to be like napoleon's grand duchy of warsaw 
established with the same purpose and at the same price the move incensed russia even those elements in her government which were prepared to look favorably on a separate peace a proud nation will scarcely submit with equanimity to the spectacle of another power giving away its territory and conscripting its own subjects for a war against it nor could the long-felt and passionate desire of the poles for national unity be satisfied by such meager territorial limits or such an ignoble vassaldom non tali auxilio nec defensoribus istis unhappily the polish people were split into a hundred groups and rivalries and there were many elements which were won over to the german policy but the better elements in the race and its ablest leaders stood scornfully aloof germany gained nothing of practical value by her proclamation the manhood of russian poland had already been recruited for the russian ranks in the great retreat of the summer of nineteen fifteen the vast proportion of the remaining able-bodied men had been swept eastward into russian areas so far as she could by vigorous enlistment for the polish legion and by conscription for industrial work germany had already sucked the occupied territories dry in the approbation of her own press and the encomiums of her tame warsaw professors she had to look for her reward to meet the second of her problems the shortage of supplies she had no very clear resource the ingenious food controller herr bataki had done his best to compel two and two to make five but he had not succeeded and beyond doubt especially in the handling of the potato crop grave errors had been committed and certain areas and classes suffered not only from scanty rations but from a burning sense of unfair treatment as the expected gains from the roumanian campaign shrank into a very modest bounty the problem of the food controller became insoluble only one course remained to satisfy popular feeling by a ruthless submarine campaign if britain blockaded germany then germany in turn would blockade britain and through the early winter the temper of all classes of the nation was moving towards a great act of revenge and defense in the spring but no dreams of the future could obliterate the extreme awkwardness of the present germany had before her nine months of short commons before she could look for any relief though the rations of her troops were not cut down below the standard necessary to ensure health and vigor their monotony was a subject of universal complaint in many interior districts the shortage was not far removed from want and there was a general undernourishment of the whole people the suffering was embittered by the suspicion only too well founded that certain classes were exempt from it and were even waxing fat on the leanness of others at no time in modern german history were the agrarian magnates of prussia the objects of such violent criticism moreover there was bad feeling between the constituent states bavaria and south germany in general complained that they were being sacrificed to satisfy prussia's need in many a prisoner's camp on the western front bavarian and brandenburger came to blows and the subject of controversy as often as not was the greed of the northerners the utterances of official germany during the autumn and early winter provided an interesting reflex of the hopes and depressions which beset the german mind in october the imperial crown prince who had of late fallen sadly out of the picture sought rehabilitation by a discourse on the beauties of peace his lyrical cry was confided to an american journalist and formed one of the interludes of comedy in the grim business of war he sighed over the commercial depravity of america which had led her financiers to invest in the allied chances of success and quoted the bible as a warning against the lust of gain he deplored the expenditure of human talent on the work of destruction and assured his interviewer that every man in the german ranks would far rather see all this labor skill education intellectual resource and physical power devoted to the task of upholding and lengthening life such as the conquest of disease he proclaimed his passion for domesticity 
and his grief at being separated from his household he paid modest tributes to the quality of the enemy it is a pity he said that all cannot be gentlemen and sportsmen even if we are enemies and lastly he spoke of flowers and music that he might complete the part of the happy warrior in the same month a different type of man took up a different parable hindenburg informed a viennese journalist that the situation on every front was secure and hopeful he announced that he was ready if necessary for a thirty years war france was even now exhausted she had called britain to her assistance and the help which her ally gives is that she is forcing the french to destroy themselves britain had no military genius and russia's numbers could never learn true battle discipline how long will the war last that depends upon our opponents prophecy is thankless and it is better to abandon it in wartime it is possible that nineteen seventeen will bring battles that will decide the war but i do not know and nobody knows i only know that we will fight to a decision these were brave words they were spoken to raise the drooping spirits of austria and they had their effect so long as daily advances east of the carpathians could be reported but the governors of germany were not contemplating a thirty years war they were cudgelling their brains to think how their roumanian success could be turned to profit for well they knew that it was of use only as an advertisement and that the true situation was very desperate bethmann halvig on ninth november made a speech in the reichstag which showed the inmost cogitations of berlin the orations of the imperial chancellor were at all times a good barometer of german opinion for their mechanical adroitness revealed more than it concealed during nineteen fifteen he had explicitly stated his aim as such an increase of strength as would enable germany to defy a united europe if europe is to arrive at peace it can only be through the strong and inviolable position of germany a revival of the policy of charles v and louis the fourteenth in the first half of nineteen sixteen his tone was the same belgium and poland must be brought under the control of germany and peace could only be considered on the basis of the war map but after the misfortunes of the summer he changed his phrasing on twenty ninth september he announced from the first day the war meant for us nothing but the defense of our right to life freedom and development but he left the last word the crux of the whole matter undefined the speech of ninth november was skillfully advertised beforehand and had obviously been prepared with great care as the starting point of a new diplomatic phase it contained the usual roseate summary of the situation upon all the fronts but its importance lay in the fact that for the first time the imperial chancellor talked at large about peace he labored to prepare the right atmosphere by showing that germany's hands were clean that she had had no intention of conquest when she drew the sword and that from first to last she had waged a defensive war he attempted to cast upon russia the whole responsibility for the immediate outbreak since the act which made war inevitable was the russian general mobilization ordered on the night of july thirtieth to thirty first nineteen fourteen this dubious historical retrospect was the basis for a declaration on the subject of the future after the war sir edward gray now lord gray of Faladen, in an earlier speech had spoken of an international league to preserve peace the german chancellor professed himself in agreement but peace could only be ensured if the principle of free development was made to prevail not only on the land but on the sea and it must involve the dissolution of all aggressive coalitions the triple entente had been based solely on jealousy of and hostility towards germany while the central powers had never had any thought but of an honorable defense let peace come said the chancellor and let it be guaranteed by the strongest sanctions that the wit of man can devise and germany will gladly cooperate provided it allows for her free and just development on the word development hung all the law and the prophets the speech it is clear was addressed to neutral opinion rather than to the speaker's countrymen 
it aimed at creating an atmosphere of reasonableness victorious germany fresh from her brilliant roumanian conquests and unbeaten on every front was prepared to appeal to the sense of decency of the neutral world she the victor alone could speak with dignity of peace it needed little acumen to see that the imperial chancellor's utterance was the first move in a new game the political situation in russia during the autumn was as we have seen in the highest degree confused and perplexing on one point indeed the issue was clear the german challenge in poland received prompt answer russia restated the views which she had already publicly expressed and announced that nothing would drive her from her purpose of creating a free and united poland under her protection from all three of her now incomplete tribal districts but in domestic politics there was no such unity of purpose and already the frail dikes were cracking under the rising floods in italy the baselli government had no crisis to face such as threatened others of the allies the chief event of the autumn and early winter was a futile attempt on the part of the extreme socialists to commit the chamber to peace negotiations for which german agents were striving throughout the world to create an atmosphere on thirteenth october signor bisolati the civil commissioner of war in the cabinet had spoken strongly on the matter i think that any state or states of the alliance which today harbored thoughts of peace would be guilty of an act of treason rather than accept peace contaminated with the germs of future wars it would have been better not to have embarked on the present struggle at all the germ of war can only be killed by destroying austria as a state and by depriving germany of every illusion of predominance italy as we know had difficulties peculiar to herself her popular feeling was mobilized rather against austria than germany and the ancient ramifications of german intrigue and german finance in her midst combined with the very real economic suffering which the war now entailed made her liable to sudden spasms of popular discontent and suspicion almost alone among the allies she had an avowed anti-war and germanophile party to reckon with at the end of november the pro-german socialists in the chamber led by a jew of german extraction brought forward a motion in favor of immediate peace to be secured by the mediation of the united states of america the chamber dealt drastically with the motion rejecting it by two hundred ninety three votes to forty seven and senior baselli the premier restated in eloquent words the central principle of the allies peace must be a pact born of armed victory a peace for which italy has drawn the sword in the name of maritime and territorial claims that are not mere poetry but a reality of her history and of her existence a peace which in order to be lasting must replace the equilibrium of the old treaties by an equilibrium built up upon the rights of nationalism we seek not the peace of a day but the peace of new centuries the government of monsieur briand had not at any time an easy seat and during the early winter it had to face a series of petty crises in france there was no ebullition of pacifism worth the name the feudal demonstration of the socialist monsieur brison in september was overwhelmed by the premier's torrential eloquence and its author exposed to general ridicule but monsieur briand held office rather because no alternative was very obvious than because he had the assent of all parties he was somewhat autocratic in his methods and preferred to govern with the minimum of parliamentary assistance the difficulties in the near east in which france had a peculiar interest and the apparent futility of the allied policy in greece did not make his task simpler the discontent of the opposition came to a head in the close of november and beginning of december the scarcity of coal the high price of food the losses of the somme campaign certain failures in transport and doubts as to the capacity of various elements in the high command made a basis for criticism of the government 
in a series of stormy secret sessions which revealed a curious regrouping of parties monsieur beyond was called upon to defend his policy he succeeded though his majority dwindled and most of the deputies on leave from the front were found voting in the minority the result of the debates was that he was given a mandate to reconstruct his government and to reorganize the high command the first was a matter of consolidation and readjustment rather than the sweeping innovation which about the same time was taking place in britain the cabinet was made smaller three departments being grouped under one chief the prime minister still held the portfolio of foreign affairs monsieur ribot remained at the exchequer and admiral lacaze at the ministry of marine an inner executive cabinet was constructed in the shape of a war committee of five on the british model the most interesting appointment was that of general Liaute, the resident general in morocco to the ministry of war on his great ability and experience all frenchmen were agreed but there was some doubt as to how a soldier whose life had been mainly spent abroad and who had no parliamentary experience would work with the chamber it looked as if the extra parliamentary nature of the administration which had been the chief topic of monsieur briand's critics was to be accentuated by the reconstruction far more remarkable were the changes in the high command popular opinion in france was passing through a critical stage and for the first time civilian views and political personalities tended to influence directly military plans and the high command the somme had not been the decisive victory that had been looked for and france's losses there following upon those at verdun had alarmed the cabinet and much exaggerated by rumor had shocked the ordinary public foch was the first to suffer a motoring accident in november was made an excuse for removing him from his command and for several months the greatest of living soldiers was unemployed then the wave reached joffre and that robust figure was swept from his place his unrelieved optimism had become a mannerism that palled some said he was growing senile it was rumored too that he considered that france's great part in the war was over and that the main attacks must now be left to the british so he relinquished the office of generalissimo which he had held since the outbreak of war and was nominated military adviser to the new war committee being at the same time created a marshal of france the first holder of that famous title to be appointed by the third republic to the command in the west nivelle succeeded a much younger man who had won brilliant successes at verdun and had a plan for winning a speedy and final victory by methods very different from the tortoise-like progression of the somme the military significance of these changes will be discussed later here let us take leave of one of the most honorable and attractive figures that this narrative will reveal the services of joffre to his country and to the allied cause had been beyond all computation and in the history of the time his is one of the two or three names that will shine most brightly to his skill and nerve and patience was due the triumph of the marne one when the skies were darkest which destroyed for ever the german hope of victory he had been like ajax the pillar and shield of his people and his rock-like figure had held the confidence of his country since the guns first opened in alsace to him more than to any other man was due the superb military effort of france and her unyielding resolution he had brilliant lieutenants some of them his superiors in the technical accomplishments of a soldier but his was always the deciding will and the directing brain End of chapter 69, part 1section thirty five of a history of the great war volume three the beleaguered fortress continued and the great sallies this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by betty b a history of the great war volume three by john buchan 
Political Transformations, October 13th through December 7th, 1916. Part 2. During the autumn, it was becoming clear that the coalition government in Britain was rapidly sinking in public esteem. There was perhaps less captious criticism of particular ministers than there had been a year before, but there was a deep-seated dissatisfaction and an impatience, the more dangerous in that it was more rarely expressed in words. The root of the feeling was the belief that the government was too much inclined to try to cure an earthquake by small political pills. The war is a cyclone, Mr. Lloyd George had told the trade unions, which is tearing up by the roots the ornamental plants of modern society and wrecking some of the flimsy trestle bridges of modern civilization. It is an earthquake which is upheaving the very rocks of European life. It is one of those seismic disturbances in which nations leap forward or fall back generations in a single bound. The ordinary citizen believed this and looked for proofs of a like conviction in the public acts of his government. The coalition formed in May 1915 had not been a mobilization of the best talent of the nation, but a compromise between party interests. It contained most of the men who in the previous liberal government had been responsible for the mistakes and overconfidence of the first nine months of war. Its guiding principle had resembled too closely that of an ordinary British government in times of peace, to keep the ministry together at all costs by a series of I Irenica and formulas ill suited to a supreme crisis, for as has been well said, the tremulous cohesion of a vacillating ministry is not the same thing as national unity. It had seemed to many people to lack courage. All its members declared that great sacrifices were necessary for victory but when it came to the question of a particular sacrifice, they were apt to hesitate. The result of the national service controversy proved that this hesitation was needless. In this, as in other matters, the people were in advance of their governors. It would be unfair to deny that a vast deal of good work had been done between May 1915 and December 1916, but in many vital matters, efficiency was to seek, and generally speaking, there was more political than administrative talent among ministers. Further, the main machinery was not fitted for the prompt dispatch of business. A cabinet of 23 members, even with the added device of special war committees, is not an ideal body for prompt decision and quick action. To quote Mr. Lloyd George again, you cannot conduct a war with the Sanhedrin. During the autumn of 1916, men of all classes were beginning to ask themselves whether the government as then constituted was capable of bringing the war to a successful issue instances of apparent timidity and lack of forethought and imagination had so grown in number as to constitute a weighty if unformulated indictment in the popular mind many of the charges were unfair the unsatisfactory position in the near east sprang from causes most of which could not be rightly laid to the charge of the coalition. The disasters of Romania were blamed with little reason on the foreign office. The halt of the British advance on the Somme, due to bad weather, was made the occasion by certain irresponsible critics for declaring that the great battle had failed, that our Western strategy was a blunder, and that the lives of our young men had been squandered in vain. But there were other complaints which had greater substance. The whole question of pensions was unsatisfactory, and there was growing discontent among the classes concerned. The air board seemed to be without a clear policy. The revival of German long-range submarine activity, contrary to popular expectation, suggested that all was not well at the Admiralty. The military authorities had warned the nation that we should have to make large, further levies on our manpower and at the end of September 1915, a manpower distribution board was appointed to deal with the matter. The board recommended a wholesale drafting of semi-skilled and unskilled men below a certain age into the army, and the filling of their places by volunteers and women. Its report was submitted on 9th November, but it looked as if no immediate action would be taken. Finally, 
the rise of prices convinced every householder that presently unless something was done there would be a serious shortage of food and conceivably a famine in june nineteen fifteen a committee had been appointed under lord milner to consider the question of food production at home a month later it reported urging among other things that a guarantee of prices should be given for wheat grown on land broken up from grass and that the country should be organized in local units for the distribution of labor and the supply of seeds and fertilizers the report was pigeonholed the government accepting the view of the minority that the submarine menace was now well in hand that there was no fear of a short supply of wheat from abroad and that it was unnecessary to adopt any extraordinary measures to ensure a home-grown supply even if the war should extend beyond the autumn of nineteen sixteen in the said autumn this complacency had been rudely broken on november fifteenth nineteen sixteen mr runciman announced the appointment of a food controller but no food controller was forthcoming since no responsible man would undertake a post which it was proposed to make a mere impotent appendage of the board of trade even at that late date the government seemed only to toy with the idea of action it is probable that for many months the great majority of the people of britain had been convinced that a change was necessary but the government was slow to read the weather signs with the conservatism that a long term of power engenders its chief members found some difficulty in envisaging an alternative ministry they were patriotic men who earnestly desired their country's victory and they feared that cabinet changes and resignations would weaken the strength of the nation and the confidence of the allies hence when the blow came there was a tendency to attribute it solely to a malign conspiracy and a calumnious press conspiracy and press campaign there were but it is impossible to believe that in the crisis of such a war any government could have been driven from office by backstair intrigues alone or by the most skillful newspaper cabal the press which criticized owed its effect solely to the fact that it echoed what was in most men's minds mr asquith's government fell because the mass of the people had come to believe rightly or wrongly that it was not the kind of administration to beat the enemy the details of the story may be briefly summarized for though among so many great events they have little importance yet they cast an interesting light on certain protagonists of the larger drama mr lloyd george ever since in the preceding summer he had succeeded lord kitchener at the war office had been restless and uncomfortable sir william robertson when he became chief of the imperial general staff had insisted on a definition of his powers and the agreement then reached was binding upon lord kitchener's successor mr lloyd george found himself a secondary figure at the war office certain indiscretions during a visit to france that autumn had made him deeply suspect by both the british and the french generals in the cabinet too it appeared as if his influence was on the wane his prestige still high with the public at large had sunk low in official and ministerial circles apart from the personal question he was honestly convinced that the war was being ill-managed both by the generals in the field and the statesmen at home and longed to infuse into its conduct a fierier purpose at the time he had no close political ally except mr churchill who was out of office and somewhat under a cloud casting about for help he bethought himself of the unionist leader in the commons mr bonar law and of an intimate friend of that leader a young canadian member of parliament sir maxwell aiken mr bonar law was at the moment a tired and anxious man and a controversy with some of his own followers over a bill authorizing the sale of enemy property in west africa had seriously troubled him and predisposed him to think that the existing arrangement was not the best conceivable mr lloyd george's scheme was for a very small war committee of three members of which the prime minister should not be one a scheme not devised as might appear at first sight to compel mr asquith's resignation but a quite sincere attempt to get the actual direction of the war 
into more vigorous hands. Mr. Bonar Law, whose simplicity was as great as his probity and patriotism, believed that Mr. Asquith might fairly accept it, but the Prime Minister, while agreeing to the small war committee, not unnaturally refused thus to divest himself of the main duty of leadership. On Friday, 1st December, two newspapers in Mr. Lloyd George's confidence published a guarded account of the controversy, and next day the journals of Lord Northcliffe, who was now made privy to the enterprise, informed the world that Mr. Lloyd George was on the point of resignation. On Sunday, 3rd December, Mr. Bonar Law called a meeting of the Unionist leaders, and to his surprise found that they did not regard Mr. Lloyd George's departure from the government as an unmixed misfortune. They were anxious that Mr. Asquith should resign as a tactical measure, and in order that he might reconstruct with a free hand, they were prepared at the same time to tender their own resignations. But it was clear that they hoped that the new cabinet would not include Mr. Lloyd George. Mr. Bonar Law, whose motive was not to get rid of Mr. Asquith, but to retain the great talents of the Secretary for War, visited the Prime Minister that afternoon and urged a settlement. To this the latter agreed, consenting not to be a member of the War Committee, provided he had effective control over its decisions. But to Mr. Lloyd George and those in his full confidence, who at this time were only Sir Maxwell Aiken and Sir Edward Carson, such a settlement was not sufficient. They were resolved that Mr. Asquith's supremacy should be purely titular. On the morning of Monday, 4th December, the Times printed a leading article describing the arrangement and insisting that the Prime Minister had to all intents abdicated from the control of the war. This move had an instantaneous effect. The Liberal ministers rose in arms and Mr. Asquith was compelled to revise his agreement of the Sunday and insist that he must be permanent president of the war committee. Mr. Lloyd George had therefore to burn his boats and on the Tuesday announced his resignation. That same day, the prime minister was visited by various unionist colleagues who angrily disassociated themselves from any partnership in the maneuver of the secretary for war. Mr. Asquith now took a step which seemed to be amply justified, but which in truth was fatal to his fortunes. He himself tendered his resignation. Counting on the support of the bulk of the liberal and unionist parties, he argued that it would be impossible for his malcontent colleague to form a government. Fate seemed to have delivered Mr. Lloyd George into his hands. The king sent for Mr. Bonar Law, who after taking a day and a night to think over it, declared himself unable to construct an administration and advised his majesty to summon mr lloyd george mr lloyd george was accordingly sent for and on the evening of seventh december kissed hands as prime minister he had played a daring game with consummate coolness and courage and he believed that he had the people of the country behind him but for the moment his first need was the unionist party if he was to form any kind of presentable government. Mr. Balfour was ill in bed. He had consequently had no part in the hectic negotiations of the past week and was imperfectly informed about the details. When the Foreign Office was pressed upon him by Mr. Bonar Law as a patriotic duty, he consented, and his adherents brought in the rest of the Unionist statesmen. The latter insisted, however, that Mr. Churchill should not be given office, a condition at which the new prime minister did not cavil. Mr. Lloyd George's first task was to appoint a war cabinet. He called to it Lord Milner and Mr. Arthur Henderson as ministers without portfolios, Lord Curzon, the new president of the council, and Mr. Bonar Law, the new chancellor of the exchequer, while he himself acted as its chairman. This body of five was entrusted with all matters pertaining to the conduct of the war. Sir Edward Carson became First Lord of the Admiralty and Lord Derby Secretary for War. Since the ordinary political material was limited, some bold experiments were made, experts with little or no parliamentary experience being brought to special departments, Sir Albert Stanley to the Board of Trade, 
Mr. H. A. L. Fisher to the Education Office, Sir Joseph McClay to the New Shipping Department, Mr. Prothero to the Board of Agriculture, and Sir Hardman Lever to the Treasury as Financial Secretary. The posts in the new ministry were roughly divided between Liberal and Labour members and Unionists. All the Liberal cabinet ministers followed the late Prime Minister into retirement, but at a party meeting on 13th December, under the direction of Mr. Asquith, they pledged themselves to give Mr. Lloyd George's administration a fair trial. The fate of Mr. Asquith's government will, it is probable, be for future historians something of a landmark in the political history of Britain. It marked, some have argued, the end of the preeminence of a school of thought, which had flourished since the fat days of the Victorian era, a school which had done good service in its day, and which contained many elements of permanent worth, but which had been invested by its votaries with a cynetic sanction that no poor creed of mortal statecraft could long sustain. These matters lie outside the province of a historian of the war but since contemporary public opinion is within that province we may briefly inquire why a government so solidly buttressed should suffer such a sudden eclipse whatever be our view of the necessity of the change of ministers we can admit that the manner of it was ungracious the prime minister and the foreign secretary who had labored long and hard in the service of their country retired to the accompaniment of much coarse abuse from a section of the press as a race we are magnanimous and not careless of the decencies whence came this lapse from our normal practice whence sprang the nearly universal conviction that horses must be swapped however turbulent the stream it is to be observed in the first place that a change of leaders in a long struggle is the usual practice of nations in most of the great wars of history the men both soldiers and civilians who began the struggle have not been those who concluded it lincoln was the exception not the rule since august nineteen fourteen in all the belligerent states there had been much shuffling of cabinets and commands germany had seen three successive chiefs of the general staff and if the same imperial chancellor continued in office it was only because he was removed beyond the reach of the mutations of the popular will in russia the leadership of the armies had already passed from the grand duke nicholas to alexiev the premiership from gorimakin to Sturmer, and from Sturmer to trepov italy had changed her premier once france had had several cabinet reconstructions and had now a new commander-in-chief among departmental heads in every country there had been a continuous and bewildering exchange france had had three ministers of war britain two and russia three to take the office where change was prima facie least desirable the british prime minister and the british foreign secretary seemed almost the only stable things in a shifting world that new leaders should be demanded in a strife which affects national existence is as inevitable as the changes of the seasons the problems of the second and third stages of a war are not those of the first stage and the man who has borne the heat and burden of the morning will be apt to bring a stale body and a wearied brain to the tasks of the afternoon few leaders are so elastic in mind that having given all their strength to one set of problems they can turn with unabated vigor to new needs and new conditions the odds are that the man who has shown himself an adept in a patient defensive will not be the man to lead a swift advance again every war is a packet of surprises and the early stages must be strewn with failures history may rate the general who has endured and learned the lessons of failure far higher than his successor who reaps the fruit of that learning but contemporaries have not this just perspective the nature of the popular mind must be reckoned with and that mind will turn eagerly from one who is identified with dark days of stress to one who comes to his task with a more cheerful record the nation which bears the brunt of the struggle must be able to view its leaders with hopefulness and in all novelty there is hope 
the demand for change is likely to be the stronger in the case of a civilian government if its members entered upon the war already weary from long years of office and if one of their claims to fame has been skill in the common type of politics a type which has been wrecked by the new era and has left in the popular mind a strong distaste this was very notably the case with mr asquith and some of his chief supporters the liberal government had been continuously in office since the close of 1905. It had gone through three general elections, it had been engaged in many bitter disputes, and had weathered more than one serious crisis. After eight such difficult years, there must inevitably have followed some decline in the elasticity and vigor of those who were responsible in such stormy waters for the ship of state again those eight years had been years of conspicuous success in party management the art of directing the house of commons had rarely been carried higher than by mr asquith and great was the skill of those lieutenants who cultivated and manipulated the caucus but after three months of war the caucus was futile and the party catchwords meaningless more there was growing up in the popular mind a dislike of the whole business a suspicion not wholly baseless that britain owed some of her misfortunes to this particular expertise the skill so loudly acclaimed a year before both by those who benefited and by those who suffered from it seemed now not only useless but sinister the dapper political expert was as much in the shadow as the champion faro player in a western american township which has been visited by a religious revival it was no question of political creed. The same fate would have overtaken a conservative or a labor government if it had been in power before the war. It was the reaction of the plain man plunged into a desperate crisis against the sleek standards of a vanished world. Lately, there was that in the temperament and talents of the prime minister himself upon which the nation had begun to look coldly. His great ability no man could question his oratorical gifts his diplomatic skill his shrewd and closely reasoning mind not less conspicuous were his endowments of character he had admirable nerve and courage and as a consequence he was the most loyal of colleagues for he never shrank from accepting the burden of his own mistakes and those of his subordinates he was incapable of intrigue in any form he had true personal dignity caring little for either abuse or praise and shunning the arts of self-advertisement. But he left on the ordinary mind the impression that he thought more of argument than of action. To most men he was identified with a political maxim enjoining delay, and in many matters his ministry had been too late. He was a man of the old regime, devoted to traditional methods and historic watchwords. His intellect was lucid and orderly, but in no way original and the nation asked whether such a man could have that eye for the instant need of things which an unprecedented crisis demands it seemed to his critics impossible to expect the unresting activity and the bold origination which the situation required from one whose habits of thought and deed were cast in the more leisurely mould of the elder school of statesmen when a people judges there is usually reason in its verdict and it is idle to argue that Mr. Asquith was a perfect, or perhaps the best available leader in wartime. But history will not let his remarkable services go unacclaimed. In August 1914, he had led the nation in the path of honor and political wisdom. No man had stated more eloquently the essential principles for which Britain fought, or held to them more resolutely. In a tangle of conflicting policies, he had always kept in the mind of the public the vital point of the quarrel with the central powers and if his optimism had at times an unfortunate effect there can be little doubt that his steady nerve coolness and patience did much to keep an even temper in the people during days of disappointment and darkness he departed from office with the dignity that he had worn in power and he behaved throughout in all respects not as a party chief but as a patriot history will see in him a great debater a great parliamentarian a great public servant and a great gentleman
End of section 35. Section 36 of the History of the Great War, Volume 3. The Beleaguered Fortress Continued in the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3 by John Barkin. Chapter 70. The German Maneuvers for Peace. November ninth, 1916 to February 1st, 1917. Throughout the autumn of 1916, the German troops and people were encouraged with hints of peace by Christmas tide. The Imperial Chancellor, in his speech of 9th November, spoke smooth words, and the mind of the nation was prepared for his declaration of 12th December in the Reichstag and the dispatch on the same day of a summons to the enemies of Germany to enter into negotiations. Before we deal with these overtures, it is necessary to consider the state of mind which prompted them. Germany's diplomacy had never been distinguished by subtlety. He who ran might read as in large type the motives of her numerous promenciamentos, the causes which she wished the world to believe to have guided her action were always explicitly stated, but the true reasons could be observed sticking out like the stuffing from a damaged marionette. In the present case, she adopted the role of a generous conqueror. She had won in every field, but out of the fullness of her strength and the greatness of her soul, she would condescend to treat with beaten antagonists for the sake of humanity and the world's future. It is safe to say that the pose deceived no one, except the more ignorant and credulous classes of her own people. She had begun the campaign with loud talk about the rights of Germany, founded on a higher culture, and with proclamations of her will to power. When her great offensive was foiled, but not till then, she discovered that she had always been waging a defensive war, and asked with the security of her frontiers and the opportunity of peaceful development. But her own spoken and written words, and above all her deeds, remained as damning evidence against her. If she abated one jot of her earlier pretensions, it was due not to a change of heart, but to a change of circumstance. Her first motive was prudential. The tide of her success had long ago begun to turn, and she wished to arrest the ebb while yet there was time. Deeply embarrassed as she was, she still occupied much foreign territory, which might be used in bargaining. The Battle of the Somme had shown her that a military machine was being strained to breaking point. Once it broke, all would be over, and at any cost that catastrophe must be averted. She had seen the Allied strength in the field grow to a pitch which she had believed impossible. But arguing from her own case, she considered that the effort had only been made at the expense of colossal sufferings, and that behind the Allies' resolution lay a profound war weariness. An offer of negotiations might, she thought, be welcomed by the masses of the Allied nations and forced by them on their governments. Once the belligerents consented to treat, she believed that she had certain advantages in any conference. She had much to give up which she could not hold, and her renunciation might win her the things which she considered vital to her future. Moreover, if her opponents were entangled in discussions, there was a chance of breaking up their unity and shifting the argument to minor issues. Her peril lay in the silence of her enemies, so long as they maintained their deadly concurrence on the broad principle that Germany had shattered the world's peace and must be prevented from doing it again. Her protestations would not move them, and her bluster would only steal their hearts. But once let them sit down to argue on ways and means, and they would, beyond doubt, reveal divergencies of purpose. It was a matter of life and death to her that the rift should appear in the Allied loot before she had suffered a final catastrophe. Her overtures were made also with an eye to the neutral states, notably America. Their sufferings during the war had been grave and the longer it lasted, the more difficult became their position. They hungered for peace, 
and would not scrutinize Germany's motives with the acumen of her actual foes. It might be assumed that they would look at the war map, to which the imperial chancellor so often turned, with eyes more readily dazzled than those who had won during two years of conflict a truer sense of the military value of territorial conquests. They might take Germany's claims at their face value and be really impressed by her apparent magnanimity. In any case, they would not be likely to welcome a summary bolting of the door against negotiations. If the Allies declined the offer, neutral opinion might force them to reconsider their refusal, and if they persisted, be seriously alienated from them. To win the goodwill of neutrals, even if nothing more were gained, would be an immense advantage for Germany, for there lay her one hope of reconstruction. Finally, she was thinking of her own people. They had at first been buoyed up with illusory dreams of a settlement dictated to a conquered earth. Then, with accustomed docility, they had accepted the view that Germany was waging a war of self-defense and fought for virtue and peace against the mailed wickedness of the world. God had been good to her, and the malice of her enemies had been confounded. But, to show the cleanness of her soul, she was willing to forget and forgive and to forego her just revenge for the sake of a quiet life. If proof were needed that the guilt of the beginning of the war did not lie on Germany, he is surely was the last word, for, though victorious, she refused to take the responsibility of continuing it. The emperor was a prince of peace as well as a lord of battles. Action which proceeds from any mixed and conflicting motives is likely to be a blunder. The German peace offer was no exception to the rule. To impress the German people, it had to be couched in a tone of high rhetoric and conscious superiority. To win its way with neutrals, it must emphasize Germany's past triumphs and present magnanimity. But these arguments would not appeal to the Allies, who denied the assumptions, so for their benefit something was added in the nature of a threat. The mere fact that the attempt was made at all implied a confession of weakness, when Germany's previous record was remembered. The consequence was that the impression left on men's minds by the German overtures was one of maladroitness carried to the pitch of genius. Of all combinations of manner, the least likely to impress is a blend of truculence and sentimentality, of cajolery and bluster. The antecedents of the step may be briefly summarized. As early as September 1916, the Imperial Chancellor was considering how President Wilson might be induced to offer mediation, if possible, before the presidential election in the beginning of November, and the Army chiefs, somewhat skeptically, approved the notion. Count Bernstorff at Washington was encouraging. He believed that peaceful money-making is the sole life and interest of the American. In October, Baron Borian, the Austrian premier, came forward with the proposal that the Teutonic League should itself take the first action and make a direct offer to the enemy. There was some private discussion about minimum terms, from which it appeared that Austria and Germany were well agreed that the concessions must be trifling. Even Bethmann Holwig, who was the most moderate, insisted upon the annexation of Liège and the mines of Brie and the evacuation of French territory only after the payment of war indemnity. About the end of the month, the emperor indicted a letter to his chancellor. Dismayed at the obstinacy of his enemies, he declared that they were obsessed by war psychosis, from which they possessed no liberator. Making a peace proposal, he wrote, is an act necessary to deliver the world, including neutrals from obsession, for such an act, a ruler is wanted with a conscience, who feels responsible towards God, and who has a heart for his own and hostile peoples. A ruler is wanted who is inspired by a desire to deliver the world from sufferings without minding possible wrong interpretations of his act. I have the courage to do it. I will venture it, relying upon God. Hindenburg and Ludendorff concurred without much enthusiasm. Their main desire was the requisitioning of the whole of Germany's manpower 
and the auxiliary service bill, which satisfied part of their demands, became law on 2nd December. The majority socialists, who, under Scheidman, had now all but cut loose from the minority and become a government party, were sounded and promised their support. The fall of Bucharest on 6th December gave the cue for the entry of the peacemaker. It was unfortunate for his purpose that Neville chose the same time to inflict a signal defeat at Verdun on the peacemaker's all-conquering legions. On 12th December, the imperial chancellor made a speech in the Reichstag, in which he announced that, by the emperor's orders, he had that morning proposed to the hostile powers to enter into peace negotiations in an invitation submitted through the representatives of neutral states. His peroration gave the key to his motives, for it struck all the different notes. In August 1914, our enemies challenged the superiority of power in a world war. Today we raise the question of peace, which is a question of humanity. We expect that the answer of our enemies will be given with that sereneness of mind which is guaranteed to us by our external and internal strength and by our clear conscience. If our enemies decline and wish to take upon themselves the world's heavy burden of all those terrors which thereafter will follow, then, even in the least and smallest homes, every German heart will burn in sacred wrath against our enemies who are unwilling to stop human slaughter in order that their plans of conquest and annihilation may continue. In a fateful hour, we took a fateful decision. God will be judge. We can proceed upon our way without fear or resentment. We are ready for war, and we are ready for peace. The note began by emphasizing the indestructible strength of Germany and her allies. It explained that this strength was used only to defend their existence and the freedom of their natural development, and all their many victories had not changed this purpose. They asked for peace negotiations at which they would bring forward proposals which would aim at assuring the existence, honor, and free development of their peoples, and would be such as to serve as a basis for the restoration of a lasting peace. No hint was given of what such proposals would be. The document was cunningly worded as to one part of its purpose, to impress the people of the fatherland. It was less skillful in regard to its effect upon neutrals, for it emphasized as facts one baseless assumption, that Germany was already the victor, and one falsehood, that the Allies were responsible for the origin of the war. A majority in the neutral world was probably indisposed to admit the first, and was almost certainly inclined to deny the second. As for the Allies themselves, the net was spread too brazenly in their sight. An invitation to a conference based on such premises would, if accepted, put them wholly in a false position. It revealed the lines of the German argument, lines which admitted of no conceivable agreement. It was an empty offer not specifying the terms which Germany was willing to accept, but leaving them to be deduced from the arrogance of the peacemaker's language. For the Allies to consider the thing, for one moment, would have been a waste of time in the serious business of war. The design was too obvious to deceive any but the slenderest and most perverse section of Allied opinion. It was promptly exposed in France by Monsieur Briand, in Italy by Baron Sanino, in Russia by Monsieur Petrovsky, and in Japan by Viscount Otono, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. On 30th December, the French government communicated to the United States Ambassador in Paris a formal answer signed by Russia, France, Great Britain, Japan, Italy, Serbia, Belgium, Montenegro, Portugal, and Romania. The document expounded most temperately, but most clearly, the illusory nature of Germany's proposal. There could be no peace without retribution, reparation, and guarantees for the future. Of these, German note made no mention, and its truculence precluded any hope of assent to them. The overtures were merely an attempt to justify in advance in the eyes of the world some new series of crimes. 
Once again, the Allies declared that all peace is possible, so long as they have not secured reparation for violated rights and liberties, recognition of the principle of nationalities, and of the free existence of small states, so long as they have not brought about a settlement calculated to end, once and for all, causes which have constituted perpetual menace to the nations, and to afford the only effective guarantees for the future security of the world. About the same time, the German press took to publishing documents which showed that the Allies were right in their diagnosis of German tactics. One was a secret memorandum adopted six months before by the Council of the German Navy League, which, in sober, business-like language, laid down the minimum that Germany required as the result of war, a minimum which included the annexation of Belgium, more important still was the article published on New Year's Eve in the Frankfurter Zeitung by Professor Meneke of Freiburg on the development of Germany's war plans. The historian admitted what the publicist had denied. Germany had entered upon a contest which only in the political sense could be called defensive. From the military point of view, it was meant to be a knockout war. It had failed at the Marne, and the later phase, the war of attrition had failed before the song began. She had come to the conclusion that victory in the full sense was impossible. She therefore favored the idea that the sacrifices demanded by the continuation of the war can no longer bear any relation to the military results, which can still be expected, and that it is a statesmanlike, intelligent, and wise to abandon the intention of destruction which after all does not lead to destruction, and to seek a reasonable compromise. It was the truth. Having failed to destroy in the field, Germany sought to bargain, but the candor of the historian gave the lie to the rhetoric of the imperial chancellor and his master. Close on the heels of German overture came another note of a very different kind. Mr. Wilson was now in the position which has been described as the most powerful, enjoyed by any of the rulers of the world, that of an American president elected for a second term of office. The nation had affirmed by a great majority its confidence in him, and since, by the unwritten constitutional law of the United States, a third consecutive term as president is inadmissible. He was free from those considerations of tactics, which must to some extent embarrass the most independent of party leaders. He was now able, if he so willed, to reopen the question of America's neutrality, subject always to the restriction that, as a constitutional ruler, he must carry the nation along with him. The election had been fought on narrow issues. Both parties had talked assiduously of the necessity of defending American rights against violation from any quarter. But Mr. Hughes, the Republican candidate, had contented himself with the general criticism of Mr. Wilson's policy of toward Mexico and Germany, and had taken no clear line on the question of intervention. There were German sympathizers, as there were strong advocates of the Allies in the ranks of both sides. Mr. Wilson undoubtedly received the bulk of his popular support because he had kept America out of the war. Therefore, his mandate was to uphold so far as was possible the existing status of peace. But at the same time, in his election campaign, he had kept to the fore a kind of internationalism. The policy of the League to Enforce Peace had been part of his program, and this scheme for compulsory arbitration among the powers of the world, and the reestablishment of a definite code of public right and really a breach with the traditional foreign policy of America. It was clear that, in Wilson's view, no nation, however powerful, could live for itself alone. In the speech in which he accepted his renomination, he had declared, No nation can any longer remain neutral as against any woeful destruction of the peace of the world. The nations of the world must unite in joint guarantee that whatever is done to disturb the whole world's life must first be tested in the court of the whole world's opinion before it is attempted. Mr. Wilson was therefore elected not merely to keep America at peace, 
It was given a mandate for international reform, and the two missions might well prove incompatible. When, after his victory, he looked round the horizon, he saw many clouds that promised storm. The darkest was the German submarine campaign. Germany, in spite of her pledge to Washington, was busily engaged in very acts which in the preceding April he had unsparingly condemned. He saw, moreover, that the lot of neutrals was rapidly becoming unendurable, and that with Germany in her present temper, the most pacific among them might be forced into a war of self-defense. Accordingly, he felt obliged to clear up the situation by asking the belligerents to define their real aims. Such a step had in the main a tactical purpose. Elected as a peace president, he must be able to justify himself fully to his people if he were forced into a course which was not pacific. He had formulated an international policy with general assent. The war aims of the belligerents must be clearly shown to be in accord with, or antagonistic to, that policy before the United States could take sides. He felt that the compulsion of events was forcing him in the direction of war. He wished to point this out to the world, for it might have a restraining and sobering effect on the combatants. If he failed in that aim, he would at least prepare the mind of America for the inevitable. The note, which was presented on 18th December, had no relation to the German peace proposals. It was written, in part at any rate, before the Emperor's move, and, as we have seen, was a necessary consequence of Mr. Wilson's new position. Its construction and wording were devised with skill to serve the President's purpose. It stated that the published aim of both sets of belligerents appeared to be the same, and as he defined these aims in a manner consonant with America's declared views. Each side decides to make the rights and privileges of weak peoples and small states as secure against aggression and denial in the future as the rights and privileges of the great and powerful states now at war. Each wishes itself to be made secure in the future, along with all other nations and peoples, against the recurrence of wars like this, and against oppression and selfish interference of any kind. Each would be jealous of the formation of any more rival leagues to preserve an uncertain balance of power against multiplying suspicions, but each is ready to consider the formation of the League of Nations to ensure peace and justice throughout the world. It was an adroit move, for by defining the aims of the Allies and crediting these aims also to the Central Powers, it brought the conduct of the latter, which from the first day of the war had been a flagrant denial of these aims, into bold relief. The note went on to invite a comparison of views in detail, since on generalities all seemed to be in agreement. It pointed out that the prolongation of the war to an aimless exhaustion would endanger the whole future of civilization. The president is not proposing peace, so ran the conclusion. He is not even offering mediation. He is merely proposing that soundings be taken in order that we may learn the neutral nations with the belligerents, how near the haven of peace may be, for which all mankind longs with an intense and increasing longing. The purpose of the note was not at first detected among the Allied peoples. Small blame to them for their misapprehension. Combatants engaged in a struggle of life and death have no time to appreciate the finesse of a third party who stands outside the fray. Mr. Wilson's definition of Germany's war aims seemed to most people a misreading of the plain facts of the war and of a thousand printed and spoken German declarations. His request to the Allies to formulate in detail their proposals seemed to be open to the same objection which Lincoln urged against those who clamored for his plan of reconstruction before the North had won in the field. I have laboriously endeavored, Lincoln said in 1863, to avoid that question ever since it first began to be molded and thus to avoid confusion and disturbance in our own councils. The Allied governments judged more wisely. They saw Mr. Wilson's purpose. They realized that he was being forced towards a breach with Germany, and that he must make certain in his own mind and the mind of his people 
that the cost for which the Allies fought was consistent with American ideals. Accordingly, they received his note with a true appreciation of its meaning, and patiently and temperately set forth their answer. That answer was one of the most notable documents that ever emanated from European chanceries. In the friendliest spirit, it declined to set out the Allied war aims in detail, since these could not be formulated till the hour for negotiations arrived. But the civilized world knows that they imply, necessarily and first of all, the restoration of Belgium, Serbia, and Montenegro, with the compensation due to them, the evacuation of the invaded territories in France, in Russia, in Romania, with just reparation, the reorganization of Europe, guaranteed by a stable regime and based at once on respect for nationalities and on the right to full security and liberty of economic development, possessed by all peoples, small and great, and at the same time upon territorial conventions and international settlements, such as to guarantee land and sea frontiers against unjustified attack. The restoration of provinces, formerly torn from the Allies by force or against the wish of their inhabitants, the liberation of the Italians, and also of the Slavs, Romanians, and Czechoslovaks from foreign domination, the setting free of the population subject to the bloody tyranny of the Turks, and the turning out of Europe of the Ottoman Empire as decidedly foreign to Western civilization. The Allies associated themselves heartedly with the projects of a League of the Nations, but pointed out that before such a League could come into being, the present dispute must be settled. The malignant ill in the body politic must be cured before a regiment could be adopted to ensure its future health. At the same time, the Belgian government submitted an answer to the American president, pointing the moral from the case of their own country. The barbarous manner which the German government has treated and still treats the Belgian nation does not allow us to presume that Germany will trouble in the future about guaranteeing the rights of weak nations, which he has never ceased to trample underfoot since the moment when the war, let loose by her, began to decimate Europe. The American note met with no response from Germany, chagrined by her failure to produce dissension among the Allies, and profoundly embarrassed by President Wilson's overtures, she contented herself with an angry declaration to neutrals, a mixture of bad logic and bad history, and a string of denials of what she had in her palmier days admitted and gloried in. This came on January 11, 1917, and the next day the Emperor issued a proclamation to make certain that his tactics, if they had failed with the enemy, should at least have some success with the German people. Our enemies had dropped the mask. After refusing the scorn and hypocritical words of love for peace and humanity, our honest peace offer, they now, in their reply to the United States, have gone beyond that and admitted their lust for conquest, the baseness of which is further enhanced by their calumnious assertions. Their aim is the crushing of Germany, the dismemberment of the powers allied to us, and the enslavement of the freedom of Europe and the seas under the same yoke that Greece, with gnashing teeth, is now enduring. Burning indignation and holy wrath will redouble the strength of every German man and woman, whether it is devoted to fighting, work, or suffering. The sympathetic reception of the Allied reply in America proved that the President had read a right the temper of his people, and that the Allied governments had been correct in their interpretation of the meaning of his message. Britain and the United States were alike in one thing. Both had regarded themselves in old days as extra-European powers. But the logic of circumstances had brought one into the family of Europe, and the same force seemed about to bring the other into a fellowship which was not of Europe alone, but of the civilized world. On January 22, 1917, the President, deeming that the words of his note needed amplification, delivered a remarkable address to the Senate, in which he unfolded his program for a League of Peace. Such a League could only come into being after the present war was over, 
and on the nature of the settlement depended America's support to guarantee the future. He outlined the terms which he would consider a satisfactory foundation for the new world. It must be a peace without victory, that is, a peace not dictated by a victor to a loser, leaving a heritage of resentment. It must be founded on the recognition of the equal rights of all states, great and small. It must be based on the principle that a people is not a chattel to hand from one sovereignty to another, but that governments only derive their power from the consent of the governed. It must assure, as far as possible, a direct outlet for every great people to the highways of the sea. The ocean must be free in practically all circumstances for the use of mankind, and armaments, both military and naval, must be limited. From no one of these conditions were the Allies disposed to dissent. By peace without victory, it was clear from the context that Mr. Wilson meant peace without that destruction and dismemberment of Germany which the Allies had expressly repudiated. In another sense, there could be no peace without victory, victory over the mad absolutism and military pride of the central powers. Unless they were crushed to the earth, no sections, no guarantees, no system of treaties, no rectification of frontiers, no league of peace, would endure for a decade, for it had long ago proclaimed itself against international law, and a flouter of all rights, however sacred. If it were decisively beaten, the terms of peace mattered less, for the secular enemy of all peace would have disappeared. Victory, the right kind of victory, was, on Mr. Wilson's own argument, the essential preliminary of any lasting settlement. There comes moments in the middle of any great toil when it is desirable, for the good of the toiler's soul, that he straighten his back and look round. Respici venum is the best traveler's maxim. Without a constant remembrance of the goal, the pilgrim may find the rough places impassable, and will be prone to stray from the road. The value of Mr. Wilson's intervention was that it caused the Allies to reflect upon the deeper purpose of the war. It emphasized the essential idealism of their cause, which become dim in many minds, from that preoccupation with detail, which a desperate contest induces. It was well that it should be so, for events were in train in Russia and in America itself, which were to change the whole complexion of the struggle and set the ideal aspect foremost in the eye of the world. For the remainder of the war, the question of ultimate aims was to be canvassed unceasingly, and every ally had to examine herself and discover her soul in the quest for a common denominator of purpose. Germany, too, discovered herself at that speedily. The terrors which the imperial chancellor had proclaimed in his speech of 12 December, were at once put into motion. In the previous August, Hindenburg and Ludendorff had opposed unrestricted submarine warfare on the ground that the time was not ripe for it. They changed their views after the Romanian victory, when it became certain that no European neutral was likely to enter the lists against them. The price, as they frankly recognized, was war with the United States, but they calculated that America could not put in the field more than five or six divisions during the first year, and they were clear that the campaign would have a decisive effect long before America could send armies on the grand scale. They had small hope of results from the peace offer, but they consented to postpone a decision until it had been given a fair trial. On 23rd December, Hindenburg told the Chancellor and in his view, unrestricted submarine warfare was not essential in view of Germany's dangerous economic and military position, and at the conference on January 9, 1917, the Emperor and the Chancellor accepted the view. The decision was, strangely enough, combined with the drafting on 29th January, of Germany's peace terms were dispatched to Mr. Wilson. These included the renunciation of the part of Upper Alsace, then occupied by France, the return of the German colonies, a strategic rectification of the French and Russian frontiers, and the restoration of Belgium subject to guarantees. 
but this peace arbiter was obscured by the momentous declaration of the new submarine policy. For, on 31st January, the German government announced that from 1st February, all sea traffic within certain zones adjoining Britain, France, and Italy, and in the eastern Mediterranean would, without further notice, be prevented by all weapons. This meant the German submarines would sink at sight within these areas, all vessels, whether neutral or belligerent. The causes alleged were the illegality of the Allied blockade and the Allied rejection of Germany's peace offer. But Bethlehem Holweg, in the Reichstag, set forth another reason. He had always been in favor, he said, of ruthless methods of submarine warfare, if they were best calculated to lead to a swift victory. Last autumn, the time was not yet ripe, but today the moment has come when, with the greatest prospect of success, we can undertake this enterprise. We must, therefore, delay no longer. The imperial chancellor was a maladroit diplomat who occasionally blundered into speaking the truth. End of chapter 70「Section 37 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3. The Beleaguered Fortress Continued and the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 71. The Clearing of Sinai and the Fall of Baghdad. August 9th, 1916 to March 11th, 1917. We left the story of the war against Turkey at the point when in August 1916, Sir Archibald Murray's forces in Egypt had successfully repelled the Turkish offensive at Romani, while Sir Stanley Maud's army of Mesopotamia was slowly perfecting its preparations for the recovery of Kut. Udenich in the Caucasus, with Erzurum, Trebizond, and Erzinian in his possession, was detaining at least half of Turkey's total fighting strength, and Baratov with his small column was hanging somewhat precariously on the western borders of Persia. For the moment Turkey was safe, but her security was not solidly founded. She owed it rather to her opponent's mistakes than to her own inherent strength. Her fifty-odd divisions were widely scattered, half against Udenich, five or six in Galicia, and the Dobruja, three on the Tigris, five in Syria, and detachments on the Persian frontier, at Gallipoli and on the Struma. If her enemies could combine, if Maud and Udenich could join hands and Murray press northward through Syria, there was a chance of that decisive defeat in the field which would put her out of action. The Allies had blundered grievously, but they had learned much and they had great assets. They had in Egypt an ideal offensive base, the advantages of which were only now being realized, and they had against them an enemy whose military strength had been heavily depleted by costly actions and weakened by every kind of internal distraction and misgovernment. The distinction between the Western and Eastern school of strategy among the Allies was largely fictitious. No sane man denied the necessity of making the chief effort on the Western Front, and few but admitted that victory was no less necessary in the East. Germany must be beaten in the theater where her main forces were engaged, but it was not less important to cut her off from the eastern extension on which for a generation she had set her heart. Turkey, it was clear, must be brought to such a pass in the field that she would have to submit to the drastic terms of the Allies. Her policy had been thoroughly Germanized. She had flung off all her old treaty obligations and claimed the status of one of the great powers of Europe. Footnote. On January 1st, 1917, she finally denounced the Treaty of Paris of 1856 and the Treaty of Berlin of 1878, and at the same time abolished the autonomous organization of the Lebanon province. She had lost most of her shadowy hegemony over Islam, for the Grand Sharif of Mecca, who at the close of 1916 assumed the title of King of the Hejaz, had called the faithful to witness that the so-called Caliphs of Constantinople had at all times been puppets in the hands of some kind of janissary, 
and that the new Janissaries from Prussia were conspicuously unsuited to be the guardians of the mysteries of the faith. Turkey had thrown down a challenge which could only be answered by her destruction as an empire and as a Caesarian power. There was every military reason for an energetic campaign against her, for her immobilization would have immediate effects upon the Achilles heel of Prussianism, its Austrian and Bulgarian allies. The political reasons were even stronger, for no war of liberation could suffer the anomaly of the Near East to go unreformed. The Turk had been so long the nominal ally of Britain that many had come to regard him with an affectionate toleration, as a man regards the occasional misdeeds of a faithful and spirited dog. That the Turkish peasant was brave, hardy, and uncomplaining was beyond doubt. That a considerable section of the old Turkish gentry had good manners, a picturesque air, and certain virtues not too common in the modern world might be maintained with reason. But no sentimentalism could change the fact that the Turk and his kind had nowhere shown a trace of administrative genius or civic spirit, and that wherever he had set his foot, he had blasted the land. His race was like the wind from the desert, which scorches and never fructifies or blesses. Turkey was a military power, competent only when in the saddle, with the sword drawn. She had no gifts for the arts of peace, and no power to rebuild when she had broken down. Her history was, in the words of the Allied Statement of War Aims to President Wilson, a bloody tyranny. The old Turk was a blunderer with a certain redeeming qualities. The new Turk was no less a blunderer, but he had lost the qualities and adopted with easy grace the worst vices of his Prussian masters whose creed was terribly akin to the root characteristics of his tribe. Turkey's dominion embraced the ruins of the richest and most enlightened lands of the ancient world, the cradle of civilization of the Christian faith. The old proud empires from New Rome to Baghdad were not destroyed by Islam. The rich Omayyad culture and Baghdad under the caliphs were the achievement of the eldest sons of Islam, the Arabs, who gave light and leading to all North Africa and one-third of Asia. They were destroyed by the Turk. Under his kindly rule, Baghdad became a city of hovels, and Mesopotamia a swamp and a sand dune. Persecutions, overtaxation, corruption, and incompetence characterized all the centuries of his regime. Since the war began, he had shown his natural instincts by causing the death of the better part of a million Armenians, and partly from fecklessness and partly from malice, letting half the population of the Lebanon die of famine. The world had been very patient with him, but the coop of his offenses now overflowed. So monstrous an anachronism as the Turkish Empire must be removed from the family of the nations, and the Turk must return to the part for which he had always been destined, that of the ruler of a tribal province. Through the autumn months of 1916, Sir Archibald Murray, this kind of warfare was much the same as the old Sudan campaigns. The condition was that before each move, large quantities of supplies had to be collected at an advanced base. An action was then fought to clear the front, and after it came a pause, while the railway was carried forward and a new reserve of supplies accumulated. The task was harder than in the Sudan, for there was no river to give water. In that thirsty land, after the Katia Basin was left behind, water was almost non-existent, and supplies had to be brought by rail in tank trucks till a pipeline could be laid. The work entailed was very great, but the organization of camel transport gradually bridged the gap between the railhead and the front. The soldiers in the French and Flanders trenches were inclined to look upon the Egyptian campaign as the longed-for war of movement. Movement there was, but it was less the movement of cavalry riding for an objective than the slow progress of engineers daily completing a small section of line in the sunbanked sand. Sir Archibald Murray has described the situation. The main factor without which all liberty of action and any tactical victory would have been nugatory was work, intense and unremitting. To regain the peninsula, the true frontier of Egypt, hundreds of miles of water, piping had been laid. Filters capable of supplying 1,500,000 gallons of water a day and reservoirs had been installed, and tons of stone transported from distant quarries. 
Kantara had been transformed from a small canal village into an important railway and water terminus, with wharves and cranes and a railway ferry. And the desert, till then almost destitute of human habitation, showed the successive marks of our advance in the shape of strong positions, firmly entrenched and protected by hundreds of miles of barbed wire, of standing camps where troops could shelter in comfortable huts, of tanks and reservoirs, of railway stations and sidings, of aerodromes and of signal stations and wireless installations, by all of which the desert was subdued and made habitable, and adequate lines of communication established between the advancing troops and their ever-receding base. Moreover, not only had British troops labored incessantly during the summer and autumn, but the body of organized native labor had grown. The necessity of combining the protection and maintenance, including the important work of sanitation, of this large force of workers, British and native, with that progress on the railway roads and pipes, which was vital to the success of any operation, put the severest strain upon all energies and resources. But the problem of feeding the workers without starving the work was solved by the goodwill and energy of all concerned. The headquarters of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force under Sir Archibald Murray were now at Cairo, and the Eastern Force, with headquarters at Ismailia, was under Lieutenant General Sir Charles Dobell, the conqueror of the Cameroons. Of this, the spearhead was the Desert Column, consisting mainly of Australian, New Zealand and British Mountain Troops, and the Camel Troops, now under Lieutenant General Sir Philip Cathwood, who had commanded the 2nd Cavalry Division on the French front. The immediate objective was El Arish, and during October and November much bombing work was done by the Royal Flying Corps, and there were various brilliant little cavalry reconnaissances. Between 13th and 17th October, for example, the enemy position on the steep hills at Magara, 65 miles east of Ismailia, was successfully reconnoitered after two difficult night marches. Meantime, the railway was creeping on. At the end of October, it was four miles east of Bir el Abed, and by 26 November, it had reached Mazar. The enemy's advanced position in front of El Arish and Masaid covered all the water in the area, and it was necessary to accumulate large supplies at railhead in case the operation of dislodging him should prove a slow one. By 20th December, we were ready to strike, but the Turks did not await us. On the night of the 19th December, they evacuated the positions which they had so elaborately fortified. Their retreat was discovered by our airmen, and on the night of the 20th, Australian and New Zealand mounted troops, supported by the Imperial Camel Corps, marched 20 miles and reached El Arish at sunrise to find it empty. The Turkish garrison of 1600 men had fallen back upon Magdaba. Scottish troops entered El Arish some hours later, and the frontier town which for two years had been in the enemy's hands was now restored to Egypt. Mine-sweeping operations were at once begun in the roadstead. A pier was built, and by the 24th, supply ships from Port Said had begun unloading stores. We had won the necessary advanced base for the coming major operations. The next step was to round up the retreating garrison. At 12.45 a.m. on the morning of 23rd December, a flying column took the road under Chauvel and found the enemy at Magdaba, 20 miles to the south-southeast, in a strong position on both banks of the Wadi El Arish. Then followed a very perfect little action. The Australian light horse and the New Zealand mounted rifles moved east of Magdaba against the enemy's right flank and rear, while the Imperial Camel Corps attacked in front. The reserves, in order to prevent escape, swung round from the northwest. Shortly after noon, the Turkish position was completely surrounded. The mirage, however, impeded the work of the horse artillery batteries, and the entire absence of water made it clear that unless Magdaba was carried soon, the troops would have to be withdrawn. Chauvel, accordingly, was given orders to press the attack, and by four o'clock, after a bayonet charge by a light horse regiment, the place was won. Our casualties were 12 officers and 134 other ranks killed and wounded. We took 1,282 prisoners, 4 mountain guns, 1 machine gun, and over 1,000 rifles. 
Our airplanes reported that the enemy had entrenched himself at Magruntine, near Rafa, 30 miles northeast of El Arish. But Doble had to wait for supplies before he could strike a fresh blow. The new position was a formidable one, made up of a central keep surrounded by three strong series of works connected by trenches, with an open glacis in front of them. The desert column, under Sir Philip Chatwood, consisting of Australian and New Zealand mounted troops, British Yeomanry, and the Imperial Camel Corps, left El Arish on the evening of January 8, 1917, and at dawn on the 19th had surrounded the enemy. As at Magdaba, the Australians and New Zealanders attacked on the right from the east, while the Camel Corps moved against the front. By 11 a.m. Rafa was taken, and by 4.45 p.m. the New Zealanders had captured the main redoubt. By 5.30 p.m., the action, which had lasted 10 hours, was over, and a relieving enemy column coming from Shalal had been driven back. Our casualties were only 487 in all, and from the enemy we took 1,600 unwounded prisoners, 6 machine guns, 4 mountain guns, and a quantity of transport. The actions of Magdaba and Rafa were models of desert campaigning and showed the perfect cooperation of all arms. They were battles of the old type, where mobility and tactical boldness carried the day, and where from a neighboring height every incident of the fight could be followed. The result was the clearing of the Sinai Desert of all foreign bodies of Turkish Turks. Operations in the interior and the south, conducted by small flying columns of cavalry and camelry, had kept pace with the greater movement in the north. The British troops were now beyond the desert, on the edge of habitable country. The next objective was the Gaza Beersheba line, the gateway to Syria. During the last month of 1916, the western borders of Egypt were comparatively peaceful. The last flickering of rebellion was stamped out in Darfur in November, when the ex-Sultan Ali Dinar was killed. The Bahariya and Dakala oasis had been occupied without trouble, and our chief business on that frontier was that of police patrols and on occasional reconnaissance. But during January, news came that Sidi Ahmed, the Grand Senussi, with his commander-in-chief Mahmoud Salah, and a force of 1,200, was preparing to leave Siwa Oasis and return to Jagbab. Major General Watson, commanding the Western Force, was ordered to advance on the Siwa and Jirba Oasis, with the object of capturing the Grand Senussi and scattering his following. But to conduct any considerable force over the 200 waterless miles between Mersa Matru and Siwa would have taken at least a month's preparation, so the task was entrusted to a column of armored motor cars. The plan was for the main body to attack the enemy camp at Jirba, while a detachment should hold the Munasi Pass, the only pass between Siwa and Jagbab practicable for camels, and so deflect Sidi Ahmed's flight into the waterless desert. On 3rd February, the main enemy camp at Jirba was attacked. Saleh resisted strongly all day, while Sidi Ahmed made off westward. At dawn, on the 4th, Saleh too was in flight, and on the 5th, Siwa was entered without opposition. Meantime, the Munasi detachment had occupied the pass and ambushed a party of the enemy. Sidi Ahmed was therefore forced to abandon his natural route of retreat and with his commander-in-chief make the best of a bad road to his distant sanctuary. The expedition, in the words of Sir Archibald Murray's dispatch, dealt a rude blow to the moral of the Senussi, left the Grand Senussi himself painfully making his way to Jangbub through the rugged and waterless dunes, and freed my western front from the menace of his forces. In August, Lieutenant General Sir Stanley Maud, who had commanded the 13th Division, had succeeded Sir Percy Lake in command of the Mesopotamian Expeditionary Force. The worst trouble of that army were now over. Hospital arrangements had been perfected, river transport had been reorganized, railway communications had been completed, and all the work behind the front, without which an advance of troops cannot be made, had reached a state of efficiency very different from the confusion of the early days. General Maud had before him an intricate strategical problem. His area of command stretched from the banks of the Euphrates to the walls of Ispahan, and it seemed as if the enemy aimed at containing the British on the Tigris, while attacking towards Nasiriyah on the Euphrates in the west, 
and in the East waging a campaign through Persia against the safety of India. In these circumstances, the British commander-in-chief decided rightly that to disseminate our troops in order to safeguard the various conflicting interests involved would have relegated us to a passive defensive everywhere. The true policy was to strike at the enemy's main center, Baghdad, for a successful advance up the Tigris, would relieve the pressure in Persia and on the Euphrates. Movement was, of course, impossible during the summer. The intense heat had tried the health of men who had already behind them an incredible record of desert warfare. The cooler days of the early autumn were employed in improving the training of all arms, accumulating supplies at the front and bringing forward drafts for the different units. By the end of November, the time was ripe for an advance. The battalions were up to strength and in good health and spirits, and the concentration on the river upstream from Sheikh Saad was completed. We have seen in an earlier chapter that after the fall of Qat, we had considerably advanced our lines, before the advent of the Mesopotamian summer put an end to campaigning. In the beginning of December, the Turkish front before Kat lay as follows. On the left bank of the Tigris, 15 miles from the town, they still held the Saniyat position, now much elaborated and strengthened, between the Suwaichia march and the river, and all the hinterland as far as Kat was covered with a series of reserve lines. On the right bank, their front ran from a point on the Tigris three miles northeast of Kut, across the big loop which is called the Kudairi Bend, to the Shat El Hai, two miles below where it leaves the main river. There it crossed the Hai and ran northwest to the Shumran Bend of the Tigris. There was a pontoon bridge across the Hai close to its point of exit from the main river, and another across the Tigris at Shumran. Further, the enemy held the high itself for several miles below the bridgehead. Everywhere he had strong trench systems and wire entanglements. On the left bank we were within 120 yards of him at Sani Yat. On the right bank our contact was less close, our advanced posts being about 2 miles from the Kadairi band and 5 miles from the high position. The strategical situation was, on the whole, favorable for Maud. The enemy's lines on the right bank of the Tigris were a dozen miles upstream from those on the left bank. His communications were therefore, in the technical phrase, in prolongation of his battlefront. If we carried the line of the high, we should be in a position to threaten seriously the communications of the Sunniat lines. On the other hand, our own situation was reasonably safe. The waterless desert made any flanking movement against us from the high precarious, and the Suwaicha marsh if it protected the Turkish left flank, also secured our right. Again, the long front gave us many opportunities for feints to cover a real purpose. Maud's plan was simple and sound. His first object was to carry the high line and then gradually to drive the enemy from the right bank of the river. If he succeeded in this, he would be able by constant attacks to make him nervous about his communications. Then a great effort could be made to force the Saniyat position, which would mean the fall of Kut. But even if this operation proved too difficult, it might be possible, when the enemy was sufficiently weakened and distracted, to cross the Tigris west of Kut and cut his communications. As we shall see, Maud succeeded in each item of his plan. By 12 December, our concentration was complete, and our troops in a position for attack. The British striking force was divided into two parts. That on the right, under Lieutenant General A.S. Cobb, V.C., was devoted to holding the enemy on the left bank of the river to the Sunniat position and watching the right bank up to the Kadiriri Bend, while that on the left, under Lieutenant General W.R. Marshall, which included the cavalry, was by a surprise march to win a position on the high. All through the 13th, Cobb bombarded Sunniat as if about to attack there, and that night Marshall moved westward against the high. The enemy was taken by surprise, and without much difficulty, we crossed at Atab and Basrugia, about eight miles from Kut, clearing the ground on the western bank to the depth of over a mile. We then swung northward along both banks to a point some two and a half miles from Kut. Two pontoon bridges were constructed at Atab. During the next two days, we pressed steadily forward while our aircraft bombed the Turkish bridge of boats at Shumran and compelled the enemy to remove it to the west side of the bend. The Turkish bridgehead at the exit of Hai was now under a continuous bombardment. 
On the 18th, we succeeded in reaching the river between Kadairi Band and Kut, thereby severing the Turkish lateral communications on the right bank. This left the Turkish force in the band cut off on left and right, and sustained only by their connection with the enemy left flank across the river. On 26 December, the weather broke, and the rains fell steadily for a fortnight. The stream rose and spread over the countryside, so that our single-line railway, now extended to Etab, was worked with difficulty, and cavalry reconnaissances were hampered by the lagoons and sodden ground. Nevertheless, during the first week of 1917, we kept up a steady bombardment and especially made the Turkish bridgehead at the Shumran a precarious lodgment. An attempt by us on the 20th January to bridge the Tigris four miles west of Shumran was anticipated by the enemy and had to be abandoned. But the chief work of these days was the clearing of the Kadair band. Our hold on the high had given us real advantages the chief of which were that we were in a position to threaten constantly the Turkish communications west of Shumran. That we had removed the danger of any attack on Nasariyeth, on the Euphrates, and that we had cut off the enemy's supplies from the rich country of the Middle Hay. We had reached the banks of the Tigris southeast of Kut, but between that point and Magaisis, the Turks still held the right bank, and could, in flood time, open the bounds and swamp part of our front. Obviously, before we could advance, we must clear this Kadairi band, which would give us the mastery of the whole right bank from Kat downwards. The task was entrusted to Kob, who, beginning operations on 5th January, succeeded by the 19th in effecting his purpose. The ground was flat and bare, and exposed on both flanks to fire at close range from across the river. Hence, many thousand yards of new trenches and covered approaches had to be dug in drenching rain and under continuous fire. The successive Turkish lines were carried by severe hand-to-hand -hand fighting, which did much to weaken the enemy morale. Meantime, Marshall was busy winning the last fragment of the High Line, that corner close to the Tigris, where the Turks held a strongly entrenched salient astride the lesser stream. It took him 13 days to get into position for the attack, but on 24th January, his trenches were within 400 yards of the enemy front. Next day, he carried the Turkish first line on a breadth of more than a mile, and his right wing also broke through the second line, thanks to the clearing of Kadair Bend. His left wing on the western bank of the high had a more difficult task, for it was exposed to heavy enfilading fire and had the enemy in strength against it. At first it, too, won the Turkish second line, but after four attacks it was compelled to retire. Next morning, two Punjabi battalions finally carried the ground, and by the 28th, we held two miles of the position to a depth of from 300 to 700 yards. On 1st February, our right won the enemy third line. But a similar gain on our left could not be held against the Turkish counterattack, supported by enfilading fire. Next day, Marshall extended his left towards the Tigris, with a view to operating presently against the Dara Bend the loop of the river between Kat and the Shumran Peninsula. On the 4th, the whole of the left bank of the high was ours, and the Turks fell back to the Licorice factory in the western angle between the high and the Tigris, and a line across the Dara Bend. The enemy's hold on the right bank of the Tigris was now rapidly weakening, and the next step was to clear the Dara Bend. The Licorice factory was kept under constant bombardment, for it was a nest of machine guns, and on the 9th, ground was won in the enemy's center, while on the left, we pushed our front to within 2,500 yards of the south end of the Shumran Bend. On the Roth, there was a general forward movement, in spite of a high wind and a dust storm, and the Turks were compelled to evacuate the licorice factory and withdraw to a new line two and a half miles long well inside the Dara Bend. Next day, we reached the Tigris, southeast of the Shumran Bend, and so enclosed the enemy. Marshall resolved to attack the Turkish right center, and several days were occupied with driving the enemy from advanced posts and constructing trenches and approaches for the coming assault. On the 15th, we fainted hard against the Turkish left, and this enabled us to carry the enemy's right center on a broad front, since our barrage prevented him from transferring thither the men he had used to strengthen his left. Presently, his left center was carried by Scottish and Indian troops, who pushed northeastward towards the Tigris, isolated the Turkish left, and took 
a thousand prisoners. The enemy fell back across the river, leaving some two thousand prisoners behind him, and by the morning of the 16th the Daraband was wholly in our hands. Thus terminated, wrote Maud, a phase of severe fighting brilliantly carried out, to eject the enemy from that horseshoe bend, bristling with trenches and commanded from across the river on three sides by hostile batteries and machine guns, called for offensive qualities of a high standard on the part of the troops. Maud had carried out the main preliminaries of his plan. He had won all the right bank of the Tigris in the vicinity of Kut. Khalil's line now ran east and west from Saniat to Shumran, with his left wing bent at right angles between the Suwaicha marsh and the river. It was geographically a strong defensive position, for it was protected throughout almost its whole length by the Tigris. But it had one weak point, at Shumran, where the enemy's battlefront and his line of communications met, and his fears for this point had compelled him to weaken other parts of his front. The moment had come for the British to cross the river, and the proper crossing place must be as far as possible to the west. If the crossing was to succeed, the forces at Saniat must be kept closely engaged, and activities maintained along the whole river line. We hoped to enter by the back door, but if that was to be forced open, it was necessarily to knock violently at the front door to distract the occupants. On 17th February, Cobb attacked at Saniat over sodden ground, for during the last few days the rain had fallen heavily. His attack was a surprise, and with little loss he carried the first and second lines on a frontage of 400 yards. Enemy counterattacks, however, drove him back to his own lines before the evening. Then came a pause while preparations were being made for the Schumann crossing, approaches being constructed and guns moved under cover of night, and the crews of the pontoons trained for their duties. On the 22nd, part of Cope's forces again attacked at Saniat, and after a day's hard fighting, secured the first two enemy trench lines. That night, we made a feint as if to cross at Cut and Magasis, and during the daylight, we had allowed our preparations to be furtively observed, so that the enemy moved troops and guns to the Kat Peninsula. On the 23rd came the real attempt. The place selected for the purpose was the south end of the Shumran Bend, and three ferries were provided immediately downstream. Just before dawn, the work of the ferries began. The lower ferries came immediately under such a furious machine gun fire that they had to be closed, though not until a gallant company of Gurkhas had reached the farther bank. But the troops using the uppermost ferry crossed with ease and took five machine guns and 300 prisoners. By 7.30 a.m., three companies of North Folks and 150 Gurkhas were across, and the work of building the bridge began. The Turkish guns were engaged by ours, and the North Folks and Gurkhas pressing inland and along the bank were soon a mile north of the bridgehead. At 4.30 p.m., the bridge was open for traffic. By nightfall, as a result of the day's operation, our troops had, by their unconquerable valor and determination, forced the passage across a river in flood, 340 yards wide, in face of strong opposition, and had secured a position 2,000 yards in depth, covering the bridgehead. While ahead of this line, our patrols were acting vigorously against the enemy's advanced detachments, who had suffered heavy losses, including about 700 prisoners taken in all. The infantry of one division was across, and another division was ready to follow. It was a crossing worthy to rank with the passage of the Eisen in September 1914, for if the Turkish strength was less formidable than the German, the swollen Tigris was a far greater barrier than the sluggish French stream. That same day, Cobb at Siniat had won the third, fourth, and fifth lines, and was busy making roads for his guns and transport across the tangle of ruined trenches. On the 24th, Marshall advanced in the Shumran Band, fighting hard in the northeast corner, where a series of nallas were honeycombed with machine gun emplacements. That night the enemy, stoutly resisting, had been forced back a thousand yards. Another division had crossed the bridge, and the cavalry too were over, and striving to break out the peninsula to cut off Khalil's retreat towards Baghdad. Our airplanes, reported at every road, was thronged with retiring troops but the Turkish rear guards made a good defense and our horsemen did not emerge from the peninsula till too late for a grand coup. That day, Kob carried the enemy's sixth line at Suniyat and marched on the Nakailat and Suwada positions, 
only to find them empty. The Iron Fortress, which had defied all our efforts in the early months of 1916, had yielded to the resolute assault of our infantry, supported by the distraction at Chumran. Cobb entered Kat unopposed, and the gunboats came upstream from Falaya, and anchored off the town where exactly ten months before, the Julnar had failed to run the blockade and bring food to Townshend's famished remnant. Meantime, Marshall's forces and the cavalry were not upon Khalil's track. Eight miles from the Shumran, the Turks attempted a stand, but were driven in with a loss of 400 prisoners. The cavalry on our right endeavored to get round the Turkish flank, but were held up by the entrenched infantry in the frequent marshes. The pursuit was in two columns, one following the river and the other striking across the country in the hope of intercepting the enemy rear guards. But the Turkish retreat was well handled, and the bulk of their forces were too quick for us. Our gunboat flotilla had better luck, for it sunk or took most of the enemy's craft. Among its captures were the Firefly, the Sumana, and the Pioneer, vessels which we had lost in the preceding campaign. By 28th February, Marshall had arrived at Azizia, halfway to Baghdad, where he halted to reorganize his communications, while Cobb's forces closed to the front. Since the crossing of the Tigris, we had taken 4,000 prisoners, of whom 188 were officers, 39 guns, 22 trench mortars, 11 machine guns, besides vast quantities of other material. On 5th March, the advance was renewed. Marshall marched 18 miles to Zeur, while the cavalry pushed on 7 miles further to Laj, and had a successful brush in a dust storm with a Turkish rearguard, during which a Hussar regiment galloped straight through the enemy trenches. Next day, the Tisiphon position was passed. It was found to be strongly entrenched but empty, and the cavalry got within 3 miles of the river Diyala, which enters the Tigris from the east 8 miles below Baghdad. Next day, 7th March, our advanced front was in contact with the enemy along that river line. Here it was clear the Turks proposed to attempt a stand. After sunset on the night of the 7th, when we launched our first pontoon, it was greeted by heavy rifle and machine gun fire, and four later pontoons met the same fate. A small column from Marshall's force was ferried across the Tigris in order to enfilade the Diala position and during the night of the 8th, four attempts were made to cross the Diala. One partially succeeded, and 70 men of the North Lancashires established a post in a loop of the river, and held it gallantly for 24 hours. At 4 a.m., on the morning of the 10th, Marshall attacked again at two points a mile apart, and by 7 a.m., the East Lancashires and the Wiltshires had crossed and joined the North Lancashires. A bridge was constructed by noon, the riverside villages were cleared, and some hundreds of prisoners were taken. That night we were in touch with the enemy's last position covering Baghdad from the southeast along the ridge called Tel Muhammad. Meantime, on the 8th, a bridge had been thrown across the Tigris below the Diala mouth, and the cavalry and part of Cobb's forces had crossed and advanced against the Turkish position at Shawa Khan which covered Baghdad from the direction of the Euphrates Valley. Shawa Khan was easily taken on the morning of the 9th, but we were kept busy for the rest of the day with the Turkish rear guard a mile and a half to the northward. During the night, this rear guard fell back, and on the 10th we engaged it within three miles of Baghdad, while our cavalry from the west came within two miles of the railway station, which lay on the right bank of the Tigris. A furious dust storm checked our advance that day, and at midnight, the enemy retired. Next morning, 11th March, at 5.30 a.m., our troops groped their way through the dust into the railway station and learned that the enemy force on the right bank had retired upstream beyond the city. Our advanced guards entered the suburbs on that bank, and the cavalry pressed the enemy to the northwest. Early that same morning, Marshall had discovered that the Turks were retreating from the Tel Muhammad Ridge. He lost no time in pursuing them, but he found that the dust storm prevented him from keeping contact with the enemy. An hour or two later, he had entered Baghdad and was warmly welcomed by the inhabitants, who were threatened with looting and burning by a riffraff of Kurds and Arabs. Order was presently restored, and the British flag hoisted over the city. The fleeing Turks had attempted to destroy the stores they could not remove, but a vast amount of military material was left behind.
From the arsenal, we recovered the guns, which Townshend had rendered useless before Kut was surrendered. The capture of Baghdad was an event of the first magnitude in the history of the war. It restored British prestige in the east, which Kut and Gallipoli had shaken. It deprived the Teutonic League of a territory, which had always played a vital part in its policy. It hit Turkey hard in her pride, and not less in her military strength. It cheered and enheartened our allies, for Baghdad was so far the only famous city won from the enemy. But the chief importance of the success was its proof to the world of the morale of the British army and the British nation. They had been beaten, but they had not accepted defeat. They had fallen back after their fashion, only to come again. The gallant dash had failed, so they had set themselves resolutely to win by slow and sure stages. The Tigris expedition was in many respects a parallel to the old Sudan campaigns. In the one as in the other, Britain had begun with improvisations and failed. In the one as in the other, she had ended with methodical organization and had succeeded. Victory following on failure is doubtly creditable, and after the confusion and tragedy of her first venture, it was proof of a stout national fiber that she could so nobly retrieve her mistakes. The performance of Sir Stanley Maud would be hard to overpraise. On a broad basis of careful preparation, he had constructed a strategical scheme as brilliant as it was simple. The tactical work had been marked by great resourcefulness and ingenuity, and by the most meticulous care. Here there was none of that lack of generalship which at other times had made fruitless and gallantry of our fighting men. But if the leadership was excellent, the stamina and courage of the troops were super excellent. These were men who had for the most part been engaged for a year and a half in the same terrain, who had endured every extreme of heat and cold, who had suffered from the countless local diseases and the earlier disorder of the hospital and transport service, and who had in their memory more than one galling disaster. Of their achievement, let their leaders speak. Each difficulty encountered seemed but to steal the determination to overcome it. It may be truly said that not only have the traditions of these ancient British and Indian regiments been in safekeeping in the hands of their present representatives, but that these have even added fresh luster to the records on their time-honored scrolls. Where fighting was almost daily in progress, it is difficult to particularize, but the fierce encounters west of the High, the passages of the Tigris and the Yala, and the final storming of the Saniyat position may perhaps be mentioned as typical of all that is best in the British and Indian soldier. End of chapter 71。Section 38 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress, Continued, and The Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Book 3, The Great Sallies. Chapter 72, The Russian Coup d'etat, December 29th, 1916, to March 16th, 1917, Part 1. The opening of 1917 found Russia in a state of artificial calm. The stormy November session of the Duma and the unanswered and unanswerable attacks upon the administration had, it appeared, produced no lasting result. The autocracy had won, as was shown by the appointment of Prince N. Golitsyn as premier the rehabilitation of men whose career had been a public scandal, and, above all, by the increased activities of M. Protopopov, the principal agent of reaction. Yet behind the calm there was movement, the more significant because it was so quiet. The reasonable and patriotic elements in Russia's life, the Duma, the Union of Towns and Zemstvos, the Council of the Empire, the United Nobility, men of every shade of political opinion, were gradually drawing together. The communists in the industrial areas were grouped, though with a different purpose, on the same side. The army and the army chiefs were in full sympathy, 
Opposed to this great mass of opinion stood the court circle and the dark forces, small in numbers, but all-powerful, for they controlled the administrative machine, and the secret police were their docile servants. Back world of illiberalism, corruption, and neurotic mysticism was well aware that it was fighting for its life. It had forgotten the struggle with Germany and the interests of the nation, its aim was to force on a feudal revolution, to quench it in blood, to quell by terrorism any agitation for reform, and to entrench itself anew in power for another century. It had become wholly unnational, and it had also become desperate, for an event that happened at the close of the year 1916, which had been a challenge to an implacable vendetta. Forty-four years before, there had been born in the Siberian district of Tobolsk a certain Grigory Nevesk, who, as he grew up, was given by his neighbors the name of Rasputin, which signifies dirty dog. He came of a peasant family, which, like many Siberian stocks, had a hereditary gift of mesmeric power. His youth was largely devoted to horse-stealing and perjury, and his prowess as a drunkard and a rural Don Juan was famed throughout the countryside. In early manhood, he added another part to his repertoire. He became religious, let his hair grow long, and tramped about the world barefoot, while his long, ostentatious fasts proclaimed his holiness. He was never in religious orders, but his fame as an ascetic grew, and the dignitaries of the church turned a favorable eye on one who might prove a popular miracle worker. He did not change his habits, for on occasion he was as drunken as ever, and his immorality was flagrant. But it was not the first time that a Casanova had masqueraded in a hair shirt. Devout ladies of high rank heard of him and admitted him to their circles, and he played havoc among the devout ladies. His personal magnetism and his erotic mania gave him an uncanny power over hysterical women on the outlook for the miraculous. Moscow was, at first, his sphere of influence, but his reputation spread far and wide, and no scandals could check it. He started a new cult, where dancing and debauchery were interspersed with mystical seances, and presently, through the medium of one of the ladies-in-waiting, he had the imperial family among his devotees. The man was a scoundrel and a charlatan, but he must have had some strange quality of his own to attract and hold so great a following. He was given the office of lighter of the sacred lamps in the palace, but his real function was that of chief medicine man to the superstitious court. His filthy peasant shirt was used as a charm to cure the little Tsarevich of a fever. His lightest word became law, and he was consulted on matters of which he did not understand the names. Fashionable ladies fought for his favors. Great ecclesiastics and ministers waited patiently in his anteroom. He was a man of middle height with curious, deep-set eyes, long, thick hair, and a tangled beard, dressing always in peasant's clothes, and rarely washing. Few more squalid figures have ever reached supreme power in a great nation. Footnote. He was thus described by an observer. The fascination of the man lay altogether in his eyes. Otherwise, he looked only a common mujik, with no beauty to distinguish him. A sturdy rogue, overgrown with a forest of dirty, unkempt hair, dirty in person, and disgusting in habits. His language oscillated between the stock-and-trade odds and ends of scripture and mystic writ, and the foulest vocabulary of Russian, which of all white men's tongues is the most powerful in the expression of love and affection and of abominable abuse. But the eyes of the satyr were remarkable, cold, steely gray, with that very rare power of contracting and expanding the pupils at will regardless of the amount of light present. End footnote. After drink and women, his chief passion was gold, and he found in politics full gratification for his avarice. To bribe Rasputin became the easiest and often the only way to high office. 
those who opposed him or failed to cultivate him were dismissed. An unfriendly journalistic reference led to the suppression of the paper that printed it. He held the clergy for the most part in the hollow of his hand. He was a friend of Count Witt in his day, of Maglakov and Sukhomlinov and Gurenikin and Stuma. He had much to do with the retirement of the Grand Duke Nicholas, who never concealed his contempt for him. At the end of 1916, he had four principal creatures through whom he conducted his business. Protopopov, the Minister of the Interior, Rehev, the Procurator of the Holy Synod, Manasevich Manuilov, a jackal of Stiumas, and Petrian, the Metropolitan of Petrograd. Grand dukes and princes of the royal blood appealed to the emperor and the empress to shake themselves loose from the shackles, but the only result was the exile of the appellants. It is not probable that he had any serious pro-German proclivities, though he received German gold. He had no considered views on high politics and played for his low personal ends. But he was anti-national, insomuch that he stood for the dark back world of Russia, which must cease to exist if the Russian people were to emerge victorious from the war. Such a man must live in perpetual danger, and it was noticed by those who interviewed him during that winter that he began to wear a hunted look, as if he heard the hounds on his trail. He had betrayed so many women that there was scarcely a noble family in Russia but had some wrong to avenge. He had been assaulted several times, and once had been soundly beaten. But to the amazement of Europe, he went on living. The events of November, however, in the Duma and the Council of Empire, showed him that his enemies were getting bolder. It was not the people at large whom he had to fear, for they scarcely knew of his existence. It was the nobility and the upper classes who wished to remove a plague spot from the national life. He grew frightened shut himself up in his house, and only saw those who were first examined by his private bodyguard of secret police. Presently his alarm increased, and he tried to conceal his whereabouts. But by this time the ring was drawn close around him, and it was very certain that he would die. On the night of 29th December, 1916, Prince Yusupov, a young man of rank and wealth, who had been educated at Oxford and had married a connection of the imperial family, rang up Rasputin on the telephone and asked him to supper at his house. Such supper parties were no unusual things in the man's experience, for he could drink any guardsman under the table and was famous as a ribald jester. Rather unwillingly, he accepted the invitation and was fetched by his host in his own car. The chauffeur, who was a member of the Duma, followed them inside the house where they found the Grand Duke Dmitri Polovich. His executioners locked the door, and after a struggle, shot him dead. The noise attracted the attention of the police, who came to inquire as to his meaning. We were getting rid of a troublesome dog, they were told. The corpse was placed in the car and taken to a lonely island in the Neva, where it was weighted with stones and dropped through a hole in the ice. Blood marks in the snow and one of his galoshes were the only marks of the deed. But three days later the body was found. After a mass said by the Metropolitan, it was taken to Sarko Selo and buried in a silver coffin, the Emperor and Protopopov being among the pallbearers and the Empress among the chief mourners. The executioners went home and telephoned to the police to proclaim what they had done. Next evening, the Bourse Gazette announced Rasputin's death, and that night at the Imperial Theatre, the audience celebrated the event with enthusiasm and sang the national anthem. The whole country applauded the equity of the deed and regarded it less as a murder than as a judicial execution. The man had put himself where the law could not touch him, and representatives of the people and of the nobility ceremoniously and deliberately brought him within the pale of a rough justice. The death of Gregory Rasputin was the first act in the Russian Revolution.
it is the way of revolutions to have among their preliminaries some strange drama apparently outside the main march of events which yet in the retrospect is seen to be organically linked with it in slaying him the russian nobility made their reckoning with one who had smirched the honor of their class and the next step was for the russian people to take order with what was smirching the honor of the nation but for the moment the autocracy grew the strings tighter rasputin was dead but protopopov remained the duma which should have met on january twenty fifth nineteen seventeen was postponed for a month in order it was stated to give the new premier time to revise the policy of his predecessors the general congress of the union of towns and Svetsvos had already been forbidden and the police were given the right of being present at all private meetings of any organization the censorship was drawn tight and the minister of the interior turned the ordinary work of his department over to his assistants devoting all his energies to the press and the secret police the numbers of the latter were greatly increased and petrograd was filled with them while machine guns sent from england for the army and sorely needed at the front were concealed on the roofs at commanding points throughout the city all things were ripe for the forcing on of that abortive revolution which the reactionaries desired for their complete establishment in power the protagonist in this sinister business alexander protopopov will remain one of the enigmas of history originally a liberal he came to western europe in the summer of nineteen sixteen with a deputation of members of the duma and the council of the empire and delighted audiences in england and france with his perfervid oratory he had great charm of manner and an air of earnest simplicity which deeply impressed those who met him he talked the commonplaces of the allied cause but with a conviction and warmth of imagination which made his speeches by far the best made by any foreign visitor to our shores since the outbreak of war but those who were often in his company observed that he seemed to be living always at fever point he suffered much from insomnia and his talk was often wild and strained on his return to russia he fell completely into the hands of the court party and more especially of those elements who were represented by Rasputin. his neurotic temperament and his restless romantic imagination predisposed him to be influenced by the glamour of the court and the necromancy of charlatans he took to spending as much time at seances as in the council chamber towards the end he became known as the mad minister and it is likely that his wits were seriously unhinged that at any rate is the most charitable hypothesis on which to explain the aberrations of a man who had in his time done honest public service and who was certainly no common traitor during january and february the people seemed apathetic under the new tyranny no one desired revolution except the agitators who had made it their business for the thinking man realized that it would cripple the conduct of the war and play the game of the enemy the reactionaries grew bolder and on the ninth february the labor group of m gustchoff's war industry committee the equivalent to the british ministry of munitions were arrested on a charge of conspiracy and imprisoned without trial the outrage was received with calm for its intention was seen to be provocative m miliukov and some of the labor leaders wrote appeals to the people to remain quiet and their appeals were suppressed by the authorities petrograd was made a military district by itself but even this menace failed to create disturbances an allied commission including lord milner and general de Cassigny, was in russia at the time and its members though they believed revolution to be inevitable some time or other misjudged the popular temper and thought that nothing would happen till after the war on twenty seventh february the duma met amid bodyguards of police in the council of the empire chiglovitov who had originally been dismissed from office along with sukhomolinov and in the duma markov revealed themselves as the government's representatives and it was clear that protopopov was about to engineer new elections that he might have a duma to his liking 
things went so tamely that the reactionaries began to flatter themselves that their enemies were cowed, and that they had already won the game. Bupudishkevich, an extreme conservative and a sturdy patriot, spoke more truly than he knew when he concluded a fiery attack on Protopopov with the words, Dawn is not yet, but it is behind the hills. End of section 38「Section 39 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress Continued, and the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 72. The Russian Coup d'etat, December 29th, 1916, through March 16th, 1917, Part 2. In the meantime, the people were hungry, and hunger is a great dissolvent of patience. It had been a bitter winter, with heavy snowfalls, and the supply of food was scanty. The immense demands of the army had strained the transport machinery to its utmost, and the situation was made worse by the restrictions imposed on the export of grain from one district to another, for in some areas there were large surplus stocks. The government had no plan to deal with the shortage, and by February the daily bread ration in Petrograd, small at the best, looked as if it were about to fail. Patiently, the people waited for hours in the bread queues, telling each other that their kinsfolk were enduring far worse hardships in the trenches, and that it behooved them to be patient for Russia's sake. But word began to go around that before the spring came, real starvation would be upon them, and there were many, social democrats in the factories, mysterious figures at the street corners, to point the moral and ask what was the use of a government which could not give them bread. Long, straggling, innocent processions began to wander about Petrograd, helpless people asking only for food for their children. They seemed to beg and expostulate rather than demand. Thursday, 8th March, was a day of clear, fine weather. In the afternoon there was a gala performance of Lermontov's masquerade at the alexander theatre on which ten years preparation and vast sums of money had been lavished all day long women waited in the streets outside the baker's shop for a chance to get their dwindling bread ration panis et circeses the old antidotes to revolution in the duma a debate on the question of food supplies was winding out its slow length. Everywhere there seemed a profound peace, the peace of apathy and disheartenment. But in the afternoon a small party of Cossacks galloped down the Nevsky Prospect, causing the promenaders to ask whether there was trouble somewhere across the river. A little later a few baker's shops were looted in the poorer quarters, and a forlorn and orderly procession of students and working men wives appeared on the Nevsky. Protopopov's spies reported that all was quiet. But they were wrong, for the revolution had begun. The breaking point had been reached in the people's temper, and the city was on the tiptoe of expectation, seeking for a sign. Next day, Friday the ninth, in the same bright cold weather, it became apparent that some change had taken place. The people, by a common impulse, flowed out into the streets. Some of the chief newspapers did not appear, and those that did contained solemn warnings about the crisis. The food debate in the Duma took a new turn. The government was appealed to to grapple with the provisioning of the capital. Crowds were everywhere, laughing, talking, and always expectant. The Cossack patrol stopped to fraternize with these groups and seemed to be on the best of terms with them. Workmen chaffed and cheered the soldiers. 
and the soldiers could be heard assuring the people that they would not shoot them, whatever their orders. You are not going to fire on us, brothers, cried the crowd to the troops. We only want bread. No, was the reply. We are hungry like yourselves. Towards the police, on the other hand, there was no friendliness. Stones and bottles were thrown at them, and there was some shooting. Two workmen were arrested and taken into the courtyard, which was defended by a company of soldiers. The crowd tried to rush the courtyard to effect a rescue, and the soldiers seemed about to fire, when a band of Cossacks rode up, secured the arrested men, and delivered them to their friends. There was very little political speech-making. Late in the afternoon, a workman, standing on a tub in the middle of the Nevsky, announced that they must get rid of the government. One of his hearers shouted, Down with the war! and was at once sternly rebuked. Remember, the blood of our brothers and sons must not be spilt for nothing. The thing to do is to get rid of the government. Peace, when it comes, must be an honorable peace. To the casual observer, it seemed as if there was no purpose, except idle curiosity in the great throngs. They seemed too tolerant and good-humored to mean serious business. But to one who watched more closely, it was clear that there was some kind of organization behind it all. Otherwise, why the constant appeals for moderation made wherever there was a chance of the peace being broken? The government wants an excuse to crush the people. Do not play into their hands by rioting, but to keep cool. The one great thing is to force the government to go. Something had already been achieved. There had been meetings and processions, and the soldiers had encouraged them. But it was hard to believe that these leaderless crowds could achieve anything great. They were unarmed and undisciplined, and in Petrograd there were at least 28,000 police with many machine guns. Next day, Saturday, the trams stopped running, though the shops were still open and the cinematograph shows crowded. The expectation had grown tenser and the streets were more densely packed than ever. The workmen, having received their week's pay, struck work and joined the throngs, and serious political talk took the place of the gossip and banter of the preceding day. The next move, lay with the government. Either it must satisfy the people, or it must coerce them. The following morning, Sunday the 11th, the government acted. General Kabalov, the new military governor of Petrograd, plastered the city with proclamations, announcing that the police had orders to disperse all crowds, and that any workman who did not return to work on Monday morning would be sent to the trenches. No attention was paid to the first part, and the crowds in the streets were enormous, including women and children who had turned out from pure curiosity. It was noticed that the police patrols had been much strengthened, and the detachments of regulars had been brought in to assist. The Vesky Prospect was cleared from end to end and put under military guard, but the people took it calmly. There was a certain amount of firing on the crowds, with the result that some two hundred were killed. Observers, friendly to the revolution, saw in the day another complete fiasco after the fashion of Russian revolts, but three significant incidents had occurred. A company of the Pavlovsky regiment had mutinied when told to fire on the people. The president of the Duma, M. Rodzionko, had telegraphed to the emperor, Situation serious, anarchy reigns in the capital. Government is paralyzed. Transport, food, and fuel supplies are utterly disorganized. General discontent is growing. Disorderly firing is going on in the streets. Various companies of soldiers are shooting at each other. It is absolutely necessary to invest someone who enjoys the confidence of the people with powers to form a new government. No time must be lost, and delay may be fatal. I pray God that this our responsibility may not fall on the wearer of the crown. He sent copies of his telegram to different commanders-in-chief at the front and asked for their support. The government, after much hesitation, also acted, and Prince Golitsyn prorogued the Duma. 
under discretionary powers which he had received from the emperor. But the Duma refused to be prorogued, and elected a provisional committee which continued to sit. Radzianko's huge figure rose in the winter twilight, and waving in his hand the order for dissolution, he announced that the Duma was now the sole constitutional authority of Russia. Next day, the soldiers followed suit. Monday, 12th March, was to prove the decisive day, and a movement which had begun by slow and halting stages was to become a whirlwind. During the night, the two operative forces of the revolution had made their decision. The troops, both the Petrograd garrison and those brought in as reinforcements, were aware what their orders would be and were resolved to disobey them. They could not shoot down their own class. The consciously revolutionary elements in the army were small, and this resolve was simply the revolt of human nature against an unnatural task. At the same time, the socialist organizations among the workmen were preparing their own scheme. If the old regime were dissolved, they would be ready with an alternative. Before nine o'clock in the morning, the streets were black with people, and it was curious to note that on the crest of the volcano, much of the normal life of the city continued. Men went about their ordinary avocations till they were pulled up by some lava stream from the eruption. The crisis came early in the day. The Preobazhensky guards, the flower of the household troops, were ordered to fire on the mob. Instead, they shot their more unpopular officers. The Valensky regiment was sent to coerce them and joined in the mutiny. The united forces swept down on the arsenal and, after a short resistance, carried the place and provided the revolution with munitions of war. Then began a day of sheer naked chaos. The soldiers had no plans and drifted from quarter to quarter, intoxicated with their new freedom, but still maintaining a semblance of discipline. There was no looting and little drunkenness. No leader appeared, and a force of some 25,000 men, made up of the Pryobrzhensky, Volensky, Latovsky, and Keksolmsky regiments. Footnote. Many of these troops were not pure Russian. The Volensky regiment was composed of Ruthenes and Ukrainians, the Latovsky with Poles, and the Keksolmsky of Finns. End footnote swung from street to street as if moved by some elemental law. The headquarters of the autocracy fell one by one. At 11 a.m., the courts of law were on fire. Then the various prisons were stormed, and hosts of political prisoners, as well as ordinary criminals, released. In the afternoon, the great fortress of S.S. Peter and Paul surrendered, and all day the nests of the secret police were being smoked out. The chief office was raided, and the papers which it contained were burned in the street. The Bastille of the old regime had fallen. There was now no semblance of government in Petrograd, except the Duma, still sitting under Radziansko's presidency. The emperor had not replied to the first telegram, so a second was dispatched more strongly worded. Then, about midday, came the news that the emperor had wired to the minister of war that he was coming, and that he was bringing troops from the northern front to quell the rising. The Duma continued its session, scarcely less at a loss than the crowds now parading the streets. It did not realize as yet the completeness of the coup d'etat, and so missed the chance of riding the storm. Presently came deputations from the insurgent troops, who were informed of the messages sent to the emperor. The socialist deputies addressed them, and bade them at all costs maintain order, since order was vital to the cause of freedom. The regular Duma guard was removed, and a new bodyguard from the pavement substituted. In the afternoon, the Duma conferred in secret, and chose an executive committee of twelve men to act as a provisional government. Their names were Rodzianko, Nekrasov, Konovalov, Dmitriakov, Levov, Rizhensky, Karalov, Milyukov, Shedlovsky, Shulgin, Dredze, and Kerensky. Outside its walls, another committee was also being formed, 
a committee of workmen and social revolutionaries. And since they were in the van of the actual work of the revolution, they speedily obtained a great influence over the troops now pouring into Petrograd. But the center of gravity was still with the Duma, and all that Monday soldiers, workmen, and students thronged its doors, listening to speeches and making new constitutions every half hour. The chief Duma leaders visited the various barracks, and the trend of all appeals was the same. Maintain order and discipline, or your new-found liberty is lost. All day prisoners were brought in, officials and those of the police who had escaped the fury of the mob. One of these was Sheglavitov, the president of the Council of the Empire, and a pillar of the Dark Forces. When the night fell, the Admiralty searchlights lit the Nevsky from end to end, as if to prove that the old secret ways had perished. Close on midnight, a shabby man in a dirty fur coat spoke to one of the Duma guards. Take me, he said, to the committee of the Duma. I surrender myself voluntarily, for I seek only the welfare of our country. My name is Protopapov. The coup d'etat had been achieved in Petrograd, but not yet in Russia. The emperor had still to disclose his hand. The views of the great army beyond the walls of the capital were still unknown. But on Tuesday, it became plain that no opposition need be feared from that army. Every regiment that reached Petrograd went over wholeheartedly to the revolution. On that day, 13th March, the Duma Committee, now a little clearer in its mind, grappled with the immediate problems of government. It was composed mainly of men who would be called moderates in other countries, men who desired a stable constitutional government on the lines of the Western democracies. It had to fear reaction on the one hand, and on the other, the extremism of the Council of Labor, which had already organized itself more completely than the Duma, and had a great following both among the Petrograd masses and the incoming troops. Any strife between the two would lead to a bloody commune and give reaction a chance to re-establish itself. So the Duma committee, using its two members, Dredsky and Kerensky, as its liaison with the extremists, strove to keep in line with the other. Tuesday, the Taurus Palace was one babel of talk. Soldiers, students, Jews, workmen, and socialist agitators held their meetings and camped on its floor, while its courts were a mixture of arsenal and eating house. And in quieter corners, the harassed members of the executive committee made plans for getting supplies into the city, argued with labor delegates, and strove to forecast the future. News had come that Moscow accepted the revolution. But next day, the emperor was expected, and might even then be marching a great army to take order with the new regime. Meantime, in the streets, strange dramas were being enacted. The admiralty buildings at one end of the Nevsky Prospect had been besieged for thirty-six hours. It was the last stronghold of the old government, and thither General Kabalov had retired on the outbreak of the revolt. On Tuesday morning, a letter was sent to the naval minister, Grigorievich, announcing that if the place were not surrendered within half an hour, it would be destroyed by the big guns from the fortress of S.S. Peter and Paul. Kabalov capitulated. The troops marched out, and on the gates appeared the notice, under the protection of the state Duma. The Astoria Hotel, which had been a caravansary for officers, was attacked. Sin shots had been fired on the crowd from its roof. The same thing happened elsewhere, for Protopopov's machine guns were still in position on the housetops, and the police did not surrender without a struggle. The taking of those wretched creatures provided the chief instances of barbarities during the first stage of the revolution. When captured, they were promptly murdered, often under revolting circumstances, for the people had a long and bitter count against them. During that day, too, the rest of the leaders of the old government were made prisoners, Stürmer and Petrum and Kurlov, Brubrovin, a leader of the Black Hundred, Sukhumlinov, 
who was only saved from being torn to pieces by the inner position of Kerensky. On Wednesday the 14th, the coup d'etat in Petrograd was virtually over, and the interest centered on the relations between the Executive Committee of the Duma and the Council of Labor, which had now grown into the Council of Workmen's and Soldiers' Delegates, the Soviet, which was to become a familiar name in Europe. Such sovereignty as now existed was divided between them, and as the revolution spread and the armies of Brusolov and Ruski announced their adherence, there seemed danger of a revolution within the revolution, of civil war between two sides whose feet were alike set on the new path. The Soviet reigned proclamations, some of them noble and statesmanlike, some of them visionary and foolish, such as the notorious number one, framed by the Petrograd Soviet, which abolished saluting for private soldiers off duty and proclaimed that, quote, the orders of the war committee must be obeyed, saving only on those occasions where they shall contravene the orders and regulations of the Council of Labor Deputies and Military Delegates. The appeal of the Duma Committee was more wisely inspired. Citizens, the Provisional Executive Committee of the Duma, with the aid and support of the garrison of the capital and its inhabitants, has now triumphed over the painful forces of the old regime in such a manner as to enable it to proceed to the more stable organization of executive power. With this object, the Provisional Committee will name ministers of the First National Cabinet, men whose past public activity assures them the confidence of the country. The new cabinet will adopt the following principles as their basis of its policy. 1. An immediate amnesty for all political and religious offenses, including military revolts, acts of terrorism, and agrarian crimes. 2. Freedom of speech, of the press, of associations and labor organizations, and the freedom to strike with an extension of these liberties to officials and troops insofar as military and technical conditions permit. 3. The abolition of social, religious, and racial restrictions and privileges. 4. Immediate preparation for the summoning of a constituent assembly, with universal suffrage as a basis, shall establish the governmental regime and the constitution of the country. 5 the substitution for the police of a national militia with elected heads and subject to the self-governing bodies. 6. Communal elections to be carried out on the basis of universal suffrage. 7. The troops that have taken part in the revolutionary movement shall not be disarmed, but they are not to leave Petrograd. 8. While strict military discipline must be maintained on active service, all the restrictions upon soldiers in the enjoyment of social rights granted to other citizens are to be abolished. Meantime, there was the emperor. He had not been deposed, and, to the vast majority of the Russian people, was still sovereign and father. On Wednesday the 14th, he tried to reach Petrograd but he got no farther than little station of Bologi, where workmen had pulled up the track, and he was compelled to return to Skov. At 2 a.m. on the morning of the 15th, he sent for Ruski and told him, I have decided to give way and to grant a responsible ministry. What is your view? The manifesto, already signed, lay on the table. Ruski advised him to get in touch with Rodizianko and himself telephoned to the Duma in Petrograd and to the other generals. The replies he received made it clear that there was no other course than abdication, and at 10 a.m. he made his report to the emperor, saying that in his view it was confirmed not only by Rodizianko, but by Alexeyev, Brzilov, and the Grand Duke Nicholas. Rodzianko could not leave Petrograd, but Guchkov, and Shulgin arrived in the evening and found the emperor in the royal train, haggard, unwashed, and weary. He had no one in attendance except his veteran aide-de-camp, Count Fredericks. He asked to be told the truth, and he heard that the army, 
led by his own household troops, had joined the revolution. What do you want me to do? he asked. You must abdicate, Guchkov told him. In favor of your son, with the Grand Duke Michael Alexandrovich as a regent. Such is the decision of the new government. The emperor covered his eyes. I cannot be separated from my boy, he said. I will hand the throne to my brother. Give me a sheet of paper. On that sheet of paper he wrote these words. By the grace of God, we, Nicholas II, Emperor of all the Russian, to all our faithful subjects, in the course of a great struggle against a foreign enemy who has been endeavoring for three years to enslave our country, it has pleased God to send Russia a further bitter trial. Internal troubles have threatened to compromise the progress of the war. The destinies of Russia, the honor of his heroic army, the happiness of her people, and the whole future of our beloved country demand that at all costs victory shall be won. The enemy is making his last efforts, and the moment is near when our gallant troops, in concert with our glorious allies, will finally overthrow him. In these days of crisis, we have considered that our nation needs the closest union of all its forces for the attainment of victory. In agreement with the Imperial Duma, we have recognized that for the good of our land, we should abdicate the throne of the Russian state and lay down the supreme power. Not wishing to separate ourselves from our beloved son, we bequeath our heritage to our brother, the Grand Duke Michael Alexandrovich, with our blessing upon the future of the Russian throne. We bequeath it to him with the charge to govern in full unison with the national representatives who may sit in the legislature and to take his invaluable oath to them in the name of our well-beloved country. We call upon all faithful sons of our land to fulfill this sacred and patriotic duty in obeying the emperor at this painful moment of national trial, and to aid him, together with the representatives of the nation, to lead the Russian people in the way of prosperity and glory. May God help Russia. But Amarath was not to succeed thus simply to Amarath. When Kuchkov brought back his report and a fateful sheet of paper, he found Petrograd seething with constitutional squabbles. The moderates, the bulk of the Duma committee, sought a constitutional monarchy. The Council of Workmen's and Soldiers' Delegates desired a republic insofar as they had considered forms of government at all. The abdication of the emperor was still unknown when, on Thursday afternoon, Melikov made a speech in the Duma which declared the names of the new ministers. These were Prince George Laval, Prime Minister and Minister of the Interior, Melikov, Foreign Affairs, Kuchkov, War and Marine, Kerensky, Justice, Tereschenko, Finance, Shingarev, Agriculture, Konovalov, Commerce and Industries, Nekrasov, Ways and Communications, Manulov, Public Instruction, Godnev, State Comptroller, Vladimir Lovov, Procurator of the Holy Synod, and Norichev, Finnish Affairs. It was in the most exact sense a coalition, for it included representatives of every party of the left and center. The premier, Monilov, Milyakov, Rodichev, Shirigrev, and Nikrasov were constitutional democrats. Vilov was a liberal nationalist. Godnev and Guchkov were Octoberists. Konovalov and Tereshchenko were liberals and Kerensky was a social revolutionary. Milukov explained the credentials of the new ministry. I hear voices ask, Who chose you? No one chose us. For if we had waited for elections by the people, we could not have wrenched the power from the hands of the enemy. While we quarreled about who should be elected, the foe would have had time to reorganize and reconquer both you and me. We were elected by the Russian Revolution. 
we shall not retain power for a single moment after we are told by the elected representatives of the people that they wish to see others more deserving of their confidence in our place. But we will not relinquish power now, when it is needed to consolidate the people's triumph, and when, should it fall from our hands, it would only be seized by the foe. He concluded by informing his hearers that the despot who has brought Russia to the brink of ruin will either abdicate of his free will or be deposed. He added that the Grand Duke Michael would be appointed regent. This announcement was the spark to the explosion. The Petrograd Soviet at once demanded a republic, and for an hour or two it seemed as if the new government would disappear in the horrors of the commune. The situation was saved by Kerensky. He went straightway to the Soviet meeting and broke into its heated debate. Comrades, he cried, I have been appointed Minister of Justice. No one is a more ardent Republican than I, but we must bide our time. Nothing can come to its full growth at once. We shall have our Republic, but we must first win the war, and then we can do what we will. The need of the moment is organization and discipline, and that need will not wait. His candor and earnestness carried the day. The Soviet passed a resolution in support of the provisional government by a majority of 1,000 to 15, and the new regime entered upon office. But it was clear the arrangement made by Gushkov in the royal train at Pskov could not stand. Late on the night of Thursday the 15th, a deputation, led by Prince Lavov, and including Kerensky, sought out the Grand Duke Michael and informed him that the people demanded that he should renounce the regency and relegate all powers to the provisional government until a constituent assembly could decide upon the future. The Grand Duke bowed to fate, and on the morning of Friday the 16th, there was issued a declaration in his name which rang the knell of the Romanov dynasty. I am firmly resolved, so it ran, to accept the supreme power only if this should be the desire of our great people, who must, by means of a plebiscite, through their representatives in the Constituent Assembly, establish their form of government and the new fundamental laws of the Russian state. Invoking God's blessing. I therefore request all citizens of Russia to obey the provisional government set up on the initiative of the Duma and invested with plenary powers until, within as short time as possible, the Constituent Assembly, elected on a basis of equal and universal and secret suffrage, shall enforce the will of the nation regarding the future form of the Constitution. This was on Friday, 16th March. A week before, Protopopov had been in power and his police had been established in every corner of Petrograd. The patient bread queues had been waiting in the streets, and the rank and fashion of the capital had been thronging to Alexander Theatre. Now, these things were as if they had never been. The sacred monarchy had disappeared, the strongholds of reaction had been obliterated as if by a sponge, and agitators, but lately lurking in dens and corners and dreading the sight of a soldier, were now leading guard regiments under the red flag and dictating their terms to grand dukes and princes. No more dramatic peripatia was ever witnessed in the checkered history of human government. End of section 39《セクション・フォーティー・オブ・ア・ヒストリー・オブ・グレート・ウォー・ヴォリューム・トゥ・リー・トゥ・ビリーグル・フォートレス・コンティニューディ・アン・ア・グレート・サウィーズ・ディス・イズ・ア・リーブ・ヴォックス・レコーディング・アー・リーブ・ヴォックス・レコーディングズ・アン・ディ・パブリック・ドメイン・フォー・モー・インフォーメーション・オブ・ヴォリンティア・プリーズ・ヴィジット・リーブ・ヴォックス・ドット・オーグ・レッド・バイ・ウェイン・コック・ア・ヒストリー・オブ・グレート・ウォー・ヴォリューム・トゥ・リー・バイ・ジョン・バッカン・チャプター・セブンティ・トゥ・ザ・ロシアン・クーデタ・December 29, 1916, to March 16, 1917, Part 3. The fall of the emperor was received among the Allies with a divided mind. 
even those who had claimed the revolution and recognized the inadequacy of the imperial rule, could not view without some natural regret the fate of a man who, since the first day of the war, had been scrupulously loyal to the alliance, who, as was proved by his initiation of the Hague conferences, had many generous and far-sighted ideals, and who, on the admission of all who knew him, was in character mild, courteous, and humane. Moreover, in the West there is always a lingering sentiment for disinherited kings, a sentiment sprung of that intense historic imagination which is the birthright of France and Britain. Le regard de coeur, les riches stérilles, un grand nombre de rois oubliés. Hence, it was with some surprise that Western observers watched the utter eclipse of the Tsardom, which they had been taught to regard as something intertwined with the fibre of Russian folk thought and religion. But among a people so heterogeneous and so little integrated by a common educational standard, such sudden reversals of thought were not unnatural. The Russian mind remained as before, loyal to its own peculiar mysticism. But the ideal of a thing called liberty could supplant with ease the ideal of a paternal king a race which had so little visualizing power among its mental furniture, was not the stuff of which impassioned royalists were made. The house of Romanov may be said, in one sense, to have deserved its fate. It had allowed itself to become an anachronism in the modern world, a medieval fragment in line neither with the bludgeoning German absolutism nor the freedom of Italy and Britain. A stronger man than Nicholas might have established an efficient autocracy with the complete assent of his people. A wiser man could have transformed the Tsardom into a constitutional kingship. But for either change, a stalwart soul and a penetrating mind were required, and Nicholas was not cast in that mold. He wavered between the two alternatives, and was incapable of the sustained intellectual effort necessary to follow either course. His sympathies were, on the whole, liberal, but he was easily swayed by his entourage, and especially by his wife. He did not blunder, from lack of warning. The Grand Duke Nicholas Mikhailovich told him the truth the preceding Christmas, and was banished for his pains. Your first impulse and decision are always remarkably true and right, but as soon as other influences supervene, you begin to waver and your ultimate decisions are not the same. History can only regard that gentle, ineffective, tragically fated soul with tenderness and compassion. He was born to a destiny too difficult. His very virtues, his loyalty, his mercifulness, contributed to his undoing. The worst influence was the wife whom he deeply loved. The Empress Alexander Feodorovna will be remembered with Henrietta Maria of England and Marie Antoinette of France as the instance of a devoted queen who dethroned her consort. In her eyes, the popular leaders were no more than traitors to whom she hoped some day to give short shrift. She was possessed with whimsies about divine right, and her one object in life was to hand on the Russian crown to her son with no atom of his glory diminished. Her shallow mind, played upon by every wind of superstition, was incapable of distinguishing true men from faults, or of discerning the best means of realizing her ambitions. In the end, she had so surrounded herself and her husband with rogues and charlatans that the court stank in the nostrils of decent citizens, and when it was assailed, there was none to defend it. The autocracy collapsed of its own inherent rottenness. The revolt succeeded, not because it was well-planned and brilliantly led, for there was neither plan nor leading. It won because there was no opposition. The old order ended at the first challenge, for it had become mere lath and plaster. The revolution triumphed in a week and at a cost of human life far lower than any other movement of the same magnitude had ever shown. So, at any rate, it seemed to Western observers, but the view was scarcely accurate. What happened was a coup d'etat. Supported by nearly all the troops, 
and such strokes are usually swift and bloodless. The real revolution was yet to come. On Friday, March 16th, it had scarcely begun. The cause of its immediate success was the adhesion of the army, for a government must collapse when it can no longer depend on its own armed forces. The decision as to who inspired it is more difficult. Without the Duma, the only nucleus of government, the business would have marched at once into naked chaos. There would have been a commune in Petrograd, and probably in other cities, and it is certain that the army would not have been united. The great commanders would not have accepted the change, and presently there would have been civil war. At the same time, without the driving force of the working classes of the capital, it is possible that the revolution would have ended in a barren compromise. The Duma had not the power of free initiative. Even the Provisional Committee contained too many types of political thought to enable it to speak with a clear voice. Its moderate elements, the men who understood the mechanism of government, were the men who had already failed in the struggle with the autocracy. Even a strong man like Guchkov, who had labored hard to provide munitions for the army, had found his work hampered and nullified. The taint of failure was on them all, and the public mind turned naturally to the extremists, who had never sought to work with the old regime, who had never ceased to preach a roots and branch destruction. Revolutions are violent things and their first result must always be to give a hearing to the fanatic rather than to the politique. The prestige and the initiative lay with the impromptu organization of the Petrograd proletariat. The dominant fact was that a great gap had been created and that that gap must be filled. There were two rival theories as to the method and the principles to be followed. That of the constitutionalists, and that of the extremists. The former, who were represented by the provisional government formed on 15th March, realized that Russia was in the throes of a great war, and that some kind of stable administration was needed without an hour's delay. There were all shades of opinion in their ranks, for some would have preferred to maintain the dynasty under new constitutional restrictions, while others were ready to accept a republic. But all were practical men, who were willing to jettison their pet theories and look squarely at facts. Their aim was a committee of public safety, which would guide Russia to peace, and then, with fuller knowledge and ampler leisure, prepare a constitution, as Alexander Hamilton had prepared a constitution of the United States after freedom had been won. The premier, Prince Luvov, was a specialist in local government a man who had busied himself not with political speculation, but with instant practical needs. Milukov and Shingarev were of the same cast of mind as somewhat doctrinaire British liberals. Guchkov, to continue the British parallel, was a moderate conservative. Tereschenko was a rich and enlightened employer of labor, a Tory Democrat. Vladimir Luvov was a liberal country gentleman. Their following lay in the professional classes, the businessmen, the country gentry, and the bourgeoisie. They alone in Russia had any understanding of foreign politics and of the main problems of the war. They represented all the store of administrative experience which the country possessed. Worthy, honest, and patriotic, they had kept flying the banner of a reasonable freedom during the dark days but they had failed in the past to achieve reform, and the memory of that failure clung to them. They were not, by nature, makers of revolutions. They lacked the fiery appeal, the demonic personality, which awes and attracts great masses of men. Logical, capable, intensely respectable, they were also a little dull. They were wholly right in their perception of the needs of their country. But when an excited populace is clamoring for a new heaven and a new earth, it will not be greatly attracted by a plan for stable government. Moreover, the very blackness of the old regime seemed to demand a sensational and violent reversal. So foul a sky clears not without a storm. The extremists of the Council of Workmen and Soldiers 
represented a far narrower class. They stood for the working population of Petrograd, and in a lesser degree for industrial Russia. But Russia was not a highly industrialized country, and the workmen were a mere handful compared with the many millions of the peasantry. The rank and file were profoundly ignorant on all questions of government, and the leaders were little better. Their strength lay in the fact that they preached a creed which was the antithesis of all that had gone before, and which combined ideals that were capable of appealing both to a narrow class interest and to the generous and imaginative side of the Russian mind. Moreover, they were in Petrograd, at the center of affairs, and they were vocal, while other sections were dumb. Many of them were sensible men, who saw that victory in the war was essential to the safeguarding of their new-won freedom, and who had a wider outlook in political matters than the interests of one class. But even the best of them were inexperienced in public affairs. It is not easy for those who have been long compelled to work in the dark to come suddenly to the full glare of responsibility. With the best will in the world, there must be a certain jealousy, a certain suspicion, a certain mauvaise honte, due to the strangeness of it all. Precious time was wasted in the discussion of half-baked ideals when the nation cried out for action. Discipline, the supreme need in war, is hard to come at in a debating society, but the gravest peril arose from the intractable minority whose leaders, willingly assisted by Germany, were even then speeding to the storm center across Europe in locked and shuttered railway carriages, like some new secret munition of war. In a time of confusion, the wildest creed is often the most acceptable. And these men had a method in their madness, and could play cunningly on the weakness of a sorely tried and most malleable people. Some were beyond doubt in German pay. The majority were as honest as they were perverse. But unhappily, in times of stress, the rogue is not more dangerous than the fool. The first news of the coup d'etat enheartened and inspired every ally of Russia. It seemed as if the dead weight which had clogged her efforts was now removed. She had been a giant with one arm shackled, but now she had the full use of her limbs. Corruption and favoritism, which had weakened her mighty purpose, would flourish no longer in the clear air of freedom. She was now wholly in line with the other democracies, and the old suspicion of an autocracy, which had always existed in some degree in Britain and America, was dispelled from the minds of her well-wishers. Her revolution had been swiftly and completely carried out with the assistance of the army. More than a century before, the soldiers of revolutionary France had scattered their enemies, would not the same be true of the soldiers of revolutionary Russia? These hopes were based on false analogies. Russia had gained freedom, but she was not yet confirmed in it. If the revolution was to endure, the war against Germany must be won, and any cataclysmic change, however beneficent in its ultimate effect, must weaken her fighting strength in the immediate present. The extremists who if they did not make the coup d'etat, were its loudest propagandists, were adamantly anti-national. Not like the extremists of the French Revolution, who never lost their nationalist character. Moreover, the former were avowed pacifists, while the latter preached every folly but a hollow peace. The former wished to end one war to begin another, and while there might be little enthusiasm for the second part of their program, the first had a dangerous appeal to a people who had lost heavily of its manhood and had suffered for two and a half years the most grievous privations. In the villages, according to one observer at the time, quote, the commonest record is that of a number of adult brothers, only one is still left at the front and sending home what money he can. A soldier's pay is three rubles a month. The families of all club together. The work of the fields is done by women. Any man fit to return to the line does so, some of them five or six times. Everywhere, in numbers unheard of in any other war, 
are to be seen helpless cripples, bringing home to all who see them the horrors of modern armaments and the present struggle. End quote. To a nation which has suffered thus, and which was essentially peace loving and humane and without a tincture of military pride, immediate peace buttressed by vague formulas about status quo ante and no annexations or indemnities had an uncanny charm they did not understand the phrases but they liked the sound and owing to the lack of popular education they were unable to read the deeper meaning of the war already the council of workmen and soldiers were extolling the maximum of peace without annexations or indemnities no invention of their own, but a phrase borrowed from the Zimmerman Manifesto of September 1915, signed by the Russian Lenin and the Swiss Robert Grimm. What could the Russian peasant make of foreign words like contributia or annexia? He thought the first the name of a town which ought not to be surrendered, and the second the name of a fifth daughter of the emperor. But if they meant peace, he would shout for them and in the next breath he would shout for the liberation of Belgium and Serbia, which meant a victorious war. It all spelled confusion and bewilderment and irresolution. The case was still graver with the army. The Russian army did not need to be democratized. It was already the most democratic force in the world. Relations between officers and men were almost uniformly excellent. But it was not a highly disciplined army. For, being spread out on a long, thin line, with sometimes no more than a 150 men to the mile, the commanders had not the troops under their hand. It was a superb field for propaganda. In the Council of Workmen and Soldiers, seeing in it the only hope of reaction, resolved to democratize the army in their own peculiar fashion. Hundreds of emissaries were dispatched, and there was no one to say them nay. Already a carnival of loose talk was beginning. The men were told that the officers were bloodsuckers and tyrants when they had looked upon them as friends. The give formulas of the demagogues were preached to audiences which had not the education to judge them truly. The army, whose influence had made the coup d'etat, was the one hope for the establishment of a stable government. Had there been someone with sufficient authority to veto this crazy electioneering. But military discipline is a delicate plant, and to set up the hustings in the field has before this wrecked many a gallant force. Those who loved and admired the Russian soldier and regarded his campaigns as the summit of mortal heroism and endurance saw with consternation his exposure to this incredible trial. He was called to debate in his ignorance on the foundations of statecraft in the presence of a vigilant enemy. A revolution may, at the outset, be the work of many, but its establishment is usually the task of one man, a Caesar, a Cromwell, a Napoleon. Among the extremists, there was no such man, for in the nature of things he must not be extreme. He may dream dreams and see visions, but he must have an iron hand and a clear eye for realities. In the respectable circle of the Duma statesmen, competent, honest, brilliant even, he seemed to be lacking. Guchkov was the nearest approach, but Guchkov had no magnetism to compel a following, and the man of destiny must be a tradition between the practical administrators and the masses. One figure alone seemed to stand out from the others, a young man, barely thirty-five, the son of a Siberian schoolmaster, hitherto an obscure Petrograd lawyer, and a somewhat flamboyant orator in labor circles. His haggard white face and melancholy eyes showed his bodily frailty, and indeed he was one who walked very close to death. In the first stage of the revolution, Alexander Kerensky played boldly. Himself a strong Republican and a staunch socialist, he seemed to recognize that a country cannot be saved by ideals alone, and to gird himself for the rough work of construction. His fervent speeches kept the new provisional government from being wrecked at the start, and he had his way alike with the elder statesmen of the Duma 
and the firebrands and amateurs of the workmen's council. Here, so at the moment it seemed, was a swallower of formulas, a second Metterbeau. Would he die like Metterbeau before he could guide the revolution aright? Would he faint by the wayside, baffled by problems too great for mortal solution, and handicapped by the trammels of his old environment? Or would he live to lead his people beyond the wilderness to the promised land? End of chapter 72, part 3《Section 41 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress Continued, and The Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jenny. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 73. The New Government in Britain. December 19, 1916, to May 2, 1917. Part 1. The new ministry in Britain entered upon office faced by a host of vexatious and intricate problems. Romania had been overrun and was now making a last stand on the lines of the Sereth. Greece was in a state of naked chaos. In Russia, the incompetence of the bureaucracy was now grossly apparent. The campaign in the West had reached the apparent stagnation which comes with midwinter, and in consequence the attention of the people was diverted to domestic criticism. The peace overtures of Germany and President Wilson's note had produced a situation which called for a wary and patient diplomacy. At home, the increased activity of the German submarines had raised acutely the question of food and supplies. The need of men for the army was more urgent than ever if the strategic purpose of the forces in the field was not to be compromised. But the new government had one clear advantage. It had been accepted by the people as a government of action, and the country at large was prepared to make any effort which it should direct. It was in the eyes of most men a, quote, business government, end quote, an executive committee of the whole nation, Hence, when, in his first speech in the House of Commons on December 19, 1916, the new Prime Minister sketched a program of large and drastic measures, his demands were willingly granted. He summoned the country to a national Lent, an honorable competition and sacrifice. He asked that every available acre should be used for the production of food, and that the overconsumption of the rich should be cut down to the compulsory level of the poor. He proposed a system of immediate national service for war. He announced that the government would complete their control over mines and shipping. He warned his hearers that such as gave their trust to the new administration in the hope of a speedy victory would be doomed to disappointment, that there was a long and difficult road still to travel before victory was won. But his tone was one of grave yet buoyant confidence and he gave a new encouragement to those who believed that the resources of the whole empire should be mobilized by his promise to summon at an early date an imperial war conference. The country looked kindly at his committee of experts and was ready to grant them a fair field for their energy. Few ministries have ever entered upon office accompanied by a more general goodwill. The linchpin of the coach was the prime minister, and with his accession to the highest place, the world became more fully cognizant of one of the most remarkable and potent figures in modern history. His pre-war record had shown that he had unsurpassed demagogic talents, and that rarer gift, a sense of political atmosphere. He might err in his ultimate judgments, but rarely in his immediate intuitions. If his strategy was often erroneous, his tactics were seldom at fault. He had been accused both by colleagues and opponents of lack of principle, for in truth he cared little for dogma and distrusted the Whig code, so far as he troubled himself to understand it. His interest was not in doctrine, but in life, and his quick sense of reality made him at heart an opportunist, one who loved the persistency of facts 
and was prepared to select, if need be, from the repertory of any party. This elasticity, combined with his high political courage, rendered him, even in his bitterest campaigns, not wholly repugnant to his opponents. He was always human and had nothing of the dogmatic rigidity, the lean spiritual pride of the elder liberalism. In December 1916, Mr. Lloyd George was but partially revealed to his countrymen and to the world, but enough was known to make it clear that he had great assets for the task. He was a born coalitionist, sitting always loose to parties. A born war minister, for strife was his element, and a born leader of democracy. Of democracy, indeed, both in its strength and weakness, he was more than a representative, he was a personification. He had its fatal facility in general ideas, its sentimentality, its love of picturesque catchwords, and he had also its incongruous realism in action. Devotees of consistency were driven mad by his vagaries, for a tyrant or an oligarchy may be consistent, but not a free people. He had a democracy short memory and brittle personal loyalties. Perhaps his supreme merit as a popular leader was his comprehensibility. No atmosphere of mystery surrounded his character or his talents. The qualities and the defects of both were evident to all, and the plain man found in them something which he could himself assess, positive merits, positive weaknesses, so that he could give or withhold his confidence as if he were dealing with a familiar friend. This power of producing a sense of intimacy among millions who have never seen his face or heard his voice is the greatest of assets for a democratic statesman, and Mr. Lloyd George had it not only for Britain, but for all the world. He was a living figure everywhere, as well known in France as Monsieur Briand, an intelligible character in America as much as Mr. Roosevelt or Mr. Wilson. A reputation such as Mr. Balfour's or Mr. Asquith's was a local thing which grew dim beyond the seas, but Mr. Lloyd George's was like an electric current whose strength was scarcely lessened by transmission over great distances. When he spoke, he was understood by the whole round earth. His speeches made exactly the appeal which he intended, whether heard in London or read in Paris and Petrograd. He used a universal tongue, and his cardinal strength lay in this universality, in his abounding share of a common humanity. It is a rare and happy gift, and while it has been possessed by certain artists and thinkers, it has been the endowment of but few statesmen. Apart from this special genius, his most notable quality seemed, at the moment of taking office, to be his courage and energy. His physical appearance was a clue to the man, the thick-set figure, the deep chest, the bright, wary swordsman's eye, all spoke of an ebullient and inexhaustible life. As the months passed, critics were to be found to depreciate his wisdom, his honesty, even his valor, but no man ever denied his vitality. He was exhilarated rather than depressed by misfortunes, even though he might be also a little frightened. His strength was that he overflowed at all times with zest and interest and passion. The Allied cause now made the same emotional appeal to him that the handicaps and sufferings of the poor had made in earlier days. He was not only energetic himself, but an inspirer of energy in others. Like a gadfly, he stung all his environment to life. He was inordinately quick at grasping the essentials of a problem, and with him the deed did not wait long on the thought. His well-wishers were less certain whether this instinct for action was combined with an equal sagacity in counsel and prescience in judgment, for it is a rule of mortality that the considering brain and the active will are not commonly found together in the same being. It was not enough that such a man should choose able colleagues, for his temperamental dominance was so strong that the subtlest and shrewdest of advisers would be apt to be dragged along at his impetuous chariot wheels. It was clear that he would not falter in the race, but there was the risk that his fine ardor might be sometimes wasted through misdirection, and that paths might be chosen in haste which would have to be abandoned at leisure. 
He was above all things the inspirer and comforter of the nation through the medium of the spoken word. As an orator, he was in a unique position. There have been many greater speakers, men who have at their disposal a more complete armory of all the weapons of rhetoric and debate, but there have been few indeed who have had his specific talent. He had not the golden eloquence of Lord Rosebery, rich in historical allusion and imagery, or Mr. Balfour's architectural power, which made each part of the argument fall into its place with a mathematical precision, or the austere elevation like that of the English Bible, which is found in the best speeches of Abraham Lincoln. His oratory was altogether less accomplished, the product of a native talent rather than of a laborious apprenticeship. At its worst, it was merely noisy, the robustious hammer-and-tongs business of the hustings. In its average quality, it was homely, vigorous, hard-hitting, and usually effective, giving the ordinary man something he could readily understand and providing the answer to his opponents which the ordinary man desired to give. It was platitudinous, but often witty, and invariably picturesque. But there were moments when it became poetry, a rare and exquisite music, which lingered on the air like an old song, and transformed the dusty arena of politics as a sunset transfigures a dingy landscape. Such passages were usually illustrations drawn from some episode of the natural world or some recollection of boyhood. Footnote. Take such a passage as this from his speech at Carnarvon on February 3rd, 1917, spoken among the Welsh hills toward the close of a bitter winter. Quote, there are rare epochs in the history of the world when in a few raging years the character, the destiny of the whole race, is determined for unknown ages. This is one. The winter wheat is being sown. It is better, it is surer, it is more bountiful in its harvest than when it is sown in the soft springtime. There are many storms to pass through, there are many frosts to endure, before the land brings forth its green promise. But let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. End quote. End footnote. They were never recondite, but their use was so apt, their presentation so beautiful, that they came to the mind of his hearers with the shock of a revelation. It was simplicity itself, but it was the simplicity of genius. And, save in a few rare utterances of Cromwell, the history of British oratory may be searched in vain for a parallel. And because it was poetry, its appeal was worldwide, for true poetry knows no frontiers of race or tongue. The machinery which the Prime Minister had announced on his accession to office seemed, at first sight, adequate to his purpose. The old cabinet of twenty-three had been too large and cumbrous. It had met infrequently, and it had kept no minutes. The special war committee which existed had been too informal and too ill-defined in its powers to be effective. Mr. Lloyd George's war cabinet was five in number, and only one of its members, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, had the cares of a heavy department to distract him. This body of five had their hands free to direct the management of the campaigns. They were picked men who brought to the common stock a great endowment of consultative and executive competence. Mr. Arthur Henderson was a labor leader with a wide knowledge of the mind of British workers, and he had the patience and sagacity and unrhetorical patriotism of the best type of his class. Mr. Bonar Law, was a businessman with a high reputation for practical ability, and his remarkable skill in debate made him an admirable exponent of policy in Parliament. Lord Curzon had been the most successful viceroy of India since Dalhousie. Lord Milner had been the civilian leader in a long and difficult war, and had borne the weight of the reconstruction of South Africa. All who had ever worked with him were aware that he possessed administrative talents which were probably not equaled by any contemporary Englishman. And at the head of this distinguished junta was Mr. Lloyd George, with his magnetic energy and his quick imagination. It seemed on paper an ideal arrangement for the conduct of campaigns. It was a proof of the elasticity of the British Constitution 
that a wholly novel machinery could come into being at once, without legislative sanction, without debate in Parliament or in the country, on the authority of one man. But those who examined the scheme closely, while fully alive to its merits, saw certain dangers in the near future. The new war cabinet was the only cabinet. The other members of the ministry were departmental heads, without opportunity for consultation or collective decision except in so far as they might be summoned to attend the war cabinet at odd meetings. But the British Constitution is based on collective resolutions and collective responsibility. Again, while the major business was the war, the normal government of the country had to be carried on. Important decisions must be taken in such matters as finance, education, and labor, which might be purely domestic in character, but which required the assent of the whole government. And even in internal affairs, many questions might bear a war complexion. Hence, it seemed certain that the war cabinet would not only have to perform the special functions for which it was created, but to do the work of the old cabinet as well. In practice, its membership could not be limited to five, for other ministers would require to be constantly in attendance. And in practice, it could not confine itself to problems directly arising out of the war, but must include in its province the whole government of Britain. Finally, one of Mr. Lloyd George's first acts was to create a number of new departments, shipping control, national service, food control, pensions, which were not branches of old departments, but directly responsible to the war cabinet itself. It looked as if the Committee of Five might be swamped with endless matters of detail, referred to them because there was no other mode of reference. At first, however, the danger was not pressing, and the war cabinet, sitting in almost continuous session, endeavored to draw together the threads of war administration. It showed courage and energy in grappling both with internal and foreign problems. The Prime Minister went to Paris and Rome. Lord Milner was dispatched to Russia. Conferences of the Allies became frequent. And, most vital of all, a war conference of the British Empire was called for the early spring. This conference took the form of a temporary enlargement of the war cabinet, the Dominion's prime ministers or their representatives and the Indian delegates being included for the purpose in its membership. It was the eighth conference of the empire, which had been held since the first Jubilee Conference of 1887. At the earlier ones, the main questions discussed had been imperial defense, imperial reciprocity, and imperial consolidation. But the vital question of cooperation in war had not been seriously raised till the Conference of 1909. It had been developed at the Coronation Conference of 1911, when Sir Edward Grey took the representatives of the Dominions into his confidence on matters of foreign policy. But up to the outbreak of hostilities, these deliberations had not resulted in the devising of any real machinery for united effort. The old doctrine of a loose partnership of self-governing peoples held its ground, a friendly partnership based on frequent consultations, but a partnership in which the main burden both of responsibility and of action lay upon Britain herself. The war had wholly changed the outlook, both of the mother country and of the dominions. Cooperation in the field, in finance, and in all forms of war activity had become a tremendous reality. But the machinery of cooperation was still faulty, the conduct of the campaigns and of foreign policy still rested exclusively with the British government. This would have been well enough had the Dominion's contribution been made merely out of loyalty and friendship for the parent land, but that was not the main motive. Australian and Canadian, New Zealander and South African fought side by side with British troops, not primarily in defense of Britain, but in defense of their own homelands and on behalf of those ideals of civilization and international honor which they realized to be the only securities for their future freedom and peace. Hence there must be cooperation not only in effort, but in the direction of that effort. And from this practical and responsible partnership in the conduct of war, there must follow a true partnership in the conduct of peace. The Prime Minister was under no delusion. 
Quote, you do not suppose that the overseas nations can raise and place in the field armies containing an enormous proportion of their best manhood and not want to have a say, and a real say, in determining the use to which they are to be put. Up to the present, the British government has shouldered the responsibility for the policy of the war practically alone. It now wishes to know that in its measures for prosecuting the war to a finish, and in its negotiations for peace, it will be carrying out a policy agreed upon by the representatives of the whole empire sitting in council together. Of this I am certain. The peoples of the empire will have found a unity in the war such as never existed before it, a unity not only in history but of purpose. Do you tell me that the peoples who have stood together and staked everything in order to bring about the liberation of the world are not going to find some way of perpetuating that unity afterwards on an equal basis? End, quote. End of chapter 73, part 1. Read by Jenny, 2023. Section 42 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress Continued, and The Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jenny. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 73. The New Government in Britain, December 19, 1916 to May 2, 1917, Part 2. The first great problem which the new ministry had to face was the need for men. The requirements of the army were growing, and it was calculated that, to keep the forces in the field up to the strength required by the strategic purposes of the high command, 200,000 extra men must be found before the end of the summer. In March 1917, Mr. Bonar Law told the House of Commons that, since the beginning of the year, recruits had fallen short of the number estimated by 100,000. To meet the demand, a comprehensive new examination of discharged and rejected persons was undertaken, which would enable the military authorities to deal with a million men. Such a, quote, combing out, unquote, involved many hardships. The doctors, acting under urgent war office instructions, were inclined to be liberal in their view of what constituted physical efficiency, and thousands who had been hitherto rejected or placed in a low class found themselves passed for general service. In the same way, the tribunals were slow to grant exemptions, and pleas which a year before had been allowed were now summarily dismissed. The principle was undoubtedly right that every man fit to be in the fighting line should go there unless his services were required for national work of equal importance at home. But the word fit was far too loosely construed. Men were drafted into the line who retired to hospital after the first week of service and thereby increased the cost of our army without adding one atom to its strength. Side by side with this purely military scheme, there was established an organization for national civilian service similar to that set up in Germany the previous autumn. The idea was sound to find substitutes for men engaged in vital industries and in military service by calling in men over age or debarred by some physical handicap from fighting. The country was split up into recruiting areas, and an appeal was made for volunteers, both men and women. An attempt was made to compile a great register in which should be set down the ability of each volunteer for the different branches of national work. Unfortunately, the mechanism was cumbrously devised, and volunteers were demanded before any scheme for their utilization had been framed. The result was that men and women were kept waiting indefinitely, or hastily assigned to incongruous tasks. The National Service Department, much criticized and laboring amid hopeless difficulties, did something to ease the situation, but it cannot be said to have realized the aim of its promoters. The scheme of the military authorities, on the other hand, secured large numbers of men, 
but it involved so many mistakes that during the spring and summer it had to be constantly revised. Many of the blunders were so glaring that they inspired an unpleasant sense of insecurity and injustice among the people. It was too often forgotten that, having grafted compulsion upon our old voluntary plan, we had thereby improvised a system far less scientific and equitable than that which existed in conscript countries. Many thousands had volunteered in the early days of the war who under a proper scheme would have remained at home, and consequently our later compulsory methods could not be applied in a fair field. For a sedentary man of forty, with a family and a business depending on his own efforts, to be hurried into the ranks was a very real hardship, which the sight of multitudes of young men reserved for so-called vital industries did not tend to alleviate. The country, recognizing the urgent necessity of the case, bore the anomalies with amazing good humor, and that the protests were on the whole so few, spoke volumes for the patience and patriotism of the nation. Scarcely less urgent was the supply of food and raw materials which the success of the unrestricted German submarine campaign forced into prominence. In a later chapter, we shall consider the features of that campaign. Here it is sufficient to note its results upon our domestic policy. On February 23, 1917, the Prime Minister informed the House of Commons that the ultimate success of the Allies depended, in his opinion, on solving the tonnage difficulties with which they were confronted. New restrictions were imposed on all imports not essential to the prosecution of the war. Certain forms of non-essential home production, such as brewing and distilling, were rigorously cut down. A great effort was made to increase the building of new standardized merchant ships. Home production was stimulated in such matters as timber and iron ore, and notably in the provision of food supplies. In order to extend agricultural effort, farmers were guaranteed certain minimum prices for wheat and oats and potatoes, that they might be induced to put pastoral lands under crop. A minimum wage was fixed for agricultural labor, and landlords were forbidden to raise rents except with the consent of the Board of Agriculture. These and many other schemes were aimed at the conservation and increase of Britain's economic strength, for it was realized that the enemy was directing against it his most serious attack, and that a long and stern struggle lay before the nation. A kind of practical communism came into being. No national asset could any longer be kept under unrestricted private management if the strength of Britain was to be mobilized for war and state interference reached a height which three years before would have staggered the most clamorous socialist. An example was the government control of all coal mines, which came into force in February 1917. The truth was that Britain was blockaded, and her policy must be that of a beleaguered city. Germany was in the same position, and the world saw the astounding result of two sets of belligerents each reduced by the other to a condition of economic stringency, the one by above water and the other by underwater naval operations. At the same time, there could be no comparison between the kinds of stringency. In Mr. Lloyd George's phrase, there was a vast difference between privation and deprivation, and the former had been for some time the lot of Germany, but was still unknown in Britain. The food problem, which was the one which affected most notably the ordinary man, was dealt with by a series of curious measures which included experiments not always well considered. Mr. Runkiman, the president of the Board of Trade under the former government, had begun in November 1916 with the adoption of a form of, quote, standard, unquote, bread, with certain restrictions on the meals served in restaurants. When Lord Devonport became food controller, he found the position with regard to the grain supply very serious, and by a multiplicity of orders, culminating in the government control of all the chief flour mills, he endeavored to prevent the waste of foodstuffs. Stocks of sugar were also short, and during the first half of the year 1917 there was a very great dearth of potatoes. 
In February, he appealed to patriotic households to accept a voluntary scale of rations, and the Royal Proclamation of 2nd May urged the nation to a united campaign of food economy. Apart from restrictions of consumption, there was a general attempt on the part of householders who had access to the land, whether in the shape of gardens or allotments, to increase the food supplies by the planting of potatoes and other vegetables. Shortage was followed by high prices, which bore heavily on the poorer classes, and were attributed by many to the quote-unquote profiteering of the large dealers. Lord Devonport's sporadic efforts to control these prices were attended with no great success, and the matter was not firmly handled till he had retired and given place to Lord Rhonda, the former president of the local government board, who by his vigorous administration gave the country assurance that such high prices as remained were the inevitable effects of war and not of private greed. The first financial measure of the new government was a gigantic loan, which was expounded by the Chancellor of the Exchequer at a great meeting in the Guildhall. The amount was unlimited and was to be raised in two issues, a 5% loan issued at 95 and repayable at par on June 1, 1947, and a 4% loan issued at par and repayable on October 15, 1942. The interest on the first issue was subject to income tax, and the yield was therefore four pounds, two shillings, three pence per cent. The interest of the second was free from tax. A sinking fund was instituted of one and three quarter per cent per annum. The four and a half per cent war loan and five and six per cent exchequer bond issues were convertible into the new loan at par but there was no right of conversion into any future war loan. The scheme was methodically advertised, and when the lists closed on 16th of February, it was found that the loan had yielded in new money 1,000 million pounds, which was 300 million pounds in excess of Mr. Bonar Law's provisional estimate. No such result had as yet been attained in any belligerent country, and the amount subscribed exceeded the combined results of the two previous British loans. There were no subscriptions from the banks, which were therefore left free to finance the general business of the country. Some eight million people had subscribed, as contrasted with Germany's highest figure of four million, though the population of Germany was 50% larger than that of Britain. A little later, it was announced that the government of India had agreed to subscribe £100 million to the general expenditure of the war. These heroic measures were needed for the cost of campaigns was rising rapidly. On 12th February, the Chancellor of the Exchequer declared that the average daily expenditure had risen to £5,790,000 an increase of over a million a day since the beginning of the financial year. Such an increase was inevitable. There were now 14 times as many troops on the different fronts as at the beginning of the war, and as compared with the average in the first year, the smallest increase among the different types of munitions was 28-fold. The rate was soon to be greatly added to, for in the first nine weeks of the new financial year, 1917-18, to 18, the daily average had risen to £7,884,000. Mr. Bonar Law's first budget, introduced in April, showed an actual deficit on the past year of £1,624,685,000 to be met out of loan money. His estimate for the year 1917-18 to was an expenditure of two million two hundred and ninety thousand three hundred and eighty one thousand and a revenue of six hundred and thirty eight million six hundred thousand, leaving a deficit of one thousand six hundred and fifty one million seven hundred and eighty one thousand pounds. There were no new taxes, but a new revenue of twenty seven million pounds was estimated for, chiefly from the raising of the tobacco duty and the increase of the excess profits tax 
from 60 to 80 percent. The figures were so vast that the most vigilant of financial critics were struck dumb. The thing was not in pari materia with anything in their past experience or even in their wildest imaginings. The state was contracting a colossal debt to its citizens, but it was an internal indebtedness, and the worst difficulties concerning foreign payments were in process of being solved by the entry of America into the war. Without that fortunate event, the financial position of all the Allies would have been difficult in the extreme. Britain was expending her accumulated savings, but she had not yet entrenched seriously upon the assets necessary for the production of her national income. Moreover, a growing part of her outlay was returning to her war chest. The campaign of the War Savings Committee, conducted quietly and persistently through the land, was not only bringing a considerable part of the high wages now current back to the use of the state, but was inculcating habits of thrift and investment in classes who might otherwise have been demoralized by the changed conditions of the world. The opening of 1917 saw no change in the mass of British opinion concerning the war, save perhaps a certain hardening. The long struggle of the Somme had brought home to the nation the magnitude of the toil and the greatness of the needful sacrifices. And as Germany's policy unfolded itself, and as a fuller idea of her aims built itself slowly in the minds of those not given to reflect upon international politics, the conviction grew that no halfway house could be found between victory and defeat. The peace overtures of December 1916 did, it is true, induce the doubters to urge that a victory in the field was impossible, and that peace must be sought by negotiation, and the easily beguiled to cry out that there were signs in Germany of a change of heart, which it was the Allies' duty to encourage. Footnote. Quote, the blood men are a people that have their name derived from the malignity of their nature, and from the fury that is in them, to execute it upon the town of Mansoul. These people are always in league with the doubters, for they jointly do make question of the faith and fidelity of the men of the town of Mansoul. End quote. Bunyan's Holy War. But of pacifism in the dangerous sense, there were few signs, and the plea for quote, peace by negotiation end quote, sprang in most cases from an error of head rather than of heart. In every great struggle, there will be a certain class who, in the name of democracy, choose to set themselves against the tide of popular opinion, and out of a kind of spiritual and intellectual pride misread facts which are plain to less sophisticated souls. Such views are middle class rather than popular, and they are found not among those who are bearing the burden of the contest, but in the small minority who even in war contrive to lead a sheltered life. But if there was no weakening in purpose... The country, as the third year of war drew to a close, was suffering beyond doubt from a high degree of war weariness. The revulsion from the hope of an early and dramatic close had plunged many into a dogged apathy. The losses on the Somme had been felt in every class, and very especially in those classes which had small military knowledge and could not view the campaign in a true perspective. It was remarked that in certain districts, the temper of the people seemed to have lost its edge. They were resolute to go on to the end, but they had ceased to envisage that end, and were like a man towards the close of a day's journey, who dully places one foot behind another without the sanguine enterprise of the morning hours. Workmen were weary with the strain of three years' overwork, and all were dazed with the long anxiety. The effect of staleness, which was to be noticed among troops who had kept too long in the firing line, was beginning to appear among the civilian population at home. It is the lesson of all wars. The stronger military force will win, pourvu que le civil tienne. But what had been an academic postulate in the early days of the campaign was now revealed as a most vital truth. The nation was determined to hold but it realized that the endeavor might bring it very near to the limits of its strength. 
the class which suffered most was the least vocal. In a struggle which called forth the best from all conditions of life, it would be idle to compute degrees of sacrifice. But if one class were to be singled out as especially heroic, it would be what is commonly called the lower middle, the minor walks of commerce and the professions. A young man of the upper classes had, as a rule, a comfortable background behind him. The workman had his trade or craft to return to, and his separation allowance was generally sufficient to support his family in the mode of livelihood to which they had been accustomed. But take the man who had built up a little business by his own efforts, or had just won a footing in one of the professions. When he enlisted, he sacrificed all the results of his past toil. If he survived, he would have to start again from the beginning. The little shop or business was closed down. His professional chances disappeared. No separation allowance, no pay as a second lieutenant, could keep up his home on the old scale of modest respectability. It was from this class, it should be remembered, that the bulk of the officers of the new armies were drawn. For it, there was no chance of exemption, for its work was not regarded as of national importance. It had no trade union to watch its interests, and no popular press to expound its hardships. But of all the many sacrifices to which the nation was called, it bore the heaviest share. It was a melancholy experience to walk through the fringes of an industrial town. In the artisan area, life seemed to be going on as before. The streets in the daytime were full of women and children, and in the evening the fathers of families came back from work, as in the times of peace. But in the quote-unquote residential quarters, where the rows of small villas housed the clerk, the shopkeeper, and the minor professions, every second house was closed. A section of society, which above all others prided itself on the little platform it had won in the struggle for life, saw its foundations destroyed. The position of labor during the early part of 1917 was to some small extent influenced by the Russian Revolution. War is a time when the whole world requires a new sensitiveness, and the cataclysm in Russia made itself felt in remote quarters as a great storm at sea will affect peaceful backwaters far up a tidal river. There were stirrings and questionings abroad, which did not formulate themselves in any revolutionary creed, but gave a special edge to the existing labor difficulties. Continual minor disputes and occasional strikes were proof of a real unsettlement, but it was too often assumed that this was mainly due to a gang of unpatriotic agitators. Agitators there were who, taking advantage of the absence of responsible leaders, preached the cruder doctrines of syndicalism and the class war, and had a fair field owing to the fact that the government did not organize counter-propaganda. The ordinary Briton was accustomed to a good deal of public speaking, but the war had dried up the usual founts of political oratory, and the extremist was left to provide most of the talking. But the influence of the firebrand was strictly limited. The real cause of unrest, apart from the inevitable war weariness, was to be found in certain specific grievances and discontents. It is important to recognize that labor had a good case and did not make trouble out of mere selfish perversity. The old charter of trade union rights had been abrogated during the war with the consent of the unions. It was too often forgotten what this sacrifice entailed. In other countries less highly industrialized than Britain, the land had remained as the sheet anchor of the peasant. But in industrial Britain, the workman was cut off from his ancient natural security and had to seek an artificial defense. This he found in the rules of his union, without which he was an economic waif unable to bargain on a fair basis. Hence he regarded any infringement of his union rules as a weakening of the safeguards essential to his very existence. He consented to drastic alterations on the understanding that they were purely war measures, but he was naturally jealous that the plea of military necessity should not be used to impair his ultimate rights of which he stood as the trustee not only for himself but for his kinsmen in the trenches. 
Anything which seemed to point to a delay in the restitution of his old status after the war made him acutely uneasy, and his suspicion was not lessened by foolish talk on the part of some employers about a complete revision of the industrial system involving a repeal of the Factory Acts and the Trade Disputes Act. It seemed to him that in defending his rights as he conceived them, he was resisting Prussianism as much as the troops in the field. But in time of war, when new urgencies appeared with each day, it was hard for a government to keep the strict letter of a contract with labor. The British workman was not unreasonable, and when a fresh necessity was made clear to him, he would usually accept it. But unfortunately, the war had largely deprived him of the services of the men who might have done the explaining. His old leaders had been, for the most part, absorbed into the government, and in the stress of heavy executive duties, were unable to keep in close touch with their followers. Moreover, the mere sight of them as part of the official machine caused them to be regarded with a certain suspicion. The consequence was that a new type of leader came into prominence younger and less responsible men, who took a stand not only against the government, but against the proper trade union officials. Of such a type were the shop stewards in the engineering trades. Originally, they had been merely agents of the district committees. But, since they were the only union officials left in intimate contact with the men, they acquired new powers and became the spokesmen of the workers, not only against the state, but against the union executives. The strike of the engineers in May was organized in defense of their union by a self-elected committee of shop stewards. Finally, there was a very general suspicion of quote-unquote profiteering. The men objected to sacrifice their union rules in order, as they saw it, to swell the profits of private employers, and they bore with impatience the high cost of living because they suspected that private monopolies and corners played as large a part in producing it as the dislocation of war. In handling this difficult situation, the government made frequent mistakes. The whole state organization was overworked, and there were many departmental delays in starting the agreed machinery, and especially in adjudicating on differences between employers and employed. But the main sources of trouble in the May strikes were the withdrawal of the trade card scheme and the extension of dilution to private work. These two points demand a short explanation, for they were typical of the kind of disputes which, without discredit to both sides, were bound to arise. In order to prevent the confusion of work from the sudden calling up of skilled men, and to get rid of the suspicion that an employer could punish a man he disliked by declaring him no longer indispensable, the trade card scheme was approved in November 1916, under which every member of an engineering union was absolutely exempted from military service. It was obviously a bad arrangement, for it was hard to see why exemption should be based on membership of a particular union and not on national utility, and other unions, not thus protected, viewed the scheme with suspicion. When, early in 1917, the army authorities began to press for more men. The government, instead of trying to negotiate a fresh agreement, simply announced that the trade card scheme would terminate as from 1st of May. The quote-unquote dilution question was even more delicate. The principle of dilution in munition work, which, be it remembered, involved the most sacred principle of the craft unions, had been accepted by labor in 1915 on the understanding that no dilution should be enforced in work other than war work. But the necessities of the army, and the importance at the same time of keeping private industry alive, caused the government to bethink itself of dilution in private work. In November 1916, it came to an arrangement with most of the unions, but not with the engineers. Nevertheless, it introduced the Munitions of War Bill, 1917, to give the Ministry of Munitions power, quote, to carry into effect a scheme of dilution of skilled labor by the introduction of less skilled labor, both male and female, upon private work, end quote. The result of these measures was that labor did not know where it stood. Explicit pledges had been violated, and the explanations did not harmonize. 
the Ministry of Munitions declared that it only wanted to spread skilled men more evenly over the whole industrial system, and not to take them for the army. But the military authorities made no secret of the fact that they expected to get large drafts from the engineering trades. There was the further grievance that the Chancellor of the Exchequer proposed to abolish the limitations originally placed on the profits of controlled establishments, and leave the employers subject only to the excess profits tax. The result of this atmosphere of suspicion was the outbreak of trouble in May in some 30 munition areas in defiance of the executives of the unions. A quarter of a million men were affected, and the arrest of the chief strike leaders did not improve the situation. Ultimately, the men were released, and an arrangement was reached with the strikers under which the government made important concessions as to the obnoxious legislation which they had contemplated. Incidents such as this showed the difficulties which attended cooperation between the government, forced constantly by new needs into new measures, and labor, suspicious of the intentions of the state, out of touch with its experienced leaders, and profoundly anxious about the future fate of those rights which it had temporarily surrendered. It may be doubted whether the making of a strike a punishable offense under the first Munitions of War Act in July 1915 was a wise step, for it deprived unrest of a natural outlet and caused doubts to brood like mosquitoes on stagnant water. Yet, when all has been said, overt discontent was the exception and not the rule. There was no sounder patriotism or stauncher resolution anywhere in the Allied nations than among the workers of Britain. When we remember the strain and monotony of their toil, the innumerable grounds for suspicion open to them, and the blunders in tactics made, sometimes avoidably and sometimes unavoidably, by the government, we may well conclude that the chief characteristic of British labor during the war was not petulant unrest, but an amazing stamina and patience. End of chapter 73, part 2. Read by Jenny, 2023. Section 43 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress, Continued, and The Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lynette Calkins. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 74. The Breaking of America's Patience. January 22 through April 6, 1917. In earlier chapters, we have examined the stages in the ripening of American opinion against the aims and methods of the Teutonic League. It was a slow process, for the great republic had a long road to travel from her historic isolation to the point of junction with the Allies in Europe. She had started with three principles which had always been the foundation of her policy. The first was the doctrine of Washington and Monroe, that she would not interfere in European disputes or entangle herself in any foreign alliance, and that her one external interest was to keep the new world free from foreign aggression. The second was that she would persistently labor to secure such a maritime code as would ensure to the whole world the freedom of the seas. For this purpose, she had assisted Britain to clear out the Barbary pirates, and, save during the stress of her civil war, she had leaned towards the doctrine of the inviolability of private property at sea, a generous free list, and a narrow definition of contraband. The third was an endeavor to substitute a judicial for a military settlement of disputes between nations. These principles of policy were very dear to her, and to a desire to safeguard them, she added the hope that, if she could keep aloof from the war in Europe, she might be in a position at its close to take the lead in rebuilding a ruined world and healing the wounds of the nations. But the American people were of Cromwell's opinion that it is necessary at all times to look at facts. Slowly and with bitter disappointment, they learned that isolation was not feasible, 
that there could be no freedom at sea unless they did their share in winning freedom on land that right instead of might could not be set on the throne of the earth unless they were willing to restrain the power that worshipped force that they could not bind up the wounds of the world until they compelled the oppressor to sheathe the sword it was not always easy for the allies to watch with patience the progress of this gradual disillusionment it was so very gradual apparently so blind to actualities so much in love with the technicalities of a law which had been long since shattered but the wiser statesmen in europe saw that behind the academic decorum of america the forces of enlightenment were at work and they possessed their souls in patience for with a strong people a slow change is a sure change the initial atrocities in belgium and france had induced in the greater part of the educated class in america the conviction that germany was a menace to civilization but such a conviction was still far removed from the feeling that america was called on to play an active part in the war her pride was first wounded by germany's insistence that as a neutral the united states had no right to trade in munitions with the allied powers the american view was well stated in the official presentation of america's case issued after she entered the struggle by the committee of public information Quote, if with all other neutrals we refused to sell munitions to belligerents we could never in time of a war of our own obtain munitions from neutrals and the nation which had accumulated the largest reserves of war supplies in times of peace would be assured of victory the militarist state that invested its money in arsenals would be at a fatal advantage over a free people that invested its money in schools to write into international law that neutrals should not trade in munitions would be to hand over the world to the rule of the nation with the largest armament factories End quote. then came the sinking of the lusitania and the preposterous demand that america should surrender her right of free travel by sea concurrent with the prevarications and belated apologies of berlin ran a campaign of german machination and outrages in the new world to quote again from the same document in this country official agents of the central powers protected from a criminal prosecution by diplomatic immunity conspired against our internal peace placed spies and agents provocateurs throughout the length and breadth of our land and even in high positions of trust in departments of our government while expressing a cordial friendship for the people of the united states the government of germany had its agents at work both in latin america and in japan they bought and subsidized papers and supported speakers there to arouse feelings of bitterness and distrust against us in those friendly nations in order to embroil us in war they were inciting to insurrection in cuba in haiti and in santo domingo their hostile hand was stretched out to take the danish islands and everywhere in south america they were abroad sowing the seeds of dissension trying to stir up one nation against another and all against the united states in their sum these various operations amounted to direct assault of the monroe doctrine Close quote. The complicated negotiations between Washington and Berlin have already been described in these pages. When, on May 4, 1916, Germany grudgingly promised that ships should not be sunk without warning, it seemed as if the controversy was settled. But meantime, two currents of opinion in America had been growing in volume. One was the desire to make this war the last fought under the old bad conditions of national isolation to devise a league to enforce peace which would police the world on behalf of international justice of such ideals mr wilson was a declared champion the second was the conviction that this war was in very truth america's war that the allies were fighting for america's interests the greatest of which was the maintenance of public right to this creed mr root and mr roosevelt have borne eloquent testimony in the light of it the various diplomatic wrangles with britain over her naval policy 
became things of small moment. Quote, as long as militarism continues to be a serious danger, peaceful neutral nations, by insisting on the emancipation of commerce from interference by sea power, would be adopting a suicidal policy. The control of commerce in war is now exercised by Great Britain because she possesses a preponderant navy. Rather than that control should be emasculated, Great Britain must be allowed to continue its exercise. We are more than ever sure that this nation does right in accepting the British blockade and defying the submarine. It does right because the war against Britain, France, and Belgium is a war against the civilization of which we are a part. To be fair in such a war would be a betrayal. Close quote. Footnote. These quotations are taken from the American weekly paper, The New Republic, of August 7, 1915, and February 17, 1917. End footnote. The presidential election in the autumn of 1916 caused public discussion on the question to languish, but it did not stop the steady growth of opinion. Then came the revival of German submarine activity in the early winter, and the hectoring German peace proposals, which boasted so loudly of German conquests and asked the world to accept them as the basis of all negotiations. Mr. Wilson, secure in power by his second election, and pledged to the ideal of a League of Nations, dispatched his own request to the belligerents to define their aims, for he saw very clearly that the hour of America's decision was drawing nigh. The interchange of notes which followed cleared the air and established the fact that American and Allied opinion were moving in the same channels. On 22nd January, the President, in an eloquent address to the Senate, outlined the kind of peace which America could guarantee. The area of agreement had been defined, and the essential difference was soon to leap into blinding clarity. For on 31st January, as we have seen, Germany tore up all her former promises and informed Washington that she was about to enter upon an unrestricted submarine campaign. The Rubicon had been reached, and there could be no turning back. The German ambassador was handed his passports on 3rd February, and Mr. Gerard summoned from Berlin. On the same day, the President announced to both Houses of Congress the severance of diplomatic relations with Germany. He showed by his speeches that he took the step unwillingly. He drew a distinction between the German people and the German government, the old distinction to which idealists in democratic countries were apt to cling till facts forced them to relinquish it. He declared that he could not believe that the German government meant, quote, to do in fact what they have warned us they feel at liberty to do, close quote, and that only, quote, actual overt acts, close quote, would convince him of their hostile purpose. But he ended with the solemn announcement that if American ships were sunk and American lives were lost, he would come again to Congress and ask for power to take the necessary steps for the protection of his people. The immediate result of the German decree was that American passenger ships were deterred from sailing for Europe. This brought the situation home very vividly to the dwellers on the eastern states, but had only a remote interest for the inhabitants of the West and the Middle West. At first, there was no very flagrant offense against American shipping, though the Housatonic was sunk on 3rd February and the Lyman M. Law on 13th February but the situation was none the less intolerable, and on the 26th, Mr. Wilson again addressed Congress, pointing out that Germany had placed a practical embargo on America's shipping and asking for authority to arm her vessels effectually for defense. What he contemplated was an armed neutrality which should stop short of war. On 1st March, the House of Representatives gave this authority by 403 votes to 13 but in the Senate a similar vote was held up by a handful of pacifists and could not be passed before the session came automatically to an end on 4th March. Nevertheless, an overwhelming majority of the Senate signed a manifesto in favor of the bill. 
Meantime, various events had roused the temper of the country. On 26th February, the Laconia was sunk, and eight Americans drowned. On 1st March, there was published an order issued on 19th January by Herr Zimmermann of the German Foreign Office to the German minister in Mexico. The latter was instructed to form an alliance with Mexico in the event of war breaking out between Germany and the United States, and to offer as a bribe the provinces of Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. In the same document, it was suggested that efforts might be made to seduce Japan from the Allies and bring her into partnership with Germany. Such proposals inspired the deepest resentment in the West and in the Middle West, where the submarine atrocities were least realized. There was another consideration which was beginning to impress thoughtful Americans. Even if she avoided war, America would be forced one day or another to negotiate a settlement with Germany. Peace would not come to her automatically on the conclusion of hostilities, and her position in peace negotiations would depend on how the war ended. Mr. Wilson realized that his present policy could not endure. In his inaugural address of 5th March, he said, quote, we have been obliged to arm ourselves to make good our claim to a certain minimum of right and of freedom of action. We stand firm in armed neutrality, since it seems that in no other way we can demonstrate what it is we insist upon and cannot forego. We may be drawn on by circumstances, not by our own purpose or desire, to a more active assertion of our rights as we see them, and a more immediate association with the great struggle itself. Close quote. The order for arming merchant ships was issued by the American government on the 12th of March. A week later came the overt acts of which the president had spoken. On the 16th, the vigilancia was sunk and five American lives lost. On the 17th, the city of Memphis and the Illinois followed suit. On the 21st, the Helton was torpedoed off the Dutch coast and outside the prohibited zone, and seven Americans perished. On 1st April came the loss of the Aztec, when 28 Americans were lost. The defiance was flagrant and unmistakable. The feeling against Germany rose to fever heat. At last, the country was ripe for the final step. In the words of the official statement, quote, Judging the German government now in the light of our own experience, through the long and patient years of our honest attempt to keep the peace, we could see the great autocracy and read her record through the war, and we found that record damnable. With a fanatical faith in the destiny of German Kultur as the system that must rule the world, the imperial government's actions have, through years of boasting, double-dealing, and deceit, tended towards aggression upon the rights of others. Its record has given not only to the Allies, but to liberal peoples throughout the world the conviction that this menace to human liberties everywhere must be utterly shorn of its power for harm, for the evil it has effected has ranged far out of Europe, out upon the open seas where its submarines, in defiance of law and the concepts of humanity, have blown up neutral vessels and covered the waves with the dead and dying, men and women and children alike. Its agents have conspired against the peace of neutral nations everywhere, sowing the seeds of dissension, ceaselessly endeavoring by tortuous methods of deceit, of bribery, false promises, and intimidation, to stir up brother nations one against the other, in order that the liberal world might not be able to unite, in order that the autocracy might emerge triumphant from the war. All this we know from our own experience with the imperial government. As they have dealt with Europe, so they have dealt with us and with all mankind. Close quote. The case against Germany was plain, and an event had occurred which made an alliance easier with Germany's foes. On 9th March, the revolution broke out in Petrograd, by 16th March, the autocracy had fallen, and a popular government ruled in Russia. The issue was now clear. 
not as a strife between dynasties, but as the eternal war of liberty and despotism, and no free people could be deaf to the call. The special session of Congress was advanced by a fortnight, and on 2nd April Mr. Wilson asked it for a declaration of war. The President's message on that day will rank among the greatest of America's many famous state documents. Couched in terms of studious moderation and dignity, it stated not only the case of America against Germany, but of civilization against barbarism and popular government against tyranny. He began with an indictment of the submarine campaign, recalling the promise given on May 4, 1916, and its complete reversal by the decree of January 31, 1917. Quote, Vessels of every kind, whatever their flag, their character, their cargo, their destination, their errand, have been ruthlessly sent to the bottom without warning and without thought of help or mercy for those on board. The vessels of friendly neutrals, along with those of belligerents. Even hospital ships. Footnote notably the Britannic, the Gloucester Castle, and the Asturias, sunk 20th March. The Belgium relief ships were the Camilla, the Trevier, the Feistein, and the Storstad. End footnote. And ships carrying relief to the sorely bereaved and stricken people of Belgium, though the latter were provided with safe conduct through the proscribed areas by the German government itself, and were distinguished by unmistakable marks of identity, have been sunk with the same reckless lack of compassion or of principle. Close quote. Germany had swept away the last fragments of international rights, and her new warfare was not against commerce only, but against mankind. He admitted that when he spoke on 26 February, he had hoped that an armed neutrality would be sufficient to protect his people but Germany was resolved to treat the armed guards placed on merchantmen as mere pirates beyond the pale of law. Quote, armed neutrality is ineffectual enough at best. In such circumstances, and in the face of such pretensions, it is worse than ineffectual. It is likely only to produce what it is meant to prevent. It is perfectly certain to draw us into war without either the rights or the effectiveness of belligerence. Footnote. It had been tried before in American history. In 1798, President John Adams was empowered by Congress to arm American merchant vessels against French privateers. Several naval engagements took place, and it was clear that America was moving rapidly towards war. An army was being prepared under Washington and Alexander Hamilton, and an alliance sought with England, when Napoleon came into power and offered terms which America could accept. End footnote. There is only one choice we cannot make. We are incapable of making. We will not choose the path of submission and suffer the most sacred rights of our nation to be ignored or violated. The wrongs against which we now array ourselves are no common wrongs. They cut to the very roots of human life. With a profound sense of the solemn and even tragical character of the step I am taking, and of the grave responsibilities which it involves, but in unhesitating obedience to what I deem my constitutional duty, I advise that the Congress declare the recent course of the imperial German government to be in fact nothing less than war against the government and people of the United States. Close quote. He outlined the urgent practical requirements. War would involve the organization and mobilization of all the national resources of the country, the immediate full equipment of the Navy, the immediate addition of half a million men to the armed forces under the principle of universal service, and the authorization of further levies as soon as they could be handled. Above all, it involved, quote, the utmost practicable cooperation in counsel and action with the governments now at war with Germany, close quote, and the extension to them of the most liberal financial credits. The problem was twofold, to prepare America for war, and at the same time to supply the allied nations with the materials which they needed. Quote, 
They are in the field, and we should help them in every way to be effective there. Close quote. The declaration was complete, explicit, and uncompromising, but the president did not end with that. His conclusion raised the argument to a higher sphere, for he gave expression to the eternal principles for which America entered the field. He restated his hope for the establishment of peace based upon the reign of law. Quote, Neutrality is no longer feasible or desirable when the peace of the world is involved and the freedom of its peoples and the menace to that peace and freedom lies in the existence of autocratic governments backed by organized force, which is controlled wholly by their will, not by the will of their people. We have seen the last of neutrality in such circumstances. We are at the beginning of an age in which it will be insisted that the same standards of conduct and of responsibility for wrong done shall be observed among nations and their governments that are observed among the individual citizens of civilized states. Close quote. He had dreamed of a league of nations, but there could be no honest friendship with autocracies. Quote, Self-governing nations do not fill their neighbor states with spies, such designs can be successfully worked out only under cover and where no one has the right to ask questions. A steadfast concert for peace can never be maintained except by a partnership of democratic nations. No autocratic government can be trusted to keep faith with it or observe its covenants. It must be a league of honor, a partnership of opinion. Intrigues would cut its vitals away the plottings of inner circles who could plan what they would and render account to no one would be a corruption seated at its very heart. Only free people can hold their purpose and their honor steady to a common end and prefer the interests of mankind to any narrow interest of their own. Close quote. The world must be made safe for democracy. This phrase was the keystone of the speech and it will stand among the dozen most celebrated sayings of modern history. Almost in the strain of Lincoln's second inaugural, the message concluded, quote, It is a fearful thing to lead this great and peaceful people into war, into the most terrible and disastrous of all wars, civilization itself seeming to be in the balance. But the right is more precious than peace and we shall fight for the things we have always carried nearest our hearts, for democracy, for the right of those who submit to authority to have a voice in their own governments, for the rights and liberties of small nations, for a universal dominion of right by such a concert of free people as shall bring peace and safety to all nations and make the world itself at last free." To such a task we can dedicate our lives and our fortunes, everything that we are and everything that we have, with the pride of those who know that the day has come when America is privileged to spend her blood and her might for the principles that gave her birth and happiness and the peace which she has treasured. God helping her, she can do no other. Close quote. Under the American Constitution, the right to declare war lay with Congress. The President's message was received with stormy enthusiasm by the audience which listened to it, and a thrill of assent ran through the length and breadth of the land. The debate in the two houses revealed a preponderant weight of opinion for war. Senator Stone, the chairman of the Committee on Foreign Relations, went into frank opposition and various senators attacked the resolution on such grounds as that the war was a struggle of financiers which did not concern the people at large, or that the republic was being made a cat's paw by the reactionary British monarchy. Echoes of anti-British feeling, the dregs of the romantic views of history once taught in American schools, were heard throughout the discussion. But the great issues were eloquently stated by men like Senator Lodge, and Senator John Sharp Williams of Mississippi delivered a passionate protest against the old hack criticism of Britain. On 4th April, the Senate passed the war resolution by 82 votes to 6. Next day, it was introduced in the House of Representatives by Mr. Flood of Virginia, 
and the debate which followed showed that a good deal of confusion still existed among the members. Some defended it on the broadest lines of world policy and international right, others took the narrower ground of American interests. Its critics lamented the end of the Monroe Doctrine, or expressed simply the humanitarian repugnance to bloodshed, or attacked Britain's naval policy, or reveled in the old spread-eagle republicanism. The comedian patriot was not wanting, said one gentleman from Nevada, quote, All crowned heads look alike to me, and I do not want to sleep with any of them, whether it be the Kaiser, the Mikado, John Bull, or the Sultan of Turkey. This fight is not of our making, and we had better keep out of it. I do not think Uncle Sam looks good mixed up with any of them. I want to tell you that every man, woman, and child in the country would applaud if we would take both John Bull and the Kaiser and bump their royal noddles together, open up all seas, and treat them both alike. Close quote. The arguments of the opposition were, for the most part, trivial, and were easily met by the supporters of the resolution. But they proved that a considerable section of the nation, its mental joints stiffened from two and a half years of neutrality, found some difficulty in adjusting itself to the new conditions. They were not quite certain about their new allies, but on the whole they were certain about their enemies. The speech of Mr. Foss of Illinois expressed with vigor the predominant attitude towards Germany. Quote, as a reward for our neutrality, what have we received at the hands of William II? He has set the torch of the incendiary to our factories, our workshops, our ships, and our wharves. He has laid the bomb of the assassin in our munition plants and the holds of our ships. He has sought to corrupt our manhood with a selfish dream of peace when there is no peace. He has willfully butchered our citizens on the high seas. He has destroyed our commerce. He seeks to terrorize us with his devilish policy of frightfulness. He has violated every canon of international decency and set at naught every solemn treaty and every precept of international law. He has plunged the world into the maddest orgy of blood, rapine, and murder which history records. He has intrigued against our peace at home and abroad. He seeks to destroy our civilization. Patience is no longer a virtue. Further endurance is cowardice. Submission to Prussian demands is slavery. Close quote. On 6 April, by a majority of 373 votes to 50, the House of Representatives passed the resolution, which ran as follows. Quote, Whereas the Imperial German government have committed repeated acts of war against the government and the people of the United States of America. Therefore, be it resolved by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that a state of war between the United States and the Imperial German government, which has been thrust upon the United States, is hereby formally declared, and that the President be and he is hereby authorized and directed to employ the entire naval and military forces of the United States and the resources of the government to carry on war against the imperial German government, and to bring the conflict to a successful termination, all the resources of the country are hereby pledged by the Congress of the United States. Close quote. The entrance of America into the war on the Allied side meant an immediate increase of strength in certain vital matters. She was the greatest workshop on earth, and the high mechanical talent of her people was invaluable in what was largely a war of engineers. She had immense wealth to put into the common stock. She had a powerful fleet, though one somewhat lacking in the lighter type of vessel which was the chief need of the moment, and she had a great capacity for shipbuilding. Her army was small, but its officers were among the most highly trained in the world, and her reserves of manpower gave her the chance of almost unlimited expansion. It would be some time before she could make her potential strength actual, but in the meantime she solved the worst financial difficulties of the Allies, 
and her accession made ultimate victory something more than probable. Like her cousins of Britain, she was a nation slow to move, but on the path she had chosen she would walk resolutely to the end of the journey. Her coming seemed to make victory all but certain, and the right kind of victory, for she entered upon war not for any parochial ends, but for the reorganization of the world's life on a sane basis. Her organic internationalism, the more comprehensive since it was a reaction against the traditional policy of isolation, was in starker antagonism to Prussianism than any of the ordinary schemes of territorial readjustment in Europe. Her motives were a mingling of the best conclusions which American thought had reached during the past three years, the dream of a Pacific alliance of all peoples, the recognition that peace could only be won on the basis of a common freedom, and the desire to reconstitute public right on a surer foundation than partial treaties. She restated the ideals which had been at the back of the minds of all the Allies from the start, but had been somewhat overlaid by the urgent problems of the hour, and she prepared to give these ideals the support of the whole of her mighty practical strength. Mr. Wilson had justified his policy of waiting. The debates on the declaration of war showed that the public mind of America was still in some doubt and confusion, and if this were so even at that late hour, it is probable that the President could not have secured the national assent he needed at any earlier date. A different type of leader might, by the sheer force of personality, have swung his country into the war in 1915, trusting to facts to compel unanimity. Mr. Wilson, obeying another code, demanded an all but universal agreement before he acted. Fortunately, the very districts most averse to war were those where his personal prestige was greatest. He had played his part with remarkable skill. He had suffered Germany herself to prepare the American people for intervention, and Germany had labored manfully to that end. He had allowed the spectacle of American powerlessness in the titanic struggle to be always before the popular mind till the people grew uneasy and asked for guidance. He had shown infinite patience and courtesy, so that no accusation of petulance or haste could be brought against him. But when the case was proved, and the challenge became gross, he struck promptly and struck hard. If in the eyes of his critics he had not always stated the issue truly, and had shown an easiness of temper which came perilously near complacence, it was now clear that he had had a purpose in it all. As soon as he felt himself strong enough for action, he had not delayed. He had brought the whole nation into line in a matter which meant the reversal of every traditional mode of thought, and when we reflect on the centrifugal tendencies of American life and its stout conservatism, we must confess that such a feat demanded a high order of genius in statecraft. End of chapter 54。Section 44 of the History of the Great War, Volume 3 The Beleaguered Forest Continued and the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 75. Germany Shortens Her Western Line. November 16, 1916 to April 5, 1917. Part 1. During the last weeks of the Battle of the Somme, British airmen, scouting far east of Beaupalm and Peroni, reported the great activity in front of Cambrai and St. Quentin, Thousands of Russian prisoners were at work digging trenches on a plan which seemed to imply the creation of a fresh fortified line. Shortly after, rumors began to spread in Germany of a new bulwark of the fatherland created by the genius of Hindenburg. The successive defeats on the Somme and the rapid loss of positions which had been pronounced impregnable had induced in the German people 
a profound nervousness about the situation in the West. At any moment, it seemed, that the defenses might crumble and the German frontiers lie open to the Allied armies. The magic of Hindenburg's name was invoked to reassure his people. He had had no part in the original defenses of the West and took no discredit by their failure. But if a position were created under his auspices, that position would stand, for in German eyes, failure in Hindenburg had never met. The new line was called after the heroes of Teutonic mythology, Woden, Siegfried, Alberich, Brunhilde, Kreimhilde, and the legend of it was whispered through Germany during the winter. The Allies, who followed with interest the stages in its construction, called it the Hindenburg Line, being well aware that its main value for Germany lay in its association with Germany's most popular commander. The situation in the West demanded a plan, for the Somme had shaken the German morale to its foundations. It was clear that a mere defensive battle was not enough, for to be driven from crest to crest by the Allied infantry and pounded day and night by the Allied guns would lead presently to a general disaster. Hindenburg resolved to prepare for an offensive in the spring, and for this purpose accumulated a strategic reserve which presently mounted to upwards of fifty divisions. He was aware that the Allies would advance as soon as the soil dried after the winter, and he proposed to yield ground which was no longer tenable, and fall back upon a position of his own choosing, where he might compel them to fight at a disadvantage. His argument was not without reason. The Allies in advancing would be moving over a country devastated by war and every yard of their progress would be slow and difficult. The German retreat would be by good roads and railways in a terrain with which they were minutely familiar, and to a halting place which had been laboriously prepared. The odds were that, in such a situation, an opportunity would be found to strike a counterblow, with the chances in Germany's favor. A frontal offensive like the Battle of the Somme was not possible for Hindenburg with his inferiority guns, and, even after all his recruiting efforts, in numbers of men. Footnote. The Allies at the moment had a superiority in the West of between 30 and 40 divisions. End of footnote. His one hope was some ruse where advantage could be taken of a long-prepared position and the difficulties of an enemy advancing across an old battlefield. But if he were to succeed, the retreat must be meticulously planned and methodically executed. No area must be ceded to force instead of strategy. For if the withdrawal at any point were hustled, the whole program would fall to pieces and a counterstroke would become impossible. Footnote. The arrangements for the retreat were notified to the commanders as early as November 22, 1916. O. von Moser, Felsugaf, Zagnungen, 1914-1918, and the footnote. When, in the third week of November 1916, the larger operations on the Ankara came to an end, the condition of the German line was not enviable. From the Butte de Waldencourt to the River Somme, they had fairly good positions, though on most parts at the mercy of our observation from the higher ground. But to the north, the salient which had its apex on the spur above Beaumont Hamel was exposed to constant danger from the British movement in the Ancre Valley, where every fresh advance led to a more awkward enfilading, and laid bare to our view the rear of the defenses at Serry and Gommancourt. To increase this awkwardness was obviously the British winter task. It could be done with small expenditure of men in the short spells of fine weather. But, in the meantime, preparation must be made for the great spring offensive. On 16th November, Haig and Joffrey had met at Chantilly and concerted a plan for 1917. The main principles were that the pressure in the West was to be kept up throughout the winter and that the Allied armies were to be prepared for an offensive by the middle of February. On 27th November, Joffrey issued more explicit instructions. By 1st February, the British armies were to be ready 
to attack between Beaupont and the Vinnie Ridge, and the French Northern Group under Franchet Desperé between the Huys and the Somme. Within a fortnight, the French Central Group was to attack on the Ensney. When the enemy had been weakened by this arpeggio of assault, it was Haig's intention to turn to Flanders, and they finished the operations of the summer, and it might be of the war. For these projects, extensive preparations must be made. The troops, which had been so slowly tried in the past five months, must be rested and brought up to strength. No divisions must be trained, and the vast educational system continued under which the whole British hinterland had become a staff college. Above all, the communications must be perfected for the coming advance. We have seen how, in October, the incessant rain had played havoc with the roads in the Somme area. A hard winter would complete their ruin unless the whole system of routes were reformed. But railways must be constructed on a colossal scale to ease the strain on the main highways and set the weather at defiance. The task of obtaining the amount of railway material to meet the demands of our armies, wrote Sir Douglas Haig in his dispatch, and of carrying out the work of construction at the rate rendered necessary by our plans, in addition to providing labor and materials for the necessary repair of roads, was one of the very greatest difficulties. It was indeed the key of the whole situation. The railway companies in Britain and Canada loyally cooperated, giving up locomotives and rolling stock, and even tearing up tracks to provide the necessary rails. The Somme, as we now know from the enemy's confession, had struck a blow at his strength far deadlier than at the time the world recognized. To the civilian governments of France and Britain, the long battle had seemed but a moderate success, one at a prodigious cost of life, and only to one or two of the fighting commanders was the truth revealed. It is probable that, had the pressure been kept high and the Chantilly plan put into effect in early February, before the enemy could perfect his arrangements for retreat, and long before he could draw any advantage from the chaos soon to reign in Russia, the summer of 1917 would have seen the victory of the Allies. But the fates willed otherwise, and their main instruments were the French politicians, for long it had been becoming clear to Joffrey that France could not permanently sustain the chief offensive, that the depletion of her manpower made it desirable that she should gradually entrust the main attack to the rapidly growing British armies. In such a renunciation there could be no loss of honor. She had drawn all the spears to her breast in the first years of war, and might reasonably leave it to others to complete that which she had so nobly instituted. Joffrey saw, too, the practical difficulty of calling upon the British armies at one and the same time to act on the defensive and the offensive, to increase the length of their front and also to carry out ambitious attacks. His views were not shared, however, by certain powerful groups in politics. These feared that France, who had already suffered so much, would miss the glory of the final blow. They held that his strength was still sufficient to deal that blow, but that some method must be found less banal, slow and costly than the tactics of the Somme. Joffrey was an old man, set firm in a groove. Let some new leader be chosen, with youth and genius on his side, to break through the miasmic tradition of limited objectives. Advance is measured by inches, and battles spun out to half a year. This view prevailed. On 16th December, Joffrey was shoved by promotion, and Neville became commander-in-chief. Neville's policy, his difficulties, and the grave crisis which ensued in the French army belonged to a later chapter. Here we are concerned only with the effect of his appointment on the British command. The Chantilly plan was at once dropped. On 21st December, the new French journalissimo informed Haig that there would be two preparatory attacks, as arranged at Chantilly, but on much shorter fronts, and that the main operation would be an attempt to break through on the Esne by 27 French divisions. To obtain these divisions, he requested Haig to extend the British line south of the Somme 
as far as the Amiens Roy Road. This completely altered the British plan. The extension of his front prevented Haig from exercising upon the enemy the close pressure he had intended, and the postponement of the attack by a matter of at least six weeks seemed to give that enemy a chance to recover and so undo the effect of the Somme battle. It was true that there would be ample compensation if Neville's great enterprise succeeded, and in twenty-four hours, as he promised, he had captured the enemy's heavy guns. Meantime, Mr. Lloyd George had become Prime Minister of Britain, and he had as little love for the Somme tactics as had the critics of Joffrey. Moreover, his mental vitality made him adventure gaily on the most expert domains, and he was prepared to theorize about the conduct of Warren to enforce his theories. On January 5, 1917, he attended a conference at Rome and delighted Cordona by a proposal to give him the British and French reserves and finish the war by pushing through the Julian Alps to Leibach and Vienna. But apart from the Italian general staff, he could get no soldier to support this scheme, and Neville was openly scornful. On his way home, Mr. Lord George heard of Neville's plan, limitless objectives, the end of trench fighting, victory within two days, and naturally fell in love with it. On 15th January, the French commander-in-chief explained his conception to the British War Cabinet, and though Haig and Robertson were skeptical of its success, as were Pétain and nearly all the French generals, the British government, like the French, were prepared to take the risk. The latter proposed that Haig should be put under the orders of Neville. Mr. Lord George agreed, and on 20th February, a conference was held at Calais to negotiate the details. The first French suggestion was for an amalgam of the two commands, a French generalissimo, a British chief of staff, and a mixed headquarters staff, with French control not only of strategy, but of the distribution and supply of the British troops. The ultimate decision was that during the period of the coming operations, Haig should conform to Neville's general strategy, but should be free to choose his own method. Any serious difference between the two was to be reported to the war cabinet. Such an arrangement had little to recommend it. It was not a unified command. It was the placing of one army in subordination to another, and yet not in complete subordination. The Hague could not risk himself of his responsibility to his own government, and the British War Cabinet reserved the right to interfere. Difficulties were not slow in revealing themselves. On 27th February, Neville instructed Hague to attack toward Cambrai, which meant that the British commander would entangle himself in a pocket of the new Siegfried system, instead of destroying its pivot at Vimy. Neville refused to believe in a German retreat, though it had already begun with the loss of the Marymount Heights. As late as 4th March, we find him informing Franchet d'Esperay, who sent him a memorandum on the subject that the Germans would never voluntarily abandon a front, which was a direct menace to Paris. Haig rightly protested against his instructions, and after an anxious controversy, carried his point at the London Conference of 13th March. It was arranged that his attack, when it came, should be in the Arras Vimy section, and should have a general direction towards Douai, rather than Cambrai. Such is a summary of the confused preliminaries of the 1917 offensive. It is important to keep them in mind if we would appreciate the difficulties which faced Haig and Franchet d'Esperay, and the good fortune which saved the enemy from a position of infinite peril. The change of plan in December nullified the chief results of the Somme battle. The close contact with the enemy, necessary to pin him down to a bad line, was lost while Haig was occupied with taking over fresh miles of front, and Franchet d'Esperay was laboring to compile Neville's reserve. The postponement of the main attack from February to April gave the Germans the margin for refitment and rest, which made all the difference. The civilian governments of both France and Britain chose to regard the Somme as a failure, and ignorant of the mercies vouchsafed to them, declined to reap the fruits of an indisputable success. 
never offered a brilliant gamble, but in accepting it, they rejected a sober and certain victory. The French debacle of May, the horrors of Third Ypres, Caporetto, the final downfall of Russia, the 1918 retreat from the Somme, the lies in Esne may be regarded as implicit in that fatal decision. The attack of November 18, 1916, the last phase of the Battle of the Somme, had brought our line on the left bank of the Angra, close to the outskirts of Pais and Grand Corps. The German position in this area now ran from the spur above beaumont Hamel, along the ridge north of Beaucourt, and then crossed the Angra and enclosed Grand Court, Miramont, and Pies. Behind him lay a strong second system, a double line of trenches heavily wired, in front of Boucoy and Arquette Le Petit, Grevelles and Lupart Wood, to the Albert Beaupont Road, whence it continued southeast past Le Transloy to Salisel. This position, which was called the Le Transloy Lupart Line, was both through its natural and artificial defenses immensely strong, scarcely inferior to the Thibault-Vorval line, which we had carried in the autumn. Behind it, on the far side of the crest, a third line was being constructed during November and December, covering Roquefigny, Beaupalm, and Abon Zavelle. December was wet and misty, and with the opening of the new year came a period of bitter frost, varied by snowstorms, which tried sorely the endurance of the men in the front trenches. But in January, in spite of the weather, we began a steady advance. Our first business was to clear the beaumont Hamel spur. At dawn, on 11th January, we carried the crest for nearly a mile east and northeast of beaumont Hamel, taking over 200 prisoners, and, after repeated small attacks, by the end of the month we had won all the spur, had pushed 1,000 yards north of Beaucourt, and had gained a footing on the southern slopes of the ridge northwest of Miramont. Our casualties were light, for the ground had been magnificently prepared by our artillery, with the assistance of direct observation from the Thief Val Ridge. Our new position gave us command of the whole western side of the high ground from Serret to opposite Grand Court. The next objective was the top of this ridge. On the night of 3rd February and the following day, we bit into the German second line on a broad front and carried our line north of the Angra to a point level with the center of Grand Court village. This advance made Grand Court untenable by the enemy, and on the morning of 6 February, he evacuated the trenches between Grand Corps and Stuff Redoubt. Next morning, we entered the village, and that night, pushing forward on the right bank of the stream, took Bailey's Court Farm, within 1,000 yards of Miramont. Sari had now become an acute salient, and, since we held most of the hollow which runs north from Beaucourt, it was only a question of days till it yielded. On the night of 10th February, after a sharp struggle, we carried a line of trenches at the southern foot of Surrey Hill. In the two succeeding days, we beat off counterattacks and prepared for a more elaborate movement. At Corselet, a clearly marked spur ran westward from the deep Val Morval Ridge. The northern end of this commanded the approaches to Pies and Miramont from the south, and moreover gave observation over the nest of enemy batteries concealed in the upper Angra Glen, on whose support the defense of Seri depended. South of the Angra, this spur was our objective, while north of the stream we aimed at winning a sunken road on the ridge northeast of Baylor's Court Farm, which would give us command of the western approaches to Miramont. A thaw set in on 16th February, and the night following, was black as pitch, with a thin mist rising from the sweating earth. The enemy expected some movement, and about 4.45 a.m. on the morning of the 17th, he opened a heavy barrage, which caught our troops as they were forming for the attack. In spite of these drawbacks, our men advanced at 5.45 a.m. with perfect resolution. North of the stream, they won all their objectives, and south of it, Though they fell short of their full goal, they reached a line within a few hundred yards of Petit Miramont, 
the suburb of Miramont across the Angra. 600 prisoners were the result of the day. Next day, the 18th, the enemy counterattacked without success, and during the subsequent days we crept to the summit of the desired ridge. The whole hinterland of Seri and the whole of the upper Angra Glen were now exposed to our direct observation, and it was clear that the German position in that area could not be maintained. Miramont was the key of Seri. Seri was the key of Posio au Monde and Glamis Court. When the cornerstone is taken from the building, the other supports must totter and fall. Haig was not mistaken in his forecast. On 21st February, our patrols reported that the trenches before Pies, Miramount, and Sari seemed to be empty. That day and the next, we pushed continuously forward and discovered that the enemy had evacuated all his positions in front of the Lur Transloy Lupart line and north of the Albert Beaupin Road. By the evening of the 25th, we held the hamlets of Walden Court, Oak Court, Pies, Miramont, the famous dovecote at Beauregard, and the ruins of Surrey. The last gain brought satisfaction to the many thousands who on 1st July, and again in November, in the preceding year, had struggled in vain against its honeycombed ridges and its forest of wire. Our advance had few casualties and little opposition. The withdrawal had been skillfully managed, but it had all the chances on its side. In the words of the official dispatch, the enemy's retirement at this juncture was greatly favored by the weather. The prolonged period of exceptional frost, following on a wet autumn, had frozen the ground to a great depth. When the thaw commenced in the third week of February, the roads, disintegrated by the frost, broke up, the sides of the trenches fell in, and the area through which our troops had fought their way forward returned to a condition of slough and quagmire, even worse than that of the previous autumn. On the other hand, the condition of the roads and the surface of the ground behind the enemy steadily improved the farther he withdrew from the scene of the fighting. The position now was that north of the albert Beaupont Road, we were face to face with the main Le Transloy Lupart line, but that south of the road we had still to carry an intermediate position, running from a point in the Le Transloy line west of the village of Bola Court, in front of the Ligi Theloy and Le Barque, to the south end of Lupart Wood. During the last week of February, we gradually ate our way into this position and by the evening of 2nd March had won Le Barc, Ligny, Theloy, and Theloy, and were within 2,000 yards of Bopam itself. North of the Angra, by that date, we had entered Poso Omont, and held Gommamont Court Village, with its park and chateau. Only Earls remained. Now the point of a sharp salient linked up to Lupart Wood, and Achiet Le Petit, by strong trench lines. It took us a week to make routes through the wilderness, and during our road-making, we had to keep in constant touch with the enemy by raids and small outpost attacks. On 10th March, we were ready, and at 5.25 that morning, we captured Earls, taking numerous machine guns and trench mortars, and considerably more prisoners than our total number of casualties. End of chapter 75, part 1